Chapter 1. Helsinki, Finland. Monday, the 6th of December, 1999. The Russians were serious players. If things didn't go as planned, Sergei said, I'd be lucky to be shot dead in the hotel lobby. If they captured me, I'd be taken to a remote bit of wasteland and have my stomach slit open. They'd pull my intestines out and leave me to watch them squirm around on my chest like a bucket of freshly caught eels for the thirty minutes it would take me to die. These things happen, he had explained, when you mess with the main men in ROC, Russian Organized Crime. But I didn't have a choice. I desperately needed the cash. What's it called again, Sergei? I mined the disembowelment. Eyes staring straight ahead, he gave a brief, sombre smile and muttered, Viking's Revenge. It was just before 7pm, and it had already been dark for three and a half hours. The air temperature had been well below freezing all day. It hadn't snowed for a while, but there was still a lot of the stuff about, ploughed to the sides of the roads. The two of us had been sitting very still for the best part of an hour. Until I'd just spoken, our breathing was the only sign of movement. We were parked two blocks away from the Intercontinental Hotel, using the shadows between the streetlights to conceal our presence in the dirty black Nissan 4x4. The rear seats were down flat to make it easier to bundle the target inside, complete with me wrapped round him like a wrestler to keep him there. The 4x4 was sterile, no prints and completely empty apart from the trauma pack lying on the folded seats. Our boy had to be delivered across the border alive, and a couple of litres of ringer solution might come in handy if this job turned into a gang fuck. Right now, it certainly had all the ingredients of one. I found myself hoping it wouldn't be me needing the infusion. It had been a while since I'd felt the need to pre-cannulate, making it quicker for me to replace any fluid from gunshot wounds, but today had just that feel about it. I'd brought a catheter from the UK, and it was already inserted into a vein under my left forearm, secured by tape and protected by tubigrip. Anticoagulant was preloaded inside the catheter's needle and chamber to stop the blood that filled it from clotting. Ring of solution isn't as good as plasma to replace blood loss. It's only a saline mix, but I didn't want anything plasma-based. Russian quality control was a contradiction in terms, and money was what I wanted to return to the UK with, not HIV. I'd spent enough time in Africa not treating anyone's gunshot wounds because of the risk of infection, and I wasn't about to let it happen now. We sat facing Manaheim Minty, 200 metres down the hill from our position. The boulevard was the main drag into the city centre, just 15 minutes' walk away to the right. It carried a constant stream of slow, obedient traffic each side of the tram lines. Up here, it was like a different world. Low-level apartment blocks hugged each side of the quiet street, an inverted V of white Christmas lights sparkled in almost every window. People walked past, straining under the weight of their shopping, crammed into large carrier bags with pictures of Holly and Santa. They didn't notice us as they headed home to their smart apartments. They were too busy keeping their footing on the icy pavements and their heads down against the wind that howled and buffeted the 4x4. The engine had been off all the time we'd been here, and it was like sitting in a fridge. Our breath billowed like low cloud as we waited. I kept visualising how, when and where I was going to do my stuff, and more importantly, what I was going to do if things got fucked up. Once the target has been selected, the basic sequence of a kidnap is nearly always the same. First comes reconnaissance, second abduction, third detention. Fourth, negotiation. Fifth, ransom payment. And finally, release. Though sometimes that doesn't happen. My job was to plan and implement the first three phases. The rest of the task was out of my hands. Three members of the Loud Tie and Braces Brigade from a private bank had approached me in London. They'd been given my name by an ex-regiment mate who now worked for one of the big security companies, and who'd been nice enough to recommend me when this particular commission had been declined. Britain, they said to me as we sat at a window table in the roof bar of the Hilton, looking down onto the gardens of Buckingham Palace, 
is facing an explosion in Russian mafia organized crime. London is a money laundering haven. The ROC are moving as much as 20 billion through the city each year, and up to 200 of their senior players either live in Britain or visit regularly. The executives went on to say they discovered that millions had been channeled through Valentin Lebed's accounts at their bank in just three years. They didn't like that, and were none too keen on the thought of the boys with the blue flashing lights paying him a visit and seeing the name on all his paying-in slips. Their solution was to have Val lifted and taken to St. Petersburg, where, I presumed, they had either made arrangements to persuade him to move his account to a different bank, or to channel even more through them to make the risk more acceptable. Whichever, I didn't give a fuck so long as I got paid. I looked over at Sergei. His eyes glinted as he stared at the traffic below us, and his Adam's apple moved as he swallowed. There wasn't anything left to say. We'd done enough talking during the two-week build-up. It was now time to do. The Conference of European Council Members was due to start in Helsinki in two days. Blue EU flags already lined the main roads, and large black convoys of Eurocrats drove around with motorcycle outriders, heading from pre-meeting to pre-meeting. The police had set up diversions to control the flow of traffic around the city and orange reflective cones and barriers were springing up everywhere. I'd already had to change our escape route twice because of it. Like all high-class hotels, the Intercontinental was housing the exodus from Brussels. All the suits had been in the city since last week, wheeling and dealing so that when the heads of state hit town, all they'd have to do was politely refuse Tony Blair's invitation to eat British beef at some dinner for the media, then leave. All very good. But for me, security around here was tighter than a duck's arse. Everything from sealed manholes to prevent bombs being planted to a heavy police presence on the streets. They would certainly have contingency plans for every possible event, especially armed attack. Sergei had a folding stock AK, a Russian automatic 7.62mm short assault rifle under his feet. His cropped, thinning brown hair was covered by a dark blue woolen hat, and the old Soviet army body armour he wore under his duvet jacket made him look like the Michelin man. If Hollywood was looking for a Russian hardhead, Sergei would win the screen test every time. Late forties, square jaw, high cheekbones and blue eyes that didn't just pierce, they chopped you into tiny pieces. The only reason he would never be a leading man was his badly pockmarked skin. Either he'd steered away from the clearasil in his youth, or he'd been burned. I couldn't tell, and I didn't want to ask. He was a hard, reliable man, and one I felt it was okay to do business with, but he wasn't going to be on my Christmas card list. I had read about Sergei Lysenkov's freelance activities in intelligence service reports. He had been a member of Spetnaz's Alpha Group an elite of special forces officers within the KGB, who used to be deployed wherever Moscow's power was under threat or there were wars of expansion. When hardline heads of the KGB led the 1991 coup in Moscow, they ordered Alpha Group to kill Yeltsin as he held out in the Russian White House, but Sergei and his mates decided that enough was enough and that the politicos were all as bad as each other. They disobeyed the order. The coup failed, and when Yeltsin learned what had nearly happened, he took them under his direct command, cutting their power by turning them into his own bodyguards. Sergei decided to quit and make his experience and knowledge available to the highest bidder. And today, that was me. It had been easy enough to make contact. I just went to Moscow and asked a few security companies where I could find him. I needed Russians on the team because I needed to know how Russians think, how Russians do and when I discovered that Valentin Lebed would be in Helsinki for 24 hours of R&R, &R, and not in his fortress in St. Petersburg, Sergei was the only one who could organise vehicles, weapons, and the bribing of border guards in the time available. The people who briefed me on the job had done their homework well. Valentin Lebed, they were able to tell me, had been smart during the fall of communism. Unlike some of his Gosha colleagues, he didn't keep the designer labels on the sleeves of his new suit to show how much it had cost. 
His rise was brutal and meteoric. Within two years, he was one of the dozen heads of the mafiocracy who had made ROC so powerful around the world. Lebed's firm employed only ex-KGB agents overseas, using their skills and experience to run international crime like a military operation. Coming from dirt-poor beginnings as a farmer's son in Chechnya, he'd fought against the Russians in the mid-90s war. His fame was sealed after rallying his men by making them watch Braveheart time and time again as the Russians bombed them day after day. He even painted his face half blue when attacking. After the war, he'd had other ideas, all of them involving U.S. dollars, and the place he'd chosen to realise them was St. Petersburg. Much of his money came from arms dealing, extortion, and a string of nightclubs he owned in Moscow and elsewhere, which served as fronts for prostitution rackets. Jewellery businesses he had acquired in Eastern Europe were used as a front to fence icons stolen from churches and museums. He also had bases in the United States and was said to have brokered a deal to dump hundreds of tons of American toxic waste on his motherland. In the Far East, he'd even bought an airline just so he could ship out heroin without administrative hassle. Within just a few years, according to the guys who'd briefed me, such activities were said to have netted him more than $200 million. Three blocks the other side of the hotel, parked in a car that would be abandoned once this lift kicked off, were two more of the six-man team. Carpenter and Nightmare were armed with 9 millimeter mini Uzi machine guns a very small version of the Uzi 9mm, on harnesses under their overcoats, the same as the BG, the bodyguards, we were going up against. They were good, reliable weapons, if a little heavy for their size. It was ironic, but Sergei had obtained the team's Uzis and old Spanish semi-automatic suppressed 7mm pistols from one of Valentin's own dealers. Carpenter and Nightmare weren't their real names, of course. Sergei, the only one who spoke English, had told me that was how they translated, and that was how he referred to them, just as well as I couldn't have pronounced them in Russian anyway. Nightmare was living up to his name. He certainly wasn't the sharpest tool in Sergei's shed. Things needed to be demonstrated twenty or thirty times before he got the idea. There was a slight flatness to his face that, together with his constantly shifting eyes and the fact that he didn't seem too good at keeping food in his mouth, made him look a bit scary. Carpenter had a heroin habit that Sergei assured me would not affect his performance, but it certainly had during the build-up. He had lips that were constantly at work, as though he'd swallowed something and was trying to recapture the taste. Sergei told him that if he screwed up on the ground, he would personally kill him. Nightmare was like a big brother to Carpenter and protected him when Sergei gripped him for messing up. But it seemed to me that Nightmare would be lost without him, that they needed each other. Sergei told me they'd been friends since they were teenagers. Nightmare's family had looked after Carpenter when his mother went down for life for killing her husband. She'd discovered he'd raped his own seventeen-year-old daughter. As if that wasn't enough, Sergei was his uncle, his father's brother. It was EastEnders, Russian style, and the only thing I liked about it was that it made my own family seem normal. Carpenter and Nightmare would be in the hotel with me for the lift. Perhaps I could keep some control over them if I had them with me. The last two on the team I'd christened the Cray Twins, and they were in a green Toyota 4x4. I wasn't so worried about them. Unlike the other two, they didn't have to be told what to do more than twice— they had the trigger on the target's three black Mercedes, which were about two k's away from the hotel. They also had folding stock AKs and AP, armour-piercing rounds, in their mags. And, like Sergei, they wore enough body armour to cripple a small horse. The target was well protected in the hotel, and his vehicles were securely parked underground so that no device, explosive from his enemies, or listening or surveillance from law enforcement could be placed. When they finally moved out to pick him up from the hotel with the rest of his BG, the craze would follow. Carpenter and Nightmare would then take up their positions in the hotel along with me. Sergei, Reggie and Ronnie would take on the vehicles. The craze were both ex-Alpha Group 2, but unlike Sergei, they were far too good-looking to be straight. 
They'd been together since their time as young conscripts in Afghanistan, leaving after the previous Chechen war in the mid-90s, disillusioned with the leadership that had let them lose against the rebels. Both were in their mid-thirties, with dyed blonde hair, very clean-shaven and well-groomed. If they'd wanted a change of career, they could have become catalogue models. They'd never been parted during their military career. As far as I could make out, all they wanted to do was kill Chechen rebels and swap admiring glances. I knew I could trust Sergei, but I still wondered about his selection procedure. He obviously wanted to keep most of the wad I'd promised him and had decided not to bring the A-team. It was the most unprofessional job I had ever been on, and I'd been on a few. Things had got so bad that I'd even taken to sleeping with my door barred and my weapon ready. If the team weren't complaining to him about my planning, Sergei said they were moaning about who was earning what and how they might get ripped off when it came to payday. Carpenter was so homophobic he made Hitler look like a wet liberal, and it had taken as much effort keeping the two pairs away from each other as it had preparing for the job. I did my best to keep out of their way and concentrated on dealing exclusively with Sergei. He was the one I had to keep happy because he was the only one who could help me get the target into Russia. But they'd got me flapping. People were going to die today and I didn't want to be one of them. I was with a scary crew against a scary target with the whole of Western Europe's leadership due in town bringing along enough security to take on China. This wasn't a good day out, but fuck it. Desperation makes people do desperate things. I blew out another cloud of breath. The digital display on the dash told me another twenty minutes had passed. Time for a radio check. Reaching into my inside jacket pocket, I felt for the send button on my very yellow Motorola handset, the sort that parents use to keep tabs on their kids on the ski slopes or in the shopping mile. All six of us had one, each connected to an earpiece which was hooked in place. With so many people using hands-free sets on their mobile phones, we wouldn't be conspicuous wandering around with them in. I pressed twice, the squelch sounding off in my ear, then checked with Sergei. He nodded. I was sending. Reggie and Ronnie replied with two squelches, then Carpenter and Nightmare followed with three. If I had hit the send button and there was nothing from the craze, Carpenter and Nightmare would have waited thirty seconds and replied anyway. We would have no option then but to close in on the target and wait for the mercs to arrive. Not good, as it exposed us three in the hotel and messed up coordination. There was radio silence for two reasons. One, I couldn't speak the language, and two, EU land security would be listening in. With any luck, a few clicks here and there wouldn't mean a thing. There were many other standby comms I could have used, mobile phones for instance, but everything had to be kept pretty basic for Nightmare and Carpenter. Anything else to remember, and they would have blown up. The old principle of planning, keep it simple, stupid, rang true yet again. While Sergei had gone for the Michelin man look, I was very much the businessman. Single-breasted suit, jacket one size up, dark grey overcoat, black woolen scarf and thin leather gloves, and the stress to match. Nightmare and Carpenter were dressed in the same style. All three of us were clean-shaven, hair-washed and well-groomed. Detail counts. We had to move about the hotel without anyone giving us a second glance, looking as if we were part of the all-expenses-paid, outrageous salary Brussels gravy train. Across my lap, I even had today's edition of the Herald Tribune. My overcoat was doing a good job of concealing the body armour under my shirt. Sergei's might be as thick as the paving slabs outside the Kremlin, but mine consisted of just twelve paper-thin sheets of Kevlar. Not enough to stop one of Sergei's AP rounds, but enough to see off the mini uses that might soon be trying to hose me down. There was a pocket in the body armour for a ceramic plate to cover my chest area, but unlike Sergei, I couldn't wear one as it was far too bulky. Carpenter had refused to wear any at all because it wasn't manly, and Nightmare had followed suit. Fucking mad. If I could have, I'd have covered myself from head to toe in the stuff. My feet were in all sorts of shit, with nothing on but thin socks and a pair of lace-up shoes. They were as cold as bags of frozen peas. I could no longer feel anything below my ankles, and had given up moving them around to generate heat. I was carrying a South African Z88, which looked like a 9mm Beretta, the sort of pistol Mel Gibson used in the Lethal Weapon films. 
When the world banned weapon exports to South Africa during apartheid, the boys just set about making their own gear and were now exporting more assault weapons and helicopters than the UK. I had three twenty-round extended mags, which meant an extra two inches hanging out of the pistol grip, looking as if it had partially fallen out. The two spares went into my left-hand overcoat pocket. If things went to plan, I wouldn't even be drawing down. The lift should be, would be, silent and take less than a minute. The body armour was the lightest I dared wear, but even so it made it impossible to draw or sit down with a pistol placed where I would normally have had it. Centre front, tucked down the front of my jeans or trousers in an internal holster. I wasn't feeling happy about my new weapon position. Now it had to be on the right-hand side of my trouser belt. I'd had to spend the last two weeks practising and consciously reminding myself that the position had changed. Otherwise I might go to draw down on someone and find my hand hitting Kevlar instead of a pistol grip. That was if I could get to it through all the layers of clothing. To be able to flick back the top layers quickly, I'd taped together some sockets from the set in the car and carried them in the right-hand pockets of both my coat and jacket. It was just one more thing making me feel uneasy. My only consolation was that this time tomorrow it would be all over. I'd get my money and never see these lunatics again. There was rustling as Sergei unwrapped a chocolate bar and started to throw it down his neck without offering me any. Not that I wanted it. I wasn't hungry. Just worried. I sat there waiting with the sound of Sergei's teeth mashing and jaws clicking as the wind whistled around the wagon. I sat and thought as he sucked his teeth clean. So far, Valentin had evaded the authorities, mainly because he had learned early on that it was good to have friends in powerful places and officials on the payroll. Key witnesses were routinely murdered before they could testify against him. Just a few months earlier, Sergei said, an American journalist who delved a bit too deeply into Val's business affairs was forced into hiding with his family, after a phone call was intercepted in which Val was heard putting out a contract of $100,000, not just on the reporter's life, but also on those of his wife and child. It was for those who betrayed his trust, however, that the worst fate was reserved. Two senior managers who oversaw his prostitution empire had been caught skimming a bit off the top at his Moscow brothels. Even though they'd fought alongside him in the Braveheart days and had been faithful lieutenants ever since, Val had had them taken out and staked to the earth on waste ground not far from Red Square, where he'd personally slit their bellies, pulled out their intestines, and waited patiently for them to die. The Vikings' revenge appeared to have done the trick. Ever since then, not a single rouble had gone astray from any of his tills. I heard six quick squelches in my earpiece. The three pickup mercs were mobile towards the hotel. I replied with two squelches, then heard another two from Nightmare and Carpenter, who should now be getting out of their car and heading for the hotel. All six of us knew it was time to start performing. Sergei didn't say a word, just nodded. He might speak English, but it had to be squeezed out of him. I nodded back, checking my weapon was still in position. I got out of the four-by-four four and left Sergei staring downhill. Pulling up my coat collar to protect me from the wind, I headed in the opposite direction, away from the main. My route took me up the hill for thirty metres, then a right turn to the next T-junction. That put me on the road adjacent to the hotel and down to the main drag again. I could see the large grey concrete hotel in front of me on the left-hand side of the road. Just short of it were roadworks surrounded by steel fencing. The cobblestones were up and the pipes were being repaired. I didn't envy the poor bastards who had to finish the job in this weather. The noise from the main grew louder as I walked downhill. The Cray twins would be on it now, following the mercs. Nightmare and Carpenter should be walking into the hotel from the opposite side, and Sergei would be positioning himself so that he'd be able to move in on the mercs at the front of the hotel. I crossed the road, passing the hotel's rear service and car park entrance, Two white Hilux delivery vans were parked up on the red asphalt. There was a glass door giving access to the hotel beyond the delivery bays, but you could only get through it by buzzing reception, and I didn't want to make myself any more conspicuous than I had to. Neither of the two loading bays was open. It was far too cold. I continued downhill, the hotel now obscured by a line of high conifers. 
Valentin Lebed's weakest point would be tonight, in Finland, in this hotel before he left for the theatre. He was on his way to see Romeo and Juliet. The theatre was only across the road, a few hundred metres away to the left, but it was cold. He had always been a target for attack, and he was incredibly rich. So why walk? About thirty metres short of the main road, I hit the driveway from the Intercontinental's front entrance. It was a semicircle and one way. I turned left. In front of me, halfway down the concrete and glass building, was a large blue canopy to protect guests from the elements as they got in and out of their cars. The ground floor walls were glass, through which I could see the warm and cosy-looking interior. Small trees lined the driveway. They had lost their leaves and were now covered in white Christmas lights. The snow made them look as if they'd been sprinkled with icing sugar. I carried on past the illuminated reindeer that stood on the lawn between the driveway and main drag, which was about thirty metres down a gentle slope. The plan was simple. Nightmare and Carpenter were to kill the close BG that were protecting the target as he came from the lift, then cover me as I took the target towards the main doors. While this was happening, the Cray twins would have blocked off the rear of the Mercs with their four-by-four, Sergei would block the front with the Nissan, and all three would be controlling the other BG and drivers with their AKs. Once outside, I'd head for the back of the Nissan, dragging the target with me. We'd both lie under a blanket with my pistol rammed in his gob, while Sergei drove to the DOP, vehicle drop-off point, where the target would be switched to the boot of a changeover vehicle en route to the border, Meanwhile, Ronnie and Reggie would be giving the area the good news with CS gas before leaving in the Toyota, along with the other two, to their DOP and changing vehicles. We'd all RV near the border and get into a truck that was rigged up with hidden compartments while Sergei drove us into Mother Russia. Then it was just a few hours to St. Petersburg and payday. Nice work if you can get it. I walked under the canopy and through the first set of automatic tinted glass and brass effect doors. Once past the second set, I was in, my face flushed from the downward blast of the heaters above the doorway. I knew the foyer area well. It had the air of an expensive, comfortable club. I hadn't seen any of the rooms, but they must have been stunning. In front of me, about thirty metres away and behind a group of very noisy and confused Japanese tourists surrounding a mountain of matching suitcases, was the reception desk. In the far right-hand corner was a corridor that led to the restaurant, toilets and the all-important lifts. By now, Nightmare and Carpenter should be at the far end of the corridor, sitting by the restaurant entrance. From there they could keep trigger on the three lift doors. Immediately to my right, behind a dark wood-panelled wall, was the Baltic bar. To my left, efficient-looking bellboys were buzzing around a sprinkling of sofas, chairs and coffee tables. The lighting was subdued. I wished I'd just dropped in for a drink. I headed for one of the sofas, sitting down so that I was facing the Japanese confusion at reception to my half-right, with the corridor to the right of that, and the brass-effect lift doors in view. Like me... Nightmare and Carpenter had placed themselves out of sight of the video cameras that were covering the reception desk. I sat, spread out the trib on the coffee table, unbuttoned my overcoat, and waited for the convoy of mercs to arrive. It was pointless worrying about anything now. There is only so much training and planning that can be done. I used to get worried when this feeling came over me, but now I understood it. Basically, I accepted that I was going to die and anything beyond that was a bonus. End of Side 1 Side 2 Chapter 2 The Japanese weren't at all happy, and they didn't care who knew it. There must have been about twenty of them, all with video cameras round their necks. Three minutes later, the headlights of the three mercs raked the ground floor windows. Reggie and Ronnie should have pulled up just short of the semicircular driveway where they'd be standing by. Sergei would be waiting to block their front. I waited for the inside set of sliding doors to open, keeping my head down, concentrating hard on my newspaper. In came the BG. Two pairs of shiny Italian shoes and expensive black cashmere overcoats over black trousers. 
you always avoid eye contact because they'll be looking for it. If your eyes lock, you're fucked. They'll know you aren't there to talk about the beef ban. I watch the two sets of heels make their way over to the far right of the foyer. They paused by the brass lift doors, now and again shielded by the Japanese as they went in pursuit of one very hassled hotel rep. The middle door slid open with a gentle ping. The shoes went in, and two more sets of shoes were refused entry. The doors closed and the indicator light stopped at the ambassador suite. They were going to meet up with the other two BG who were already with Valentin, their principal, my target, my money. I got up, folding the trib into my coat pocket, and started to walk towards the main doors. As I moved past them, towards the leather booth, dark wood Baltic bar, I could see three very clean black mercs on the other side of the glass, exhaust fumes condensing in the cold air, each with a driver waiting patiently at the wheel. The bar was half full and not very smoky considering the number of cigarettes I could see on the go. There were quite a few laptops open and there was a general hubbub as suits talked shop over a beer or into their mobiles. Unbuttoning my suit jacket as I walked but keeping my overcoat on to conceal the body armour, I made my way around tables and leather chesterfields towards the far door. I seated myself where I could see down the corridor to the three lift doors, set back slightly in the right-hand wall. Beyond them, and just out of sight, were the reception and foyer. At the other end of the corridor, Carpenter and Nightmare should be in position in the coffee area of the restaurant, with a clear view all the way down to the foyer. Under the table I pulled up my right glove and eased my index finger through the cut in the leather. Five long minutes went by as lifts came and went, but Val still hadn't made an appearance. Two middle-aged couples emerged from the centre lift dressed in furs and dinner jackets, looking as if they, too, were going to the theatre. It was now that I started to worry. The calm was over and the storm was about to begin. My heart was pumping big time. My body armour was wet with sweat and my shirt collar was soaking it up from the back of my neck. Any minute now someone was going to ask me if I was ill. I was sure of it. Mentally I was still the same, but my body was telling me something different. About twenty seconds later there was another ping. The two pairs of expensive Italian shoes emerged from the right-hand lift and stopped in the corridor for a second or two, each pair facing in a different direction. The overcoat of the BG facing towards me swirled open as he turned, then both moved towards the foyer, disappearing from view as quickly as they'd arrived. I knew their jackets and overcoats would be like mine, open to access their weapons. I moved my hand into my inside jacket pocket and gave the Motorola six clicks on the send button, hearing the squelch in my earpiece each time. Val would be down any minute now. Sergei, Reggie and Ronnie would now know that the Target and BG were heading towards them. The two pairs of shoes were going to secure the foyer, probably by the main doors. It wouldn't be long now before everything kicked off and the Japanese would really have something to complain about. Whatever these two BG did, we had them covered. If they stayed inside, it was Nightmare's and Carpenter's job to take them on once they'd sorted out the BG immediately around Val. Outside, it was down to the other three. We all waited, and I sweated as people around me laughed, hit keypads, and talked between mouthfuls of alcohol. There was a ping from the far right lift, another two pairs of black patent leather shoes, dress suit trousers complete with silk stripe under black overcoats. They stepped out on either side of a light grey cashmere coat and the smartest trousers of all followed by a pair of very long, slim, well-toned, black-stockinged calves, topped off with the world's most luxuriant mink, Val Slapper, keeping him warm on those long, lonely nights away from his family. I had to be careful. There was always the possibility of someone you overlooked during surveillance, the one who looks like the brother-in-law or secretary. Then, when you hit the target, they can prove very dangerous indeed. But not this one. She was definitely not part of the BG setup. They had turned right out of the lift without hesitating. I stood up slowly, waiting for my cue. I caught Carpenter's scary, dancing eye as he and Nightmare crossed the doorway, moving right to left, matching the purposeful strides of the BG. We'd rehearsed what was supposed to happen next so many times. It had to work. There was no stopping this now. 
I turned left out of the door and fell in behind them as they drew their suppressed weapons. About five metres ahead of us, the backs and very wide shoulders of the BG pair flanked Val and the slapper as they moved towards the Japanese-filled foyer. We needed to close in on them fast while they were still in the confines of the corridor. Once out in the foyer, the rest of Val's team would be able to see what was about to happen before the 4 by 4s could get into position. Three more metres before we were on top of them. There was another ping, then a bright light from a lift interior as the doors opened and a middle-aged couple began to step out between us and the target. I moved to push them back. This was a contingency I had rehearsed with them many times. As I did so, Carpenter's right hand came up. Without taking his eyes off Val, he fired three or four suppressed rounds into the couple as he passed. I could hear the top slide on his weapon working back and forth inches from my face and the dull thud of the rounds exiting the barrel. Shit! Her scream had turned the job noisy and we hadn't even taken out the BG. The couple fell back into the lift, the woman taking all the rounds, her white silk blouse red with blood. Fuck this guy! Slotting players was one thing, but real people meant big trouble. The two BG turned and started to draw down their weapons, but Carpenter and Nightmare had closed the gap and gave them both two rounds in the head from less than a foot away. They dropped without a sound. Nobody in the vicinity had noticed anything yet. They were too busy doing their own stuff, but they soon would. As the BG dropped, Carpenter should have moved on, but he continued firing down at the bodies. The BG were dead. He was wasting time. Behind me, the man in the lift cried out as he cradled his dying wife. I saw Carpenter's glazed eyes. He was high on whatever it was that he used to get through the long winters. Sergei would be busy tonight if we stayed alive and he stuck to his promise. Fuck it, I'd kill this maniac myself before this got out of control. Keeping my eyes fixed on Carpenter's head as he fired yet another round into the BG, I shoved my right hand between my jacket and shirt towards my 88, my left palm pointing towards him, arm bent and ready to receive the weapon that would soon be in my grip. The screams from the lift were now muffled. I wasn't aware of anything else as I concentrated solely on Carpenter's head as he turned to fire into the other body on the floor. My fingers scraped against the body armour as I leaned forward slightly from the hip and pushed my coat and jacket back as aggressively as I could. The weight of the metal sockets helped me to expose my weapon for the second I needed. Pushing the web of my right hand firmly down into the 88's pistol grip, I closed my lower three fingers and thumb around it as firmly as possible. Drawing the weapon, I started to insert my glove-free index finger into the trigger guard, making sure I could feel the steel of the trigger on the first pad. I pulled down on the safety catch with my thumb just before Carpenter fired his next round. There was a glint of brass as the working parts ejected the spent casing between us. As he tried to fire again, I could see the top slide being held back by the locking lever. He had run out of rounds. Jamming the 88 into my left hand, I punched forward and raised the weapon up, in between my focus on his head, waiting for that nanosecond before the 88 came into view and I acquired the sight picture. Real life burst into my eardrums once again. It was Nightmare, shouting into his Motorola at the 4x4s to move in on the mercs as he gripped Carpenter's arm, dragging him towards the foyer. I was now no more than two steps from Val. He was still looking at the bodies on the floor, taking in what he had just seen over the last ten seconds. He went into survival mode, spinning round and looking back towards the restaurant, thinking that he could make his escape. We had eye to eye. He knew I was coming for him, and he knew it was too late to do much about it. Everything went into slow motion as I focused completely on his neck. It was pointless paying attention to anything else around me. There was fuck all I could do about it. I was now only one step away. He was expecting to get shot and stood there waiting, accepting. There was nothing he could do. He must have known this would happen one day. I put the crook of my left arm around his neck, still moving forward so it jammed tight against his throat. He staggered backwards as I took another step, forcing his face upwards. I heard him gag. He was only five foot seven, so quite easy to get a grip of. If it had been his companion, I might have had to get on the balls of my feet. The slapper in the mink didn't react at all. I expected her to scream, but she just stood off to one side, back to the wall, and watched. With a pistol in my right hand and still moving, I pushed my right arm behind his neck to complete the headlock, like a wrestler trying to get a better hold of his opponent. At once he started fighting for oxygen. There was no way he wasn't coming with me. 
There was no need to check him for weapons. He didn't need one tonight. He was a businessman on his way to the theatre. I continued on towards the foyer. Val didn't like what I was doing to him. His back arched to try to take the weight of his body off his neck. I was in a semi-crouched position so I could carry his weight. I could feel the body armour he was wearing, disguised as a waistcoat. I concentrated on looking where we were going, towards the Russians shouting in the foyer and the suddenly silent Japanese. Nothing else mattered. Four or five more seconds had elapsed and the people inside the hotel could not only see what had happened, but had had time for it to sink in. It takes a while for a brain not used to processing this sort of information to say, yep, yeah, that's right, there are two dead men on the floor and others with submachine guns shouting and running around the foyer. Then, once one person starts becoming hysterical, they all do. I turned into the foyer, heading for the exit. Nightmare came into view by the main doors, doing his stuff to one of the BG, shouting and screaming in Russian and kicking his hands away from his body. I was twenty-odd metres away from them. The Japanese followed everyone else's example, running for cover and hiding behind the sofas, dragging their loved ones with them. That was great. The more they flapped, the less they saw. A two-tone alarm started to drown out the screams and I moved as fast as I could. Nightmare was there, checking my back as he covered the BG. Gripping tight, I pulled Val along. He snorted like a horse, fighting for breath. Through the windows, the blaze of headlights from the three mercs lit Sergei's 4x4, which had the tailgate open, waiting for me and Val. Beyond the mercs' roofs, I could see Reggie and Ronnie, AK butts unfolded and in the shoulder, muzzles pointing at the ground. Val's three drivers had already been dragged out of their seats and were face down on the tarmac. Carpenter was to the left of the convoy. He, too, had his weapon pointing down. He must have been covering the other BG. All three were blowing out steam like kettles. Sergei would be in the wagon, waiting for me to get out of this lunatic asylum. With ten metres to go, World War Three broke out. I heard a series of short bursts from a nine millimetre, the muzzle flashes bouncing off the windows like flashbulbs. It was Carpenter giving the BG the best part of a mag. Then the shots were drowned out by the screaming in the foyer. It was like the sinking of the Titanic. I couldn't believe it. More muzzle flashes lit up the darkness outside, the heavier 7.62 reports from Reggie and Ronnie echoing through the building. The drivers must have gone for their weapons, thinking they were next. Nightmare was frozen to the spot, shaking with fear as he stood over the last BG. He stared at me, waiting for direction. I flicked a look at the BG. His eyes were switched on and waiting for a chance to get away from this gang fuck. There was nothing I could do for Nightmare, who was starting to flat big time. He would have to sort it out himself. There was no way I was going out the front door with a firefight in progress, especially as I didn't know the result. Turning back towards the corridor, I moved Val as quickly as I could, nearly falling over the concierge and a bellboy who were down on the floor in the open, too paralysed with fear to move. I got back to the corner of the corridor. The man was still sobbing over his wife in the lift. Her legs in flesh-coloured tights and sensible shoes protruded into the corridor as the doors opened and closed against them. The slapper was still there, well in control of herself. She just stood, watching, not even bothering to wipe the drop BG's blood and membrane off her face. There was more hysteria as Round starred the safety glass around the entrance. The BG had obviously seized his chance and got to his feet, firing as he went for freedom. Nightmare took the burst into his unprotected trunk and crumpled on top of two Japanese tourists, who stayed where they were, too shocked to move. The BG started towards me, Mini Uzi in his right hand, its strap over his shoulder. What was he going to do? He couldn't open up on me without hitting his boss. Turning Val round to face his BG and protect me, I lifted my 88. I wasn't going to do much against his body armour, even if I could hit a moving target at 15 metres one-handed with a pistol. I had to wait until he was nearer. I fired at him from about 10 metres and kept on firing, aiming below centre mass. It was pointless aiming at his head at that range. I'd emptied at least half of the twenty-round mag, not knowing whether it was going to drop him or not, when I heard him scream, and he went down, his legs buckling. I didn't care where I'd hit him, just that I had. Dragging Val, I passed the reception, trying to avoid the video camera, and headed towards the shop. I was going it alone now, leaving the contact outside to sort itself out. The money was wrapped in my arms, and I wasn't about to give it up. I turned right down a wide corridor heading for the rear car park door. I knew where I needed to go. Time in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. 
Passing the conference rooms and business centre, I pull Val along the thick piled carpet, both of us finding it difficult to breathe. Me from fear and physical exertion, him from strangulation. It was pointless checking behind me. I'd soon know if there was a drama. I'd get shot at. People cowered in doorways as they saw us coming. That suited me fine. Reaching the bottom of the corridor, I climbed four steps, then turned left and climbed ten more. The inner car park door was held open by a fire extinguisher. I hit the crossbar of the second and burst out onto the red asphalt at the rear of the building. The cold took my breath away. I could hear the odd shout from one or two locals crazy enough to come out of their apartments to see what all the fuss was about. My breath was like a racehorse's on a winter gallop. I could hear Val moan. His nostrils were working overtime. There was a stretch of twenty metres or so to the road. All around me, steam escaped from pipes and ventilation shafts, and generators hum like ships' engines. If I got one of the service vehicles, I'd turn left, downhill to the main, where the drone of traffic was coming from. After about ten metres, I could see the car park and loading bays. The only vehicle in sight was a small Hilux van. Fuck it, that would have to do. With the security lights exposing me to the spectators at their windows in the apartments across the street, I tried the door. It was locked. There were no passing vehicles to lift. The roadworks just up the hill had seen to that. There was no choice but to drag Val up the concrete stairs and onto the loading bay. Inside was what looked like a minicab office with a desk, phone, and paperwork in piles. A woman in her mid twenties was standing, talking hysterically in Finnish on the phone. Her left hand waving in the air as if beating off a swarm of wasps. At first, she didn't recognise what was in front of her until I shouted and pointed the eighty-eight. The keys! Give me the keys now! She knew what I was saying. She dropped the phone, the other end still talking, and pointed at the desk. I grabbed them and ran back down the stairs to the van. Val clenching his teeth as he took the pain in his neck. It still wasn't worth checking around me. I knew I was being watched, and worrying about it wasn't going to make it stop. By now, the woman in the minicab office would be back on the phone, telling the world anyway. I ripped off the cardboard that was keeping the windscreen ice-free and opened the passenger door using my left hand. My right was on the weapon, and I needed to keep the exposed trigger finger from making any contact. I might need to move my ass, but not at the expense of leaving prints. Get in! Get in! He might not speak English, but with my pistol stuck into his neck, Val got the drift. Once I'd finished kicking him in, I climbed over the top of him, keeping the barrel of the pistol into his neck as I moved into the driver's seat and put the key in the ignition. Firing the engine, I threw it into gear. The tires pounded the cobblestones as I drove downhill to the main, the demister on full. I could see the streetlights ahead, with the traffic cutting across from both directions. I got level with the hotel drive. The Nissan was missing. Maybe Sergei had got away. All the other vehicles were still there. Christmas lights had fallen off the trees and lay across the tarmac, amongst the scattering of empty brass cases. Bodies were strewn all over the ground. I couldn't tell who was who from this distance, though one of them had to be Reggie or Ronnie, because the whole area was covered by a thin blanket of mist. One of their CS canisters must have got hit and was still spewing its contents into the wind. One of the drivers had nearly got away. His suited body was slumped by one of the small decorative trees just before the exit. Steam rose from the blood oozing from his gunshot wounds. It looked as if their armor wasn't designed to take AP rounds either. I passed by, suddenly thinking about the couple in the lift. Then, stopping at the junction with the main drag, I focused on what to do next. I turned right and merged with the traffic. Chapter Three. Flashing blue lights raced towards me as I headed in the direction of the city centre, nearly blinding me as they screamed past. At the second option, I turned right up the road where Sergei and I had waited in the Nissan. The eighty-eight was in my right hand, still rammed into Val's neck, forcing me to change gear with my left and hold the wheel in position with my knees. The target was amazingly compliant. In fact, unless I was reading it wrong. His body language seemed to be saying, "No sweat. I'll just wait and see what happens next." The DOP was about ten minutes away and should have marked the end of phase one and the beginning of phase two, the change of vehicles and move to the truck service station, from where we would all RV before moving over the border into Russia. 
Plan B was in action now. In the event of a gang fuck, we'd each make our own way back to the lakeside house where we'd been based for the last two weeks and wait for 24 hours. I was feeling very vulnerable and exposed without Sergei. I might have the money curled up in the footwell, but without help there was no way I was going to get it over the border. Sergei was the only one squared away with the world's most corrupt border guards, and he had been too switched on to tell anyone else how it was organised. I just knew that we were going in a truck adapted to conceal us all under the floor like I.I.s, illegal immigrants, which Sergei would drive. That was his insurance policy, and the reason I'd given him the least dangerous job on the operation. The road started to bend right, heading out of the city. I had travelled this route to the DOP both physically and in my head tens of times. It went through residential areas with snow piled neatly at the sides of the wet roads, street lighting and Christmas decorations reflected off the gleaming cobblestones. From all around me came the sound of sirens, jolting me out of my pissed-off-with-all-Russians mode. Blue lights flashed across a junction ahead of me. I took the next right, anything to get off the road and out of sight. I turned into a driveway leading to the rear of an apartment block. There was no lighting back there as I drove over to the far side and stopped under a covered parking space. Keeping the engine running, I sat with the weapon stuck in Val's neck as sirens screamed from all sides. Now what? No way was I going on foot. If spotted, the only way to escape would be to leave him. That wasn't an option. My money stayed with me. Fuck it. There was nothing I could do but brass it out. The longer I stayed there, the more police would be in the area looking for the van. What was more, they'd have time to throw cordons around the city before we got out. I needed to get to the DOP as soon as possible and detach myself from the hotel roadshow. Back on the road, I put my foot down. It was dodgy, but sometimes it's best not to think too much. Four more minutes and I was level with the chain-link fence of the car park. Over to my right, towards the hotel, a low-flying helicopter lit up the sky with its night sun. The beam bounced around, searching the park and frozen lake on the other side of the main drag from the Intercontinental. Their reaction time had been excellent, which pissed me off even more. If it wasn't for them being on heightened alert because of the EU conference, they'd have taken a lot longer to get their act together. I moved towards the car park entrance. The streetlights illuminated the edge of the compound so I could peer through the fence into the semi-darkness beyond, looking for anything unusual. Car parks are always the best place to lose a car. The downsides are that they're often monitored by video cameras and there's a strong chance of finding some jobs worth on the gate to take your cash. This one was free. No cameras, no staff and not lit up, which was why Sergei and I decided to use it. The other four were using a park and ride about seven minutes away. At the moment, however, the slightest suspicious sign, like cars with no lights but engines running, would be enough to keep me driving past. Carrying on to the junction, I turned left, crossing tram lines and drove towards the entrance. People had stopped on the street and shop owners were standing in their doorways, looking up at the heli with its light and noise, talking excitedly to each other. I kept my eyes on the car park. It looked less than half full. Shoppers would have binned it for the day. Any vehicles that were left were probably there to stay. I indicated left, relieving Val's neck of my 88 as I needed both hands to manoeuvre the Hilux across the road and into a parking space. I felt exposed, waiting for a gap in the traffic, yet resisted the temptation to jump across and risk hitting an oncoming car. A gap appeared, not before time, and as I drove under a height bar, it was as if I'd entered a new world, dark and safe. Driving a circuit to check the area, I ensured that the passenger side of the Hilux would face the row of vehicles where the Volvo saloon was parked. Valentin had all but disappeared into the shadow of the footwell. The heli was quartering the night sky, raking the ground with its night sun. The dark blue Volvo saloon was nosy parked, the boot sticking out. I stopped, making a tea of the car and the Hilux. The only sounds were the van's engine ticking over and the heater on full blast. Val's shoes scraped across the ribbing of the rubber matting as he shifted position. It was almost peaceful until more sirens erupted. 
Way over on the other side of the car park, an interior light came on as somebody got into his car. The engine didn't start up. It was probably sitting in the driver's seat watching the heli. I waited. Now that my ears had adjusted to the new, safer environment, I could make out the metallic rumble of a tram fading towards the city centre. Police sirens wailed in the distance as the night sun continued to scour the lake and park. The sirens got nearer. I sat, waited, and watched, trying to work out where they were. Three or four police cars were following the tram lines along the fence, their flashing lights throwing bursts of colour across the roofs of the parked cars. Seconds later, two more appeared. I looked down at Val. I could make out his face in the glow of the dashboard. His eyes showed no fear. He was switched on enough to accept that overreaction at this stage could result in him being killed, or, perhaps worse, seriously injured. He couldn't take that chance. From the moment he'd realised he wasn't going to die and that capture was inevitable, he hadn't panicked. He had to assume that I would be flapping and that any unexpected move on his part might provoke a reaction from me and the chances were it would be a bad one. The less he resisted, the less punishment he was going to get and the more time he'd have to watch and wait for an opportunity to escape. I pressed the release catch on the pistol grip with my right thumb and caught the magazine in my left hand as it slid from the grip. Inserting a full twenty-round mag in its place, I heard the click as it locked home and pulled on the bottom to check it was going to stay put. I put the half-empty mag in my right pocket along with the tape sockets. I didn't want to risk slapping a half-empty one back in if I was in the shit and had to change mags in a hurry. Another three or four police cars crossed the entrance, lights flashing and sirens blasting. The night sun was now roaming around in quick, jerky movements. The heli-watcher in the car park had seen enough and drove out towards the main. The warning buzzer sounded as I took the keys out of the ignition. My lights were still on. I looked down at Val. Stay! I sounded as if I was talking to a dog. I got out of the Hilux and could hear the thud, thud, thud of the heli's rotor blades as it hovered in the distance. All their attention was still in the immediate vicinity of the hotel, but I knew it wouldn't last. The cold air scoured my face as I walked around the front of the wagon, cutting through the headlights, keeping my eyes on the cab, the weapon down by my side. More flashing lights and sirens headed up the main. This time some of the squad cars started to peel off, one came down the road I'd made my approach on, brilliant blue strobes bouncing off me and the vehicles around me for a few seconds as it passed. My attention was focused on the main entrance. Would the next set of lights come into the car park? I knew there was nothing I could do about it but watch and wait, but that didn't stop my heart rate shifting up a gear or two. End of Side 2 Side 3 Seconds later, the darkness returned. Only the sirens were left, dying in the distance. The heli noise throbbed back into earshot. I felt under the rear right-hand wheel arch of the Volvo with my fingers and retrieved the magnetic box that held the key. I hit the fob and there was a comforting whoop as the doors unlocked. I inserted the key in the boot lock and pulled it open. Reggie and Ronnie had glued thick sponge all round the framework of the luggage area, mainly so the target didn't injure himself, but also to subdue any noise if he felt like having a kick and scream while we were in transit. As an extra precaution, the light units had been taped down on the inside. The last thing we needed was for Val to pull one off, stick his hand through as we waited at a set of lights, and wave to a family on their way to give Granny her Christmas presents. They'd also lined the floor with a thick Four Seasons duvet, with another on top, ready to stop him dying of hypothermia. Sitting on top was an orange plastic ball about the size of an egg, a roll of black gaffer tape, and several sets of plastic cuffs. I opened the passenger door and Val looked up at me, then across at the boot and its contents. I didn't have a clue what would happen to him once we hit St. Petersburg, and I didn't care. All I was concerned about was the $500,000 on offer, or what was left of it after Sergei got his $200,000. Scanning the area once more, I brought the 88 up, angled my wrist at 90 degrees, 
and rammed the weapon into the space above his bulletproof waistcoat, then yanked it back into its normal position so the muzzle was twisted in his shirt. I didn't need to force his head downwards. He wanted to see what was happening as I placed my right index finger back on the trigger. Tilting the weapon up so the grip was near his face, I made sure he saw me remove the safety catch with my thumb and heard the click. I didn't need to explain the facts of life to him. After all, he hadn't got where he was today by helping old ladies across the road. As far as Val was concerned, this was just another day in paradise. He wasn't about to fuck about now. With my free hand, I reached under his waistcoat. Up, up, up! There was no argument. His knees came out of the footwell and he staggered onto the tarmac. I turned him round so the backs of his thighs were against the boot of the Volvo and leaned forward onto him as more sirens wailed in the distance and the heli fought to keep position against the wind. He got the idea and manoeuvred himself in, keeping his eyes fixed on mine. Still no fear in them, though. The look was more analytical now, as if he was conducting some sort of character assessment, trying to figure me out. He was in total control of himself. It was not the reaction you'd expect from the victim of a lift, and I found it unnerving. He ended up on his back in the boot, knees up and hands across his stomach. Swapping over hands on the 88, I got hold of the orange plastic ball and stuffed it into his mouth. Still, there was no resistance, just some snorting through his nose as I rammed the ball home. Reggie and Ronnie had folded over the last four inches of the roll on the gaffer tape so I could do the next bit with just one hand. I taped round his mouth and chin, then carried on up around his ears and eyes, leaving just his nose uncovered. More sirens and lights, this time moving along the side road the same way I had come. It wouldn't be long now before they started to check the car parks. I heard the heli's engine change pitch. It was moving again, its night sun now at 45 degrees, illuminating everything in its path, working its way towards me. Slamming the boot shut on Val, I jumped back into the Hilux as the noise increased and the beam got brighter. There is no hiding place from those beams once they ping you. If they did, I'd change my mind about the $500,000 and just make a run for it on foot. I had my escape route worked out, straight over the fence and into the maze of apartment blocks opposite. I sat and waited. There was nothing else I could do. The car and van took a direct hit and it felt like a scene from Close Encounters as both vehicles were flooded with light. A second or two later, the engine note changed and the heli lurched in the direction of the main route out of town. The shadows returned as it moved away across the sky. I drove the van into an empty space, got out and went to check on Val. He was breathing heavily. I watched him and waited. He might have sinus problems, a blocked nose, the flu. I didn't want him to die. I only got paid for meat on the hoof. He snorted loudly to clear his nose. Headlights veered towards me, but I hadn't heard a car door slam. It wasn't somebody from the car park. I leaned over Val to make it look as if I was sorting out my packages. Our faces were close to one another, and I felt his breathing against my cheek. It was the first time I'd actually smelled him. After my little stay with Carpenter and Nightmare, I was expecting a combination of strong cigarettes, homemade alcohol and armpit. What I got was gaffer tape with a hint of cologne. The problem had gone. Either the vehicle had found a parking space or left the area. I didn't give a shit which. I stood up slowly and had a look around, then rammed the pistol into his neck. With my other hand, I got hold of his shoulder and started to pull. He got the drift. I wanted him on his front. The car rocked slightly with his exertions, but it didn't matter. There was nobody around to notice. Once he was on his stomach, I got hold of one of the plastic cuffs, looped it round his wrists and pulled it tight. Then I wrapped the second duvet around him, still making sure he had room to breathe. The Volvo started first time. I headed left, out onto the main, away from the hotel. I only hoped that Sergei was doing the same. I headed east out of Helsinki towards the motorway. The RV was at Varlimo, about 180 k's away. I hit the seat button on the radio and turned up the volume to drown out the noise of the heater. I drove, thinking about everything and nothing. Twice I saw the flashing lights of a heli. Eventually I passed the Varlimo service station area. This was trucker's heaven, the final stop before Russia. 
They used it as a meeting point so that they could move on in convoy. Hijacking was rife in the motherland. In amongst them somewhere was our vehicle, with welded compartments for us all to play I.I.'s. Valimor was just a few k's from Sergei's tame checkpoint. Ten k's north of the town was the lakeside house. I turned off the radio and reached into the glove compartment for the digital scanner, which Sergei had tuned into the police channel. It was about the size of a mobile phone. The plan had been to use it from the time we exited Helsinki. That was another reason I needed Sergei. He spoke Finnish. I tried to make sense of the squelchy radio traffic, but didn't have a clue what I was listening to. What I was hoping not to hear was Volvo, 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 because then it would be odds-on that I had a one-way ticket to Havoc. I checked every lay-by and minor gravel road for any hint of activity. There was nothing. My lights hit the marker I was looking for. Mailbox 183, a red plastic pedal bin on a white pole. I turned right onto a deeply rutted track that led into the forest. It was only a few hours since we'd last driven up it. About ten metres in, a white painted chain suspended between two poles barred the way. Attached to it was a wooden sign saying, Fuck off, private property, in Finnish. I left the engine running and got out of the car, checking in the headlights for a recent sign of another vehicle. The compacted ice was giving very little away. I looked carefully at the point where the last link of the chain was looped over a hook screwed into the right-hand pole, but could see nothing in the shadow cast by the Volvo's headlights. I took the weight of the chain so the first links came loose and pulled gently. I could feel the pressure of the cotton that still fastened it to the hook, and then the sudden pressure release as it broke. No one had been through here who shouldn't have. I drove over the chain, then jumped out and replaced it. To the side, under a pile of stones, the reel of cotton thread was just where I'd left it. I tied the first link to the hook again, replaced the reel, and got back in the car. The pines were so tall and close to the track it was like driving through a tunnel. After 250 metres, the trees retreated, leaving a stretch of open ground about the size of four football pitches. I knew that in summer it was all grass and tree stumps because there were framed pictures of it in the house, but now everything was covered by a metre-deep blanket of snow. The track dipped slightly, and the two-storey house was caught in the beam of my headlights. There were no lights on inside, no vehicles outside. The track led to a wooden lean-to with enough room for three cars. Both buildings were made of timber and painted dark red with white window frames, and wouldn't have looked out of place in the Yukon during the gold rush. I drove into the lean-to. A huge stack of firewood filled the whole of the back wall. The door on the far left led to the other side of the house and the lake. I killed the engine, and for the first time in hours there was almost total silence. No gunfire, shouts, sirens, helis or car heaters, just low-volume hiss and mush as Finnish police talked Finnish police stuff on the scanner. I didn't really want to move. The entrance was in the gable end of the main building, and the key was hidden in the log pile. Very original. I went inside and was hit by wonderful warmth. The heaters worked off the mains, and we'd left them all on. The labour-intensive wood fire was for holidaymakers. Besides, chimney smoke would have advertised our presence. I threw the light switch and went back to the car for Valentin. Chapter 4 the duvet had kept him alive, but only just. After two hours in the boot, he was shaking with the cold. Right, come on, up, up! I moved his legs over the sill and pulled him out by his body armour. He couldn't do much with his hands behind his back, but he seemed to be concentrating most on not having the ball fall to the back of his mouth and choke him. Fair one. That was why I'd used it. I guided him inside as his legs started to come back to life and sat him on an old green velour settee next to a radiator. The decor was functional, just bare wooden floors and walls, and the downstairs was one very large open space. A stone fireplace stood opposite the door, and three wooden pillars, each about a foot in diameter and evenly spaced, helped to support the floor above. Most of the furniture, apart from the settee, was chunky pine, and the place smelled like a timber yard. I pulled hard on the gaffer tape around Valentin's face. 
He winced as the adhesive took neck and eyebrow hair with it. His skin was cold, the colour of a dead cod. He spat out the ball, coughing and spluttering. I was the typical Brit abroad. When in doubt, just keep to your own language and shout, Stay there! I pointed at the radiator. Not that he would be going anywhere, plastic cuffed up. You'll be warm in a minute! He looked up and nodded. A gust of wind whistled under the eaves. I expected Vincent Price to turn up any minute. I went back to the car and retrieved the scanner, putting it on the kitchen table. Every fifteen seconds or so there was some traffic on the net, but no detectable note of urgency, as there would be if they were sending in the helicopters. There wasn't any slow, deliberate whispering either, so hopefully they weren't trying to sneak up on me. Maybe. Who knew? Next priority was to get a brew on. The kitchen worktop stretched along the wall behind me. I went over and checked the kettle for water. Standing, waiting for it to boil, I watched Val shivering. He was sitting close enough to the heater to make it pregnant. He'd had a hard life, judging by the lines on his face, but he still had his Slavic good looks, wide cheekbones, green eyes and dark brown hair, the grey at the temples making him look pretty dignified for a hood. I had to take my hat off to him. The boy had done good. Mercs, BG, the best hotels and a great line in slappers. I was jealous. My future was looking the same as my past. The water boiled as I opened a packet of crisp breads that was on the worktop. I munched on one and emptied the kettle onto ground beans in a cafetiere. Val had his knees up and was trying to use his body to flick his overcoat around him. His face was starting to regain its colour and his eyes followed my every move. The team's kit had been piled into bags to the left of the main door. Sergei and I had planned to return here after delivering the money to St. Petersburg, me to drive to Sweden and then, via ferry, to Germany, him to clean up this place. I picked up a canvas kit bag and threw it on the table. Holstering the pistol, I fished inside for more plastic cuffs, putting three interlocking strips together to make one long one. Moving around the table, I gripped Val's shoulders, then dragged him over towards the central pillar and pushed him down on his arse against it. I plastic-cuffed his upper right arm to the support. Then, with the leather man, I cut the original plastic-cuff so that his left arm was free. He wasn't going anywhere unless he did a Samson and took the pillar with him. Returning to the other side of the table, I pushed the plunger down on the cafetiere and filled two big mugs with steaming coffee. I threw a handful of sugar lumps into each one and gave them a stir with my knife. I didn't know how he took his, but I doubted he was going to complain. I didn't normally take sugar myself, but today was an exception. I walked over to him and put his mug on the floor. He gave me a brisk nod of thanks. I couldn't tell him, but I knew what it felt like to entertain all three of Mr. and Mrs. Death's little boys, wet, cold, and hunger— and wouldn't wish them on anyone. Anyway, it was my job to keep him alive, not add to his misery. The scanner was still giving the odd burst as I settled down at the table facing Val. I took a couple of sips, and then it was time to get out of my costume. I felt uncomfortable in it, and if I had to start performing, the last thing I wanted to be wearing was a suit and a pair of lace-up shoes. Lugging my diving bag over to the table, I dug out jeans, Timberland boots, T-shirt, sweatshirt, and a green Helly Hansen fleece. The Chechen watched me intently as he drank coffee and I got changed. I got the sense he was enjoying my failure to interpret the scanner traffic. I felt much more my old self as I tucked my weapon into the front of my jeans. I went back to my coffee. Valentin had finished his and the empty mug was at his feet. I took in the cafetiere and packet of crisp breads. He nodded as I poured new brews for both of us. I sat at the table and ate the last of the bananas Reggie and Ronnie had left behind. The scanner continued to crackle away, and in the silences between bursts from the operating stations, all I could hear was the crunching of crisp bread. I couldn't stop thinking about Sergei. What if he didn't turn up? I hadn't worked that one out yet. I hadn't even wanted him to come on the lift. It would have been better if he'd just stayed with the truck. We'd all have RV'd with him, then been chauffeured across the border, but he insisted on being there in case there was any dodgy dealing. I would probably have done the same myself. But now what? I had another thought. What would happen if one of Sergei's boys was still alive? 
it probably wouldn't take too long for the police to get him to talk. I stopped munching and put down my mug. Shit, we had to get out of here. Getting to my feet, I grabbed carpenters and nightmares bags and took a red ski jacket and bottoms from mine. I put the 88 and the mags in the front pockets and threw carpenters' cold weather gear to Val. Carpenter was a big boy, so the fit wasn't going to be a problem. Leaving him to figure out how he was going to put it on, with his arms still secured, I ran upstairs to get two double duvets. Once back downstairs, I pulled my weapon, cut him free, and stepped back. Get dressed, I shouted, miming putting on a jacket. He got the hint and started removing his overcoat and tuxedo. I watched him, ready to react to any wrong move. Everything he was wearing stank of money. His shoes were so smart I looked at the label. English. Patrick Cox. A few pairs of those would have paid for my roof repair. I let him keep his wallet. Having checked through it and seen old pictures of children dressed in romper suits, I'd always avoided getting lumbered with stuff like that myself, but understood that these things were important to people. Val was soon dressed in a pair of yellow salopettes, a green ski jacket, an orange bobble hat with big dangling pom-poms, gloves, a scarf and a pair of cold weather boots, all of which must have been at least three sizes too big. He looked ready for a stint as a children's entertainer. I pointed the pistol up and back towards the pillar. He went over obediently. I showed him that I wanted him to hug it, an arm either side. Then it was just a matter of making up another set of extra long plastic cuffs, doing up two ratchets so it was like a lasso, looping it over his wrists and pulling tight. I left him to adjust himself as I took my torch and went outside into the lean-to for a couple of shovels. One, a big trough-type one, used for clearing pathways of snow, the other a normal building site job. I dumped them on the table and the torch went into my salopette pocket. Val was trying to work out what I was up to. He was looking at me in the same way as his slapper had done in the hotel, as if there was no danger and nothing was happening that might affect him. He appeared to think he was just a neutral observer. I started ransacking the cupboards, looking for thermos flasks and food. I was out of luck. It looked as if we'd both had our last hot drink and crisp bread for a while. I picked up my mug and down the last of the coffee as I walked over to him. I put his mug in his hand and indicated that he should do the same. He was soon busy manoeuvring his head around the post to meet his hands, while I took candles and matches from the cupboard under the sink and threw them into one of the bags. Once I'd stuffed the duvets on top and done up the zip, I cut him free, motioning him to put the bag on his back. He knew what I meant and used the two handles as if they were straps on a bergen. I put on my black woolen hat and ski gloves, then picked up the shovels from the table and used them to guide him out of the door. I walked behind, hitting the light switch. I left the scanner on the table. It would give our position a way to use it out there. I held him as I got the keys from the Volvo. It was my only transport out of here, and I wanted to make sure it stayed that way. Once through the lean-to door, we followed the well-worn track in the snow towards the lake shore. It was pitch black out here and bitterly cold. The wind was much stronger now. Swirling snow stung my cheeks as we moved forwards. The hellies wouldn't be up around here in this wind. Chapter 5 a small wooden hut housing the wood-burning sauna stood about thirty metres away along the frozen lakeshore. Beyond it was a wooden jetty, which stood about a metre above the ice. The Chechen was still ahead of me, leaning into the wind and half-turning from the waist to protect his face from the driving snow. He stopped when he got to the sauna, perhaps expecting me to motion him inside. Instead, I sent him round to the right. He obediently stepped out a metre or so along the jetty. Whoa! Stop there! I shouted. Stop! 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 He turned round, and I pointed with my pistol down at the frozen lake. He looked at me quizzically. Down there! On the ice! On the ice! Very slowly, he got down and sat in the snow, then rolled over, tentatively prodding the ice to make sure it would take his weight. I knew it would. I'd been messing about on it for the last two weeks. Once he was standing, I got him to move out of reach while I clambered down in case he decided he'd had enough of this game and wanted to play stealing cars and driving home. Prodding him along the ice with the shovels, I paralleled the lake shore. By taking this route, we wouldn't leave any sign from the house, 
but it meant we were more exposed to the wind. It was just a matter of leaning into it until we'd covered the 150 metres to the tree line. Once there, we carried on for a bit before I gave him another shout. He turned again, awaiting new instructions, his head tilted against the wind, screaming across the lake. I could hear his laboured breathing and just make out the shape of his face as I pointed at the trees to our right. He turned towards them and started to move as the wind buffeted the backs of our jackets. The snow was no problem at first, no more than about two feet deep, but soon it was up to our waists. He did all the work, ploughing through it. I just followed in his wake as his boots crunched down until they met compacted surface, lifted up and did the same thing all over again. We moved another fifty metres, about ten metres inside the tree line, and that was enough. We were in direct line of sight of the house. Having spent my childhood in South London housing estates, to me the countryside had always been just a green place full of animals that hadn't yet been frozen or cooked. I hadn't been into all that trapping stuff I was taught while in the regiment. In fact, I'd forgotten most of it. I'd never felt the need to run around in a hat made out of freshly skinned rabbit. Building shelters, however, was a skill I did keep tucked away somewhere in the back of my head. I vaguely remembered that there would be spaces beneath the spreading boughs of the conifers at snow level. Finding what seemed the biggest tree in the forest, I rammed the large shovel into the snow just short of where the lowest branches disappeared. Moving back out of the way so he couldn't hit me with it, I motioned for Val to take off the bag. No problem from him on that one. Then I gave him the other spade. Val didn't need any further encouragement. The wind was blowing hard, flattening my jacket against my body, and if we were to stay alive out here, we had to get out of it soon. The ambient temperature was low enough as it was, but the effect of wind chill took it well below freezing. He might have been wearing a dinner jacket earlier on and heading for a night at the theatre, but he was obviously no stranger to physical graft. You can always tell whether someone's used to a shovel. He worked efficiently, not tearing the arse out of it, obviously knowing better than to let himself break out in a sweat and have it freeze on him later. After a while he stopped digging, got on his knees and started to scoop out snow with his gloved hands. Then he disappeared into the cave. A few minutes later he turned and stuck his head out. I thought I could just about make out the hint of a proud smile from under his hat. I waved him back inside, throwing the bag in with him. Before I joined him, I pulled back the index finger of my right-hand glove, pushing my trigger finger through the slit. I'd prepared this one, just like the leather pair for the build-up. I followed him head first, with the 88 up, hitting the torch button once in cover. The shelter could have taken three people kneeling. Once in, I slid round and landed up on my arse with the pistol in the aim. I put the torch in my mouth. For him, it was bondage time again. Pulling a set of plastic cuffs from my pocket, I stuck the pistol into his neck, twisting it into his skin this time. I plastic cuffed his left hand to the branch above him. Snow fell on us as I ratcheted the plastic tight. We both shook our heads, trying to get it off our faces. With his arm now strapped above his head, Val sat there looking like a gibbon as I got out a candle and matches. The candle provided more light than it would normally have, thanks to the reflection from the brilliant white walls. I crawled back to the entry point, pulled in the shovels, and used one to pile snow across the gap. It would keep out the wind. It was time to get everything else sorted. I emptied the contents of the bag and started to spread out the duvets on the ground. Contact with the snow would conduct heat away from our bodies about twenty times faster than if we sat on the bedding. Next, I smoothed out the sides of our hole with a gloved hand so that, as heat rose... The melting snow didn't form drip points and fall on us like rain. That done, I dug a small channel around the edge so that whatever did start to melt would run down the sides and refreeze there. In situations like this, 5% extra effort always leads to 50% more comfort. The wind was no longer the prominent noise. The rustling of nylon clothing and both of us sniffing or coughing had taken over. The cave was beginning to look like a steam room as our breath hung in clouds in the confined space. Using the grip end of a shovel, I dug a small tunnel. I needed to be able to see out towards the house and we needed ventilation. 
The candlelight wouldn't be seen directly from the house, as it was low down and in an alcove. I just had to hope the ambient glow wasn't bright enough to be seen either, because there was no way we could do without it. Even the small amount of heat from a candle flame can help bring the temperature up to freezing point. On my knees, I looked towards the house. Well, it was out there in the darkness somewhere. Even with this amount of clothing on and some insulation beneath me, my body was still cold because we weren't moving. I readjusted my position so that I was comfortable and could still see outside. Val continued to study me. At least two very cold, boring hours must have passed with me listening to the wind and Val constantly fidgeting to get feeling back into his arm, when all of a sudden he said, The Maliskia must have offered you quite a sizable amount of money to keep me alive. I am obviously more of a threat to them than I thought. I spun round in amazement. It was a very confident, clear voice. He was smiling. He obviously liked my reaction. Now that you are alone, I should imagine it will be quite difficult to get me out of the country. To wherever it is the Meliskia want you to take me. He paused. St. Petersburg, perhaps? I stayed silent. He was right. I was in the shit. You have a name, I presume? I shrugged. It's Nick. Ah, Nicholas. You're British? Yeah, that's right. I turned back to the house. Tell me, Nicholas, what did the Maliskia offer you? One million US? <laughs> Let me tell you, I am worth considerably more than that to them. What is one million? It wouldn't even buy a decent apartment in London, I know. <laughs> I have three. I carried on looking out of the hole. I don't know who or what the Meliskia are. They sound Russian, but I was employed in London. He laughed. London, New York, it doesn't matter. It was them. They would very much like to have a meeting with me. Who are they? The same as me, but infinitely more dangerous, I can assure you. He got up onto his knees and a small shower of ice fell as the branch moved. I couldn't imagine anyone being more dangerous. Russian Organizatia, ROC, was spreading their operations around the world, growing faster than any crime organization in the history of mankind. From prostitution to blackmail, bombing hotels to buying Russian Navy submarines to smuggle drugs, all the different gangs and splinter groups were infiltrating nearly every country to the tune of billions of dollars. These people were making so much money it made Gates and Branson look like welfare cases. With that much money and power at stake, I was sure there would be the odd disagreement between different groups. There was silence for a while as I kept a trigger on the house. Then Val spoke again. Nick, I have a proposition that I think will appeal to you. End of Side 3 Side 4 Chapter 6 I didn't respond, just kept my eyes on the house. It's a very simple proposition. Release me, and I will reward you handsomely. I have no idea what your plan is now. Mine, however, is to stay alive and at liberty. I am willing to pay you for that. I turned to look at him. How? There's nothing in your wallet but photographs. He tutted, a father addressing a wayward son. Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, but now that your plan has failed, I imagine you would like to get away from this country as quickly as you can. Release me. Return to London, and then I will get you the money. One of my apartments is in the name of Mr. P. P. Smith. He smiled. The name seemed to amuse him. The address is 3A. Palace Gardens, Kensington. Would you like me to repeat that? No, I've got it. I knew the area. It fitted the bill. It was full of Russians and Arabs, people with so much money they owned apartments worth millions and only used them once in a blue moon. Let's say that in two days' time and for the next seven days after death, from noon till 4 p.m., 
there will be somebody at that address. Go there, and you will receive one hundred thousand dollars U.S. A drop of melted ice hit me on the cheek. I took a handful of snow from the tunnel and ran it over the drip point, my mood as black as the night I was staring into. What the fuck was I doing freezing in this snow hole? I had half a million dollars sitting here with me, from doing something the firm would have paid me a couple of hundred a day for, but I couldn't get at it. My only hope of ever seeing it was Sergei, and fuck knew where he was. Val knew when to talk, and when to shut up and let people think. I went back to watching the house for another hour or so, getting even more cold and miserable. I was slowly convincing myself that, if Sergei didn't make an appearance, I should take my chances with Val in London. Why not? It wasn't as if I had anything to lose, and I was desperate for the paycheck. I could only hear the faint noise of the engine at first. It was tucked into the trees somewhere on the track and fighting to be heard above the wind. The headlights appeared out of the tree line heading towards the house. The noise got louder as it moved along the track. It was a four by four in low ratio. Sergei? It was impossible to tell if it was the Nissan from this distance. Val had also heard it and was keeping still so his jacket didn't rustle and drown out the noise. I watched the headlights briefly illuminate the front of the house before turning into the lean-to and cutting out. I heard just one door slam and my eyes moved to the windows. I saw nothing. I slid over to Val. Passively, he let me check his plastic cuffs. They were secure. He wasn't going anywhere unless he happened to have a chainsaw hidden inside his coat. All the same, I wish I'd bought some tape to cover his mouth in case he decided to shout for help. It wasn't until I blew out the candle so he couldn't use it to burn the cuffs off and started to push my way out of the snow that he sparked up. Nick? I stopped but didn't turn. What? Think about what I have said as you go to meet your friends. My offer is infinitely more profitable for you and, may I say, safer? We'll see. I pushed myself out into the wind and was very much thinking about it. Glad that Val wasn't going to scream and shout out. He knew what was happening. If it was Sergei at the house, Val could shove his offer. By the morning we would be in St. Petersburg, and I'd have my money and be on my way back to London. As I retraced my route, the wind was blowing head on, making my eyes stream. I could feel my tears turn to ice. I listened to the trees creak in the gale. Snow whipped into a frenzy, attacked the exposed skin around my neck and face as I tried to focus on the house and surrounding area. Kicking on about twenty metres, I checked the house again. The upstairs lights were on now, but there was still no movement inside. Moving off once more, I tried not to get too euphoric about the prospect of Sergei being there, but the feeling that this job could soon be over made the wind seem marginally less powerful. Once below the sauna, on the lake, I pulled my trigger finger from its glove and pulled out the 88. It was far too dark to see with the naked eye, so I checked chamber with my exposed finger and ensured the mag was on tight, then climbed up onto the bank and moved forward in a semi-crouch until I got to the lean-to entrance. I was eager to make contact with Sergei, but had to take things slowly. Only when I actually saw him would I feel safe. I stood and listened at the lean-to door not hearing anything apart from the sound of the wind bouncing it backwards against the lock. Keeping to the right of the frame, I pulled the metal handle down and the wind did the rest, forcing it inwards. Fortunately, the bottom scraped along the ground, preventing it from crashing into the woodpile. On my hands and knees in the snow, I eased my head round the bottom of the door frame. The Nissan was parked the other side of the Volvo, the light from the ground floor window reflecting off its roof. Things were looking up but I'd have to wait a while before jumping with joy. I moved into the lean-to and checked no one was still in the Nissan. Then I pushed the door to, feeling warmer out of the wind. The entrance to the house was closed, but the warm glow from the window was enough for me to be seen if anyone came out of it. I moved to the right of the frame, pushing my ear against the door. I couldn't hear a thing. I moved to the other side of the Nissan and looked in through the window, there was no need to get right up to the glass to see in. It's always best to stay back and use the available cover. My heart sank. 
Carpenter. Still dressed in his suit, but now without a tie or overcoat. He was taking pills from a small tin and swallowing them, shaking his head violently to force them down. His mini-uzi was exposed, rigged up over his jacket and dangling under his right arm, with a harness strap bunching up the material where it crossed his back. He moved about the room with no apparent purpose, sometimes out of view. Then I saw he had Val's masking tape and ball gag wrapped in his massive hand. He brought them up to his face for a moment and, realising their significance, hurled them to the ground. Then he started lifting chairs and smashing them against the walls, kicking our overcoats about the room like a two-year-old in a tantrum. It wasn't hard to work out what was going through his mind. He decided that I had left with Val for the border, leaving him in the lurch. Fair one. I'd think the same. No wonder he was chucking his toys out of the pram. The table followed the chairs as the combination of narcotics and rage started to fuck with his head. There was no reason to consider my options. He had just made up my mind for me. Moving back to the outer door, I left him to it. Checking back every ten metres as I crossed the frozen lake, after several minutes I saw headlights in the darkness, heading away from the house and back towards the tree line. What the fuck was Carpenter up to? He probably didn't even know himself. With legs apart and slightly bent to keep myself stable in the gusts, I stood and watched until the lights disappeared into the night. It was very tempting to go back and wait in the house, but Carpenter might return and complicate matters, and anyway, there was still the police to worry about. Turning parallel to the shore, I carried on towards the snow hole. Once in the tree line, I could see the whole of the side of the house. Carpenter had left the lights on, but through the downstairs window, things didn't look right. It took me a second or two to realise what was happening. Not bothering about leaving sign, I moved as fast as I could in a direct line towards the building, stumbling over in snow that sometimes came up to my chest. I was trying so hard to get there quickly that it didn't feel as if I was making any progress. It felt like one of the recurring dreams I'd had as a kid, running to someone, but never as fast as I needed to. As I got closer, I could see flames flickering in the room and smoke spewing out through a broken pane. A thick layer was gathering two or three feet deep on the ceiling and looking for more places to escape from. Fuck the house, it was the Volvo I was worried about. By the time I reached the lean-to, I could already hear the crackling of badly seasoned wood and the screams from the smoke alarms going apeshit. The door to the house was open. Smoke was pouring out from the top of the frame. Either Carpenter had been switched on enough to know that he had to feed the fire with oxygen, or he just didn't give a shit. It didn't matter which, the fact was that it had taken hold big time. I reached the car, the heat searing my back even through my ski jacket. The inside of the house was a furnace. As I put the key in the lock, there was a sound like shotgun rounds being fired. Spray cans of something were exploding in the heat. I reversed slowly out of the lean-to. It would have been pointless screaming out like a loony only to get stuck in the snow. I just wanted to get clear enough so the Volvo wasn't incinerated. After a three-point turn, I drove fifty metres up the track and killed the engine. Jumping out with the keys, I stumbled back into the cover of the tree line, feeling as if I was back in that dream again. By the time I neared the hide, I could make out my shadow quite clearly against the snow. The flames were well and truly taking over from the smoke. Sliding into the snow hole, I pulled out my leather man, felt for the plastic cuffs and started to cut Val free, letting him sort himself out as I scrambled out again into the wind. He soon followed and we both stared at the burning building. Bizarrely, he started to try and comfort me. It's all right. I knew you weren't abandoning me. I am worth too much to you, no? Particularly now. May I suggest that we leave here as soon as possible? Like you. I do not want to encounter the authorities. It would be most inconvenient. What was it with this guy? Did his pulse rate ever go above ten beats per minute? He knew that whatever had happened out here, it had stopped me from meeting up with any of the team. He didn't have to convince me any more to let him go. He knew it was my only sensible option now. The Volvo could easily be seen in the flames. They hadn't penetrated the walls yet, but they were looking out hungrily from the windows. I stopped him short of the car, handed him my leather man and carried on to open the boot, shouting at him to cut the cord in his jacket. 
Even at this distance, I felt the heat on my face. He looked about him, found the nylon cord that could be adjusted to tighten around his waist, and began cutting. There were loud cracks as the frame of the house was attacked by the flames. Val looked at the fire as he heard the boot open. Please, Nick, this time, inside the car. It's very cold in there. It was a request rather than a demand. And, of course, I'd prefer your company to that of the spare tire. Responding to my nod, he settled in the Volvo's rear footwell, giving me back the leather man and offering his hands. I tied them around the base of the handbrake with the cord, where I could see them. We drove out, leaving the fire to do what it had to do. Maybe it wasn't such a bad thing. At least there wouldn't be any evidence of me ever having been there. There was no sign of Carpenter or anyone else as we bumped our way up to the chain gate. I left it on the ground where I found it as a warning to Sergei. There was still a chance that he'd got away. There'd been two Hiluxes at the hotel car park. Maybe he'd nicked the other one. It was too late now to hope that he might get us over the border, but I still didn't want him to get caught. He was a good guy, but fuck it, I was on a new phase now, and one that had nothing to do with any of them. I had lost. I had to accept it. Now I had to take my chances with Val. I'll drop you off at a train station, I said as we headed towards Valimore. You sort yourself out from there. Of course. My people will extricate me quite swiftly. There was no emotion in his voice. He sounded like a Russian version of Jeeves. May I give you some advice? Why not? My eyes were fixed on the road, heading for the motorway past the town, seeing nothing but piled up snow on either side of me. The wind buffeted the side of the car, enough for me to have to keep adjusting the steering. It was like having a heavy Arctic drive past on a motorway. You will obviously want to leave the country quickly, Nick. May I suggest Estonia? From there you can get the flight to Europe fairly easily, or even a ferry to Germany. After what has happened at the hotel, only a fool would try to leave Helsinki by air or cross into Sweden. I didn't reply, just stared at the snow in the headlights. Just after two hours later, we were approaching Poistola, one of the Helsinki suburbs. Not that I could see any of it. First light wasn't for another four hours. People would soon be waking up to their cheese and meatballs and listening to the radio accounts of last night's gunfight at the OK Corral. I looked for signs to the train station. The morning rush hour, if there was one, would start in an hour or two. Pulling into the car park, I cut him free of the handbrake. He knew to stay still and wait for me to tell him when to move. He was so close to freedom, why jeopardise things now? I got out and stood away from the car, my pistol in the pocket of my puffer jacket. He crawled out, and we both stood in a line of frozen-over cars, in the dark, as he sorted himself out, tucking in his clothes and running his hands through his hair. Still looking ridiculous in Carpenter's salopettes and ski jacket, he clapped his gloved hands together to get some circulation going, eventually extending one of them to me. The only shaking I did was with my head. He understood why and nodded. Nick, thank you. You will receive your reward for releasing me. P.P. Smith, remember the rest? Of course I did. My eyes were fixed on his. I considered telling him that if he was lying to me, I'd find him and kill him. But it would have been a bit like telling Genghis Khan to watch himself. He smiled. He'd read my mind again. Don't worry. You will see that I am a man of my word. He turned and walked towards the station. I watched him crunch along in the snow, breath trailing behind him. After about a dozen or so paces, he stopped and turned. Oh, Nick, a request. Please, do not bring a cell phone or pager with you to Kensington or any other electronic device. It's not the way we conduct business. Again, I thank you. I promise that you won't regret any of this. I made sure that he was out of the way, then got back into the car. Chapter 7 Norfolk, England Friday, the 10th of December, 1999. The bedside clock burst into wake-up mode dead on seven, sounding more like a burglar alarm. As I rolled over, it took me three attempts before I managed to hit the off button with my hand still inside the sleeping bag. 
The instant I poked my head out, I could tell the boiler had stopped working again. My house was a bit warmer than a finished snow hole, but not much. It was yet another thing I needed to sort out, along with some bedding and a bed frame to go with the mattress I was lying on. I slept in a pair of Ron Hill running bottoms and sweatshirt. This wasn't the first time the boiler had packed in. I wrapped the unzipped bag around me and pushed my feet into my trainers with the heels squashed down. I headed downstairs, the bag dragging along the floor. I'd spent most of my life being wet, cold and hungry for a living, so I hated doing it on my own time. This was the first place I'd ever owned, and in winter the mornings felt much the same to me as waking up in a hedgerow in South Armagh. It wasn't supposed to work like that. The place was in the same state as I'd left it before I went away just over two weeks ago, to RV with Sergei at the lake house, except that the tarpaulin had blown off the hole in the roof and the for sale sign had been flattened by the wind. If it had stayed there any longer, it would have taken root anyway. There wasn't enough time to sort out any of that today. I had three vitally important meetings in London in a few hours' time, and they wouldn't wait for the boiler man. The trip back to the UK had taken three days. I'd decided to find my own way rather than take Val's advice to get out of Finland via Estonia. It wasn't as if we were sharing toothbrushes or anything, so I wasn't in the mood to trust everything he had to say. I drove to Christiansand in southern Norway, and from there I took the ferry to Newcastle. It was full of Norwegian students. While they got pissed, I watched Sky News on the snowy screens. There was footage of the Intercontinental, with police apparently doing a search for forensic evidence. Then came pictures of the dead, amongst them Sergei. A Finnish government spokeswoman gave a news conference, declaring that it was the worst incident their country had witnessed since the 1950s, but declining to confirm whether it was an ROC shooting, and stressing that there was no connection with, or risk to, the EU conference. As far as they were concerned, this was an unrelated matter. I made my way down the bare wooden staircase, trying not to snag the sleeping bag on the gripper rod that had been left behind when I'd ripped up the carpet. The house was a DIY disaster zone. It had been ever since I'd bought it after bringing Kelly back from the States in 97. In theory, it was idyllic, up on the Norfolk coast in the middle of nowhere. There was a small co-op, and three fishing boats worked out of the tiny harbour. The highlight of the day was when the local pensioners took the free bus to the superstore eight miles away to do their big shop. The estate agent must have rubbed his hands when he saw me coming. A 1930s, three-bedroom, detached mess of pebble dash, just 200 metres from the windy beach. It had been empty for several years after the previous owners had died, probably of hypothermia. The details said, some renovation required, but with magnificent potential. In other words, a shitload of work was needed. My plan was to gut the place and rebuild it. The ripping out was okay. In fact, I'd enjoyed it. But after a succession of builders had sucked through their teeth when giving me their quotes, and I'd got pissed off with them and decided to do it myself, I'd lost interest. So now the house was all bare boards, stud work, and entrails of wiring that I didn't understand sticking out of the walls. Now that I was responsible for Kelly, it had seemed the right time to fulfil the fantasy of having a real home. But no sooner had I exchanged contracts than it had started to make me feel confined. I'd called the place in Hampstead, where she was being looked after, as soon as I'd got back last night. They said she was much the same as when I'd last seen her. I was glad she was sleeping. It meant I didn't have to speak to her. I did want to, but just never knew what the fuck to say. I'd gone to see her the day before leaving for Finland. She'd seemed all right, not crying or anything, just quiet and strangely helpless. The kitchen was in just as bad a state as the rest of the place. I'd kept the old yellow Formica units circa 1962. They do for now. I put the kettle on the gas ring, readjusting the sleeping bag around my shoulders, and went out into the porch to check for mail. It hadn't been stacked up on the kitchen unit as I'd expected. I also wondered why the tarpaulin hadn't been replaced in my absence. I hadn't got a post box yet, but a blue pedal bin did just as well. Very finish, I thought. There were four envelopes, three bills and a card. 
The handwriting told me who the card was from, and I knew before I read it that I was about to get fucked off. Caroline had started coming here to look in on things now and again, to collect the mail and check the walls hadn't collapsed while I was away working as a travelling salesman. She was in her thirties and lived in the village. Her husband no longer lived with her. It seemed he took too much whiskey with his soda. Things were going great between us. She was kind and attractive, and whenever I was here we would link up for an afternoon or two, but a couple of months earlier she had started to want more of a relationship than I felt able to offer. I opened the card. I was right. No more visits or mail collection. It was a shame. I liked her a lot, but it was probably for the best. Things were getting quite complicated. A gunshot wound in the stomach, a reconstructed earlobe and dog-tooth scars along a forearm are hard to explain whatever you're trying to sell. Making a lumpy brew with powdered milk, I went upstairs to Kelly's room. I hesitated before I opened the door, and it wasn't because of the hole in the roof tiles. There were things in there that I'd done for her, not as much as I'd have liked, but they had a habit of reminding me how our lives should have been. I turned the handle. There had probably been more wind than rain in my absence, as the stain on the ceiling wasn't wet. The blue two-man tent in the middle of the floor was still holding out. I'd put nails in the floorboards instead of tent pegs, and they were rusty now but I still couldn't bring myself to take it down. On the mantelpiece were two photos in cheap wooden picture frames, which I had promised to bring down to her on my next visit. One was of her with her family, Kev, Marsha and her sister, Aida, all smiles round a smoking barbecue. It was taken about a month before I'd found them hosed down in their home in the spring of 97. I bet she missed this picture. It was the only decent one she had. The other was of Josh and his kids. This was a recent one, as Josh was carrying a face scar that any neo-Nazi would be proud of. It was of the family standing outside the Special Operations Training Section of the American Secret Service at Laurel, Maryland. Josh's dark pink gunshot wound ran all the way up the right-hand side of his cheek to his ear like a clown's smile. I hadn't had any contact with him since my stupidity got his face rearranged in June 98. He and I still administered what was left of Kelly's trust fund, though, as her legal guardian, I'd found myself shouldering more and more of the financial responsibility. Josh was aware of her problem, but it was just done via letters now. He was the last real friend I had, and I hoped that maybe one day he would forgive me for nearly getting him and his kids killed. It was too early to go in and apologise. At least that was what I told myself but I'd woken up late at night more than once, knowing the real reason. I just couldn't face all that sorrow and guilt stuff at the same time. I wanted to, I just wasn't any good at it. As I picked up Kelly's photos, I realised why I didn't have any myself. They just made me think about the people in them. I cut away from all that, promising myself that re-establishing contact with Josh would be one of the first things I got done next year. I went into the bathroom opposite and ran the buttercup-coloured bath. I had a bit of a soft spot for the foam tiles, now light brown with age, that lined the ceiling. I remembered my stepdad putting some up when I was a kid. These will keep the heat in, he'd said. Then his hand slipped and his thumb left a dent. Every Sunday night when I had a bath, I threw the soap at the ceiling to add to the pattern. Returning to my bedroom, I put Kelly's photos on the mattress to make sure I didn't forget them. I finished my brew, then dug into one of the cardboard boxes, looking for my bike leathers. I checked the bath, and it was time to jump in, after hitting the small radio on the floor, which was permanently tuned to Radio 4. The shooting was still high on the agenda. An expert on ROC declared to listeners of the Today programme that it had all the hallmarks of an interfaction shooting. He went on to say that he had known this was going to happen, and, of course, he knew the group responsible. He could not, however, name them. He had their trust. Sue McGregor sounded as unimpressed as I was. I lay in the bath and glanced at Baby G. Another ten minutes and I had to get moving. The order of the day was first the doctor's office at 11.30 to talk about Kelly's progress, then lie to the clinic's accounts department about why I couldn't pay the new invoice just yet. 
I didn't think they would completely understand if I told them everything would have been fine if a mad Russian called Carpenter hadn't fucked up my cash flow. My next visit would be to Colonel Lynn at the firm. I wasn't looking forward to that conversation either. I hated having to plead. The third stop on my agenda was Flat 3A, Palace Gardens in Kensington. What the hell, I was desperate. I didn't see the Meliskias solving my financial problems. My foray into the freelance market had only reinforced my reluctant dependence on the firm. I had been weapons-free from the firm since the fuck-up in Washington with Josh 18 months before. Lim was right, of course, when he'd said I should feel lucky that I wasn't banged up in some American jail. As for the Brits, I reckon they were still trying to decide what to do with me. Give me a knighthood, or make me disappear. At least I was getting paid two grand a month in cash while they scratched their heads. It was enough to cover Kelly's treatment for about 72 hours. Lynn made it clear that in no way did the retainer mean any change in my status. He didn't say it in so many words, but I knew from the look in his eyes that I was still lowlife, a K, a deniable operator carrying out shit jobs that no one else wanted to do. Nothing would change unless I could get Lynn to put my name forward for permanent carder, and time was running out. He was taking early retirement to his mushroom farm in Wales when he finished running the desk in February. I didn't have a clue who was taking over. Contacting the message service last night, I'd heard Lynn would see me at 13.30. If I ever got back into the good lads club, pay would be increased to £290 a day for ops and £190 for training, but in the meantime, I was in the shit. The chances of selling this house were zero. It was in a worse state than when I'd moved in. I'd bought it for cash, but I couldn't raise a loan on it because I couldn't prove my income. Since leaving the army, it had been cash in envelopes rather than P-A-Y-E. Getting out of the warm bath into the cold bathroom, I dried myself quickly and got into my leathers. From inside the panelling that contained the cistern, I retrieved my 9mm HK USP Heckler & Koch Universal Service Pistol a chunky, square-edged, semi-automatic 9mm, and two 13-round mags. Its holster was my usual one, which could be shoved down the front of my jeans or leathers. Sitting on the toilet lid, I bit open the plastic bag protecting it and loaded the loose rounds. I always eased the mag springs when the weapon wasn't needed. Most stoppages occur because of a misfeed from the magazine, either because the mag's not fully home in the pistol grip or because the mag spring has been under tension for so long that it doesn't do its job when required. When the first round is fired, it might not push the next up into the breech. I loaded the weapon, inserting a mag into the pistol grip and ensuring it was fully home. To make the weapon ready, I pulled back on the top slide with my forefinger and thumb and let go. The working parts moved forwards under their own steam and rammed the top round of the mag into the chamber, I had three USPs in the house, two hidden downstairs when I was here, and one under my bed, a little trick I'd learned from Kelly's dad years ago. I checked chamber by pushing back slightly on the top slide and put the weapon and spare mag in my pocket, slung the day sack over my shoulder and locked up the house. Waiting for me outside was the bike of my dreams, a red Ducati 966 that I'd treated myself to at the same time as the house. It lived in the garage, another pebble-dash marvel of 1930s architecture, and there were times when I reckoned the sound of its engine bursting into life was the only thing that kept me from total despair. End of Side 4 Side 5 Chapter 8 the London traffic was chaos. There were plenty of shopping days left till Christmas, but you wouldn't have thought so from the number of cars. As I rode down from Norfolk, it had been cold, overcast and dull, but at least it was dry. Compared with Finland, it was almost tropical. I got to Marble Arch in just under three hours, but progress was going to be slow going from now on. Weaving my way around stationary vehicles, I looked down Oxford Street, where the decorations blazed and twinkled. The season of goodwill was everywhere, it seemed, except behind the steering wheels of gridlock vehicles and inside my head. I was dreading this. 
The house I called in Hampstead last night was staffed by two nurses who, under the psychiatrist's supervision, were looking after Kelly 24 hours a day. They took her to a clinic in Chelsea several times a week, where Dr. Hughes had her consulting rooms. Kelly's round-the-clock attention was costing me just over four grand a week. Most of the £300,000 I'd stolen from the drug cartels in 97, together with her trust fund, had been spent on her education, the house, and now her treatment. There was nothing left. It had all started about nine months ago. Her grade since coming to England had been poor. She was an intelligent girl, but she was like a big bucket with holes in it. Everything was going in, but then it just dripped out again. Apart from that, she'd shown no visible after-effects from the trauma. She was slightly nervous around adults, but okay with her own age group. Then, at boarding school, she'd started to complain about pains, but could never be more specific or explain exactly where they were. After several false alarms, including the school nurse wondering if she was starting her periods early, her teachers concluded that she was just attention-seeking. Then it slowly got worse. Kelly gradually withdrew from her friends, her teachers, her grandparents, and me. She wouldn't talk or play anymore. She just watched TV, sat in a sulk, or sobbed. I didn't pay that much attention at first. I was worried about the future and was too busy feeling pissed off at not having work since the previous summer while I waited for Lynn to make up his mind. My usual response to her sobbing bouts had been to go and get ice cream. I knew this wasn't the answer, but I didn't know what was. It got to the point where I even started to get pissed off with her for not appreciating my efforts. What an arsehole I felt now. About five months ago, she'd been with me in Norfolk for the weekend. She was distant and detached, and nothing I did seemed to engage her. I felt like a school kid jumping around a fight in the playground, not really knowing what to do. Join in, stop it, or just run away. I tried playing at camping with her, putting up the tent in her bedroom. That night, she woke with terrible nightmares. Her screaming lasted all night. I tried to calm her, but she just lashed out at me as if she was having a fit. The next morning, I made a few phone calls and found out there was a six-month waiting list for an NHS appointment, and even then I'd be lucky if it helped. I made more calls and later the same day took her to see Dr. Hughes, a London psychiatrist who specialised in child trauma and who accepted private patients. Kelly was admitted to the clinic at once for a temporary assessment, and I'd had to leave her there to go on my first St. Petersburg recce and to recruit Sergei. I wanted to believe that everything would be fine soon, but knew deep down that it wouldn't, not for a long time. My worst fears were confirmed when the doctor told me that besides regular treatment at the clinic as an outpatient, she'd need the sort of constant care that only the unit in Hampstead could provide. I've been to visit her there a total of four times now. We usually just sat together and watched TV for the afternoon. I wanted to cuddle her, but didn't know how. All my attempts at displaying affection seemed awkward and forced, and in the end I left feeling more fucked up than she was. I swung right into Hyde Park. The squaddies of the Blues and Royals were out exercising their horses before perching on them for hours outside some building or other for the tourists. I rode past the memorial stone to the ones who were blown up by PIRA in 1982 while doing the same thing. I had some understanding of Kelly's condition, but only some. I'd known men who'd suffered with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but they were big boys who'd been to war. I wanted to know more about its effects on children. Hughes told me it was natural for a child to go through a grieving process after a loss, but sometimes, after a sudden traumatic event, the feelings can surface weeks, months, or even years later. This delayed reaction is PTSD, and the symptoms are similar to those associated with depression and anxiety. Emotional numbness, feelings of helplessness, hopelessness and despair, and reliving the traumatic experience in nightmares. It rang so true, I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen Kelly smile, let alone heard her laugh. The symptoms vary in intensity from case to case, Hughes had explained, but can last for years if untreated. They certainly won't just go away on their own. 
I'd felt almost physically sick when I realised that if only I'd acted sooner, Kelly might have been on the mend by now. It must be how real fathers feel, and it was probably the first time in my life that I'd experienced such emotions. The road through the park ended and I was forced back onto the main drag. Traffic was virtually at a standstill. Delivery vans were stopping exactly where they wanted and hitting their four-way flashers. Motorbike couriers screamed through impossible gaps, taking bigger chances than I was prepared to. I slowly worked my way in and out of it all, heading down towards Chelsea. Things were just as bad on the pavement. Shoppers loaded with carrier bags collided with each other and caused log jams at store entrances. And as if things weren't bad enough, I didn't have a clue what I was going to get Kelly for Christmas. I passed a phone shop and thought of getting her a mobile, but fuck it, I wasn't even any good at talking to her face to face. At a clothes shop I thought of getting her a couple of new outfits, but maybe she'd think I didn't think she was capable of choosing her own. In the end, I gave up. Whatever she said she wanted, she could have. That was if the clinic left me any money to pay for it with. I eventually got to where I wanted to be and parked up. The Moorings was a large townhouse in a leafy square with clean bricks, recent repointing, and lots of gleaming fresh paint. Everything about it said it specialised in the disorders of the rich. The receptionist pointed me to the waiting room, a place I was very familiar with by now, and I settled down with a magazine about the sort of wonderful country houses that mine would never be. I was reading about the pros and cons of conventional compared with underfloor heating and thinking that it must be rather nice to have any sort at all when the receptionist appeared and ushered me into the consulting room. Dr. Hughes looked as striking as ever. She was in her mid to late fifties and looked like she and her consulting rooms could have featured in OK magazine. She had the kind of big grey hair that made her look more like an American newsreader than a shrink. My overriding impression was that she appeared incredibly pleased with herself most of the time, especially when explaining to me over the top of her gold-rimmed half-moon glasses that no, sorry, Mr. Stone, it was impossible to be more definite about timetables. I declined the coffee she offered. There was always too much time lost fannying about while waiting for it, and in this place, time was money. Sitting down on the chair facing her desk, I placed the day sack at my feet. She hasn't got worse, has she? The doctor shook her unusually large head, but didn't answer immediately. If it's about the money, I... She lifted her hand and gave me a patient, patronising look. Not my department, Mr. Stone. I'm sure the people downstairs have everything under control. They certainly did. And my problem was that supermodels and Premier League footballers might be able to afford four grand a week, but soon I wouldn't be able to. The doctor looked at me over the top of her glasses. I wanted to see you, Mr. Stone, because I need to discuss Kelly's prognosis. She is still really quite subdued, and we aren't achieving any sort of progress towards her cure. You will remember I spoke to you a while ago about a spectrum of behaviour, with complete inertia at one extreme and manic activity at the other. You said that both ends of the spectrum were equally bad, uh, because either way the person is unreachable. The good ground is anywhere in the middle. The doctor gave a brief smile, pleased and perhaps surprised that I had been paying attention all those weeks ago. It was our aim, you will also remember, to achieve at least some movement away from the inertial state. Our best hope was to get her into the central area of the spectrum, not too low or too high, able to interact and make relationships, adapt and change. She picked up a pen and scribbled a note to herself on a yellow post-it pad. I'm afraid to say, however, that Kelly is still very passive and preoccupied. Stuck, if you like, or cocooned, either unable or unwilling to relate. She peered over her glasses again as if to underline the seriousness of what she was saying. Young children are deeply affected by witnessing violence, Mr. Stone, particularly when the victims of that violence are family members. Kelly's grandmother has been describing to me her previous cheerfulness and energy. She used to be such fun to be with, I said. She never laughs at my jokes now. I paused. Maybe they're just not very good. The doctor looked a little disappointed at my remark. I'm afraid 
Her current behavior is such a contrast to how she was previously that it indicates to me that the road to recovery is going to be even longer than I at first thought, which meant even more expensive. I was ashamed at even having the thought, but there was no getting away from it. What sort of time scale are we looking at? She pursed her lips and shook her head slowly. It's still impossible to answer that question, Mr. Stone. What we're trying to repair here is not something as simple as a fractured limb. I appreciate that you would like me to give you some sort of schedule, but I can't. The course of the disorder is quite variable. With adequate treatment, about a third of people with PTSD will recover within a few months. Some of these have no further problems. Many take longer, sometimes a year or more. Others, despite treatment, continue to have mild to moderate symptoms for a more prolonged period of time. I'm afraid that you really must prepare yourself for a long haul. Is there nothing I can do to help? For the second time, Dr. Hughes smiled briefly. It was fleetingly triumphant rather than warm, and I got the feeling I'd fallen into some kind of trap. Well, she said, I did ask you here today for a specific reason. Kelly is here in one of the rooms. I started getting up. Can I see her? She too stood up. Yes, of course, that is the object. But I have to say, Mr. Stone, that I'd rather she didn't see you. I'm sorry, I... The doctor cut in. There's something I'd like you to see first. She opened a drawer in her desk, pulled out several sheets of paper, and pushed them across the desk. I wasn't prepared for the shock they gave me. The pictures Kelly had drawn of her dead family looked very different from the happy, smiling photograph I had in my day sack. The one of her mother showed her kneeling by the bed, her top half spread-eagled on the mattress, the bed cover coloured in red. In another, her five-year-old sister, Aida, was lying on the floor between the bath and the toilet, her head nearly severed from her shoulders. The nice blue dress she'd been wearing that day was spattered chaotically with red crayon. Kev, her father, and my best friend, was lying on his side on the floor of the lounge, his head pulped by the baseball bat that lay next to him. I looked at the doctor. The, the positions I found them in that day, exactly. I hadn't realised. I'd found her in her hidey hole the place where Kev wanted the kids to run to if there was ever a drama. She'd never said a word to me about it, and I'd never thought that she might have witnessed the carnage. It was as though the events were recorded in her memory with the clarity of a camera. Hughes looked over her glasses. Kelly has even remembered the colour of the duvet on her bed that day and what was playing on the radio as she helped lay the table in the kitchen. She has talked to me about how the sun was shining through the window and reflecting on the cutlery. She recalls that Ada had lost her hairband just before the men came. She's now just replaying the events immediately preceding the killings in an effort, I suggest, to achieve another outcome. I was relieved that her flashbacks didn't go any further. But if the treatment worked, she would surely begin to recount what had occurred afterwards. When it did, I would have to involve the firm to sort out any security implications that might arise. But for now, they didn't need to know that she was ill. The psychiatrist interrupted my thoughts. Come with me, if you will, Mr. Stone. I'd like you to see her and explain a little more about what I hope we can achieve. She led me a short way down the corridor. I couldn't make sense of any of this. Why wasn't Kelly allowed to see me? We turned left and walked on a while, stopping outside a door that had a curtain across a small pane of glass. She poked it very slightly aside with a finger and looked through, then moved back and motioned for me to do the same. I looked through the glass and wished I hadn't. The images of Kelly I kept in my memory were carefully selected shots from before she got sick, of a little girl quivering with excitement at her birthday party on the replica of the Golden Hind, or shrieking with delight when I finally kept my promise to take her to the Tower of London and she got to see the crown jewels. The real-life Kelly, however, was sitting on a chair next to a nurse. The nurse seemed to be chatting away, all smiles. Kelly, however, wasn't replying, wasn't moving. 
hands folded politely in her lap. She was staring at the window opposite her, her head cocked to one side as if she was trying to work something out. There was something deeply scary about how still she was. The nurse wasn't moving much either, but Kelly's was an unnatural kind of stillness. It was like looking at a frozen image, an oil painting of a young girl in an armchair, next to a film of a nurse who happened to be sitting still, but who would move again in a second or two. I'd seen it before. It was four years ago, but it could have been four minutes. I was on my hands and knees in her family's garage, talking gently as I moved boxes and squeezed through the gap, inching towards the back wall, trying to push the images of the carnage next door behind me. Then there she was, facing me, eyes wide with terror, sitting curled up in a fetal position, rocking her body backwards and forwards, holding her hands over her ears. Hello, Kelly, I'd said very softly. She must have recognised me. She'd known me for years, but she hadn't replied. She just carried on rocking, staring at me with wide, scared, dark eyes. I crawled right into the cave until I was curled up beside her. Her eyes were red and swollen. She'd been crying and strands of light brown hair were stuck to her face. I tried to move it away from her mouth. I got hold of her rigid hand and guided her gently out into the garage. Then I picked her up in my arms and held her tight as I carried her into the kitchen. She was trembling so much I couldn't tell if her head was nodding or shaking. A few minutes later, when we drove away from the house, she was almost rigid with shock. And that was it. That was the stillness I saw now. The doctor's mouth came up close to my ear. Kelly has been forced to learn early lessons about loss and death, Mr. Stone. How does a seven-year-old, as she was then, understand murder? A child who witnesses violence has been shown that the world is a dangerous and unpredictable place. She has told me that she doesn't think she'll ever feel safe outside again. It's nobody's fault, but her experience has made her think the adults in her life are unable to protect her. She believes she must take on the responsibility herself, a prospect that causes her great anxiety. I looked at the frozen girl once more. Is there nothing I can do? The doctor nodded slowly as she replaced the curtain and turned to head back up the corridor. As we walked, she said, In time, we need to help her gently examine and review the traumatic events that happened to her and learn to conquer her feelings of anxiety. Her treatment will eventually involve what are best described as talking therapies, by herself or in groups, but she's not really ready for that yet. I will need to keep her on antidepressant medication and mild tranquilizers for a while yet to help lessen some of the more painful symptoms. The aim eventually will be to help Kelly remember the traumatic events safely and to address her family life, peer relationships and school performance. Generally, we need to help her deal with all the emotions she's having trouble making sense of at the moment. Grief, guilt, anger, depression, anxiety. You notice, Mr. Stone, I'm saying we. We had reached her room and went back inside. I sat down again, and she went to the other side of her desk. Parents are usually the most important emotional protectors for their children, Mr. Stone. They can do a much better job of psychologically reassuring their children than professionals can. They can help them talk about their fears, reassure them that Mummy and Daddy will do whatever is possible to protect them, and stay close. Sadly, that's not a possibility for Kelly, of course, but she still needs a responsible adult whom she can depend upon. I was beginning to understand. Her grandmother, you mean? I could have sworn I saw her shudder. Not quite what I had in mind. You see, a major factor in any child's recovery from PTSD is that the prime caregiver must communicate a willingness to talk about the violence and be a non-judgmental listener. Children need to know that it's permissible to talk about violence. Kelly needs permission, if you like, to talk about what happened to her. 
Sometimes caregivers may subtly discourage children from talking about violence in their lives for whatever reason, and this, I sense, is the case with Kelly's grandparents. I think her grandmother feels hurt and discouraged that Kelly has lost interest in family activities and is easily angered and so detached. She finds it very upsetting to hear the details, maybe because she believes it will be less upsetting for Kelly if she doesn't talk about it. On the contrary, children often feel relieved and unburdened by sharing information with trusted adults. It also may be useful therapeutically for children to review events and air their fears by retelling the story. I don't mean that we should coerce Kelly into talking about what happened, but reassurance and validation, once she has volunteered it, will be immensely helpful to her recovery. She was beginning to lose me in all her psychobabble. I couldn't see what I had to do with all this. As if she'd read my mind... Dr. Hughes pursed her lips again and did her trick with the half-moon glasses. What it all boils down to, Mr. Stone, is that Kelly is going to need a trusted adult alongside her during the recovery process. And in my view, the ideal person to do that is you. She paused to let the implications of what she was saying sink in. You see, she trusts you. She speaks of you with the utmost affection seeing you as the nearest thing she has now to a father. What she needs, far more than just the attention and therapy we professionals can provide, is your acceptance of and commitment to that fact. She added pointedly, Would you have difficulties with that, Mr. Stone? My employers might. I need... She held up her hand. You have seen the cocoon in which Kelly has placed herself. There is no formula that guarantees breaking through when someone is out of reach. But whatever the cause is, a form of loving has to be there in the solution. What Kelly needs is a prince on a white charger to come and free her from the dragon. It is my view that she's decided not to come out until you are an integral part of her life again. I'm sorry to burden you with this responsibility, Mr. Stone, but Kelly is my patient, and it's her best interest that I must have at heart. For that reason, I didn't want her to see you today. I don't want her to build up hopes only to have them dashed. Please go away and think about it, but believe me, the sooner you are able to commit, the sooner Kelly's condition will start to improve. Until then, any sort of a cure is on hold. I reached into my day sack and pulled out the framed photographs. It was the only thing I could think of. I brought these for her. They're pictures of her family. Maybe there'll be some help. The doctor took them from me, still waiting for an answer. When she saw she wasn't going to get one, not today anyway, she nodded quietly to herself and ushered me gently, but firmly, towards the door. I'll be seeing her this afternoon. I'll telephone you later. I have the number. And now, I believe, you have an appointment with the people downstairs. Chapter 9 I was feeling pretty depressed as I headed east along the northern side of the Thames towards the city centre. Not just for Kelly, but for me. I forced myself to admit it. I hated the responsibility. And yet, I had those promises to Kevin to live up to. I had enough problems looking after myself without doctors telling me what I should be doing for other people. Being in charge of others in the field was fine. Having a man down in a contact was straightforward compared to this. You just got in there, dragged him out of the shit and plugged up his holes. Sometimes he lived, sometimes not. It was something I didn't have to think about. The man down always knew that someone would be coming for him. It helped him stay alive. But this was different. Kelly was my man down, but it wasn't just a question of plugging up holes. She didn't know whether help was on the way or not. Nor did I. I knew there was one thing I could do. Make money to pay for her treatment. I'd be there for her, but later. Right now, I needed to keep busy and produce money. It had always been later for Kelly, whether it was a phone call or a birthday treat. But that was going to change. It had to. Working my way through the traffic, I eventually got onto the approach road to Vauxhall Bridge, 
As I crossed to the southern side, I looked up at Vauxhall Cross, home of SIS, Secret Intelligence Service. A beige and black pyramid with a top cut off, flanked by large towers on either side. It needed just a few swirls of neon to look totally at home in Las Vegas. Directly opposite Vauxhall Cross, over the road and about a hundred metres away, was an elevated section of railway that led off to Waterloo Station. Most of the arches beneath had been converted into shops or warehouses. Passing the SIS building, I negotiated the five-way road junction and bumped the pavement, parking up by two arches which had been knocked through to make a massive motorbike shop, the one I'd bought my Ducati from. I wasn't going in today. It was just an easy place to park. Checking my saddle was secure so that no one could nick my USP, I put my helmet in the day sack crossed a couple of feeder roads and took the metal footbridge over the junction, eventually entering the building via a single metal door that funneled me towards reception. The interior of the firm looked much the same as any high-tech office block, clean, sleek and with an efficient corporate feel about it, with people swiping their identity cards through electronic readers to get access. I headed for the main reception desk, where two women sat behind thick bulletproof glass. I'm here to see Mr. Lynn. You fill this in, please? The older one passed the ledger through a slot under the glass. As I signed my name in two boxes, she picked up a telephone. Who shall I say is here? My name is Nick. I hadn't even had any cover documentation from them since my fuck-up in Washington, just my own cover, which I hoped they'd never know about. I'd organised it in case it was time to disappear, a feeling I had at least once a month. The ledger held tear-off labels. One half was torn away and put in a plastic sleeve, which I would have to pin on. Mine was blue and said, escorted everywhere. The woman came off the phone and pointed to a row of soft chairs. Someone will be with you soon. I sat and waited with my nice new badge on, watching suited men and women come and go, Dress Down Friday hadn't reached this far up river yet. It wasn't often that people like me got to come here. My last visit had been in 97. I'd hated it that time, too. They'd managed to make you feel that, as a K, you weren't very welcome, turning up and spoiling the smart PLC image of the place. End of Side 5 Side 6 After about ten minutes of feeling as if I was waiting outside the headmaster's study, an old Asian guy in a natty blue pinstripe suit pushed his way through the barrier. Nick? I nodded and got to my feet. He half smiled. If you'd like to follow me. A swipe of the card that hung round his neck got him back through the barrier. I had to pass the metal detector before we met on the other side and walked to the lifts. We're going to the fifth floor. I nodded and let the silence hang as we rode the lift, not wanting to let him know that I knew. It saved on small talk. Once on the fifth, I followed him. There was little noise coming from any of the offices along the corridor, just the hum of air conditioning and the creak of my leathers. At the far end, we turned left, passing Lynn's old office. Someone called Turnbull had it now. Two doors down, I saw Lynn's name on the door plate. My escort knocked and was met by the characteristically crisp and immediate call of, Come! He ushered me past and I heard the door close gently behind me. Lynn's bald crown faced me as he wrote at his desk. He might have a new office, but it was quite clear he was a creature of habit. The interior was exactly the same as his last, exactly the same furniture and plain, functional, impersonal ambience. The only thing that showed he wasn't a mannequin planted here for decoration was the framed photograph of a group, which I presume were his much younger wife and two children, sitting on a stretch of grass with the family Labrador. Two rolls of Christmas wrapping paper leaning against the wall behind him showed that he did have a life. Mounted on a wall bracket above me to the right was a TV, the screen scrolling through CFAX World News headlines. The only thing I couldn't see was the obligatory officer's squash racket and winter coat on a stand. They were probably behind me. I stood and waited for him to finish. 
Normally, I would just have sat down and made myself at home, but today was different. There was what people like him tend to call an atmosphere, and I didn't want to annoy him any more than I needed to. We'd parted on less than good terms the last time we'd met. His fountain pen sounded unnaturally loud on the paper. My eyes moved to the window behind him, and I gazed over the Thames at the new apartment building being finished off on the north side of the bridge. Take a seat. I'll be with you very soon. I did, on the same wooden chair I'd sat on three years ago, my leathers drowning the scratch of his writing as I bent down and placed my day sack on the floor. It was becoming increasingly obvious that this was going to be a short meeting, an interview without coffee, otherwise the Asian guy would have asked me if I took milk or cream before I'd gone in. I hadn't seen Lynn since the debrief after Washington in 98. Like his furniture, he hadn't changed nor had his clothes. The same mustard-coloured corduroy trousers, sports jacket with well-worn leather elbows and viella shirt. With his shiny dome still facing me, I could see that he hadn't lost any more hair, which I was sure Mrs. Lynn was very happy about. He really didn't have the ears to be a complete baldy locks. He finished writing and put aside what I could now see was a typed page of A4 that looked as if a teacher had marked it. Looking up with a half-amused smile at my outfit, he brought his hands together, thumbs touching as he rested them on top of the desk. Since Washington, he'd treated me as if he was a bank manager and I was asking for a bigger overdraft, trying hard to be nice but at the same time looking down on me with disdain. That I didn't mind, as long as he didn't expect me to look up to him with reverence. "'What can I do for you, Nick?' He was taking the piss out of my accent, but in a sarcastic, not jovial way. He really didn't like me. My Washington fuck-up had put the seal on that. I bit my lip. I had to be nice to him. He was the ticket to the money Kelly needed, and even though I had the sinking feeling that my be-nice expedition wasn't going to work, I had to give it my best shot. I really would like to know if I am ever going to get PC, I said. He settled back into his leather swivel chair and produced the other half of his smile. You know, you are very lucky still to be at liberty, Nick. You already have a lot to be thankful for, and do bear in mind your freedom is still not guaranteed. He was right, of course. I owed the firm for the fact that I wasn't in some U.S. state penitentiary with a cellmate called Big Bubba, who wanted to be my special friend even if it was more to do with saving themselves even more embarrassment than protecting me. I do understand that, and I'm really grateful for all that you've done for me, Mr. Lynn, but I really need to know. Leaning forward, he studied the expression on my face. It must have been the Mr. Lynn bit that made him suspicious. He could smell my desperation. After your total lack of judgment, do you really think you'd ever be considered for permanent carder? His face flushed. He was angry. Think yourself lucky you're still on a retainer. Do you really think that you would be considered for work after you... His right index finger started to endorse the facts as he poked it at me, his voice getting louder. One, disobey my direct order to kill that damned woman. Two, actually believe her preposterous story and assist her assassination attempt in the White House. God, man, your judgment was no better than a love-struck schoolboy's. Do you really think a woman like that would be interested in you? He couldn't contain himself. It was as if I'd touched a raw nerve. And to put the tin lid on it, you used a member of the American Secret Service to get you in there, who then gets shot. Do you realise the havoc you've caused, not only in the US, but here? Careers have been ruined because of you. The answer is no. Not now. Not ever. Then I realised... This wasn't just about me, and it wasn't early retirement at the end of his tour next year to spend more time with his mushrooms. He had been given the sack. He'd been running the K's at the time of the Sarah debacle, and someone had had to pay. People like Lynn could be replaced. People like me were more difficult to blow out, if only for financial reasons. The government had invested several million in my training as a special air service soldier. They wanted to get their money's worth out of me. It must have killed him to know that I was the one who'd fucked up, but he was the one to carry the can. 
probably as part of the deal to appease the Americans. He sat back into his chair, realizing he had lost his usual control. If not PC, when will I work? He had gained a little more composure. Nothing is going to happen until the new department head takes over. He will decide what to do with you. It was time for me to lose all pride. Look, Mr. Lynn, I really need the money. Any shit job will do. Send me anywhere. Anything you've got. That child you look after. Is she still in care? Shit. I hated it when they knew these things. It was pointless lying. He probably even knew down to the last penny how much money I needed. I nodded. It's the clinic costs. She'll be there for a long time. I looked at his family portrait, then back at him. He had kids. He'd understand. He didn't even pause. No. Now go. Remember, you are still being paid, and you will conduct yourself accordingly. He pressed his buzzer, and the Asian guy came to collect me so fast he must have been listening through the keyhole. At least I got to see the squash racket on my way out. It was leaning against the wall by the door. Taking a breath... I nearly turned back to tell him to ram his patronising, hate-filled words up his ass. I had nothing to lose. What could he do to me now? Then I thought better of letting my mouth react to what I was thinking. This would be the last time I ever saw him, and I was sure it was the last time he ever wanted to see me. Once he'd gone, it would be a new department head, and maybe a new chance. Why burn my bridges? I'd get my own back later. I'd jump all over his mushrooms. Chapter 10 I was still feeling philosophical about the meeting at 3A. If Val had been feeding me a crock of shit, well, there you go. At least I was on my turf rather than his. That was the way I wanted it to stay, so I'd tuck my USP into my leathers before I left the bike shop, just in case. All the same, I knew I'd be really pissed off if no one was at the flat with a little something for me, as long as it was wrapped in a big envelope and not a full metal jacket. I'd soon be finding out. The traffic in Kensington was at a standstill. At one set of lights, the bike got wedged between a black cab and a woman in a murk with very dyed, long blonde hair, held off her face by Chanel sunglasses, even though it was the middle of winter. She tried to look casual as she chatted on her mobile. The cabbie looked over at me and couldn't help himself from laughing. Palace Gardens stretches the whole length of Hyde Park's west side, from Kensington in the south to Notting Hill Gate in the north. I rode up to the iron gates and the wooden gatehouse positioned between them. Sitting inside was a bald man in his fifties, wearing a white shirt, black tie and blue nylon jacket. Beyond him lay a wide, tree-lined road and pavements of clean beige gravel. The large mansion houses were mostly embassies and their residences. Flags fluttered and brass plates gleamed. The sale price of even one of the staff apartments would probably clear my debts at the clinic, pay Kelly's education right through to doctorate level, and still leave enough to put a new roof over most of Norfolk. The gate man looked me up and down as if I was something one of the posh embassy dogs had left coiled on the curb. He didn't get up, just stuck his head out of the window. Yes? Number 3A, mate, pick up. I pointed to the now empty day sack on my back. I really hadn't planned to be a courier today, but it seemed the easiest thing to do. At least I looked the part, with the leathers and my South London accent turned up a notch or two. He pointed up the road. Hundred yards up there on the left. Don't park in front of the building. Put your machine over there. He indicated to the opposite side of the road. I let in the clutch and waited for the steel bollards blocking my way to disappear into the road. The Israeli embassy loomed up on my left. A dark-skinned guard in plain clothes stood outside on the pavement. He must have been feeling quite cold, as his coat and suit jacket were unbuttoned. If anyone attacked the place, he had to be able to reach his weapon and gun them down before the uniformed British policeman on the opposite side of the road got a chance to step in and make a simple arrest instead. About seventy metres past them both, I parked in a line of cars opposite the apartment building. Walking across the road towards its grand gates, I started removing my gloves and unbuckling my helmet. Then I hit the bell and explained to a voice where I wanted to go. 
The side gate opened with a whir and a click, and I walked through and down the drive. The building was bigger than most of those around it and set back from the road. It was made of red brick and concrete and was decades younger than its neighbours, with manicured gardens on each side of the drive that led downhill to a turning circle with an ornate fountain at its centre. Pulling off the ski mask that kept the cold off my face, I walked through the main doors into a glittering dark marble and glass reception area. The concierge, another king sitting on his throne, seemed to view me the same way as his mate down the road. Delivery, is it? Nobody calls you sir when you're in bike leathers. It was time to play courier boy again. No, pick up. P.P. Smith, mate. He picked up the internal telephone and dialed, his voice changing into Mr. Nice Guy the moment he got a reply. Hello, uh, reception here. You have a courier for a collection. Do you want me to send him up? Certainly. Goodbye. The phone went down. He turned surly again as he pointed to the lift. Third floor, fourth door on the left. As the lift doors closed behind me, I had a quick check round for closed-circuit cameras, then pulled out my USP. Checking chamber, I hit the button for the third floor. I never knew why I checked chamber so much. Maybe it just made me feel more in control. As the lift kicked in with a slight jerk and took me upwards, I folded the ski mask over the USP and placed it and my right hand in the helmet. If there was a drama, I could just drop the helmet and react. The lift slowed. Placing my thumb on the safety catch, I was ready. The door slid open with an upmarket ding, but I stood my ground for a few seconds, listening, helmet still in my left hand so I could draw with my right the temperature changed as I stepped into the corridor and the doors closed behind me. It was hot, but the decor was cold, white walls, cream carpet, and very brightly lit. I followed the carpet, looking for the fourth door on the left. It was so quiet that all I could hear as I moved was the creaking of my leathers. The door didn't have a bell, knocker, or even a number. Using my knuckles against the heavy wood, I stood off to the side, my right hand back on the pistol grip, thumb easing off the safety catch. I hated this bit. It wasn't as if I was expecting trouble. It was highly unlikely to happen here, given all the security I'd had to pass. But still, I hated knocking on doors and not knowing who or what was on the other side. Footsteps echoed on a hard floor, and locks were undone. The door started to open only to be stopped by a security chain. A face, or rather half a face, moved into the three- or four-inch gap. It was enough for me to recognise its owner at once. I was pleasantly surprised. It would be much friendlier dealing with her than some squarehead. Looking almost innocent, Val Slapper from Helsinki was showing me just one very light blue eye and some dark blonde hair. It probably got lighter in the summer, when the sun got to work on it. The only other thing I could see through the gap was her dark blue woolen polo neck. She looked at me without any expression, waiting for me to speak. My name is Nick. You have something for me. Yes, I've been expecting you. She didn't bat an eyelid. Have you a cell phone or pager with you? I nodded. Yeah, I've got a phone. Fuck what Valentin had said. I needed one with me for when the clinic called later. Could I ask you to turn it off, please? It is. It was pointless wasting the battery while sitting on a bike. Tilting the helmet slightly so the pistol wouldn't fall out, I reached into my right-hand pocket and pulled out the phone, showing her the display. She gave a very courteous, Thank you. Then the door closed and I heard the chain being undone. The door reopened fully, but instead of standing there and ushering me in, she turned and started to walk back into the flat. Close the door behind you, would you please, Nick? As I stepped over the threshold, I smelled floor wax. I followed her down the corridor, taking in the apartment's layout. A couple of doors led off either side, and one at the far end was partly open. The floor was plain, light wood, the walls and doors gleaming white. There was no furniture or pictures, not even a coat hook. I switched my attention to Val Slapper. I'd thought it was her high heels that had made her look so tall in Finland, but I could see now that her legs did that all on their own.
She was maybe just over six feet tall in her square-toed cowboy boots, which made a slow, rhythmic clack as her heels hit the floor. She walked like a supermodel on a catwalk. Her legs were sheathed in a pair of Armani jeans, the logo on the back pocket moving up and down in time with her heels. I couldn't keep my eyes off it. Slipping the pistol into my right-hand pocket, I moved the phone into my left, all the time looking at her and thinking that Armani should be paying her for this. I was almost tempted to buy myself a pair. One door to the right was partly open, and I glanced through. The kitchen was just as sterile as the corridor. Stark white stalls at a breakfast bar, no kettle, no letters on the side. Nobody lived here. I walked into the living room where she now stood a large white space with three unmatching dining-room chairs at its centre. Muslin curtains covered the windows, making the light dull and hazy. The only other objects in the room were four very large Harvey Nichols bags, which looked as if they were about to split at the seams, and a black Waterstones bag, the telltale shapes of books pushing at its sides. I moved to the far corner of the room and leaned against the wall. Through the double glazing of the large picture windows, I could hear the faint murmur of traffic. She bent over one of the shopping bags and pulled out a buff A2-sized envelope. My name is Liv. Valentin sends his regards, she said as she brought it over to me. And, of course, his gratitude. This is for you. One hundred thousand U.S. dollars. Wonderful. That was the slate clean at the clinic and another four months' treatment in the bank. She extended a perfectly manicured hand that showed she was no longer a teenager. The skin on her face was crystal clear and had no need of makeup. I reckoned she was in her early thirties. Her hair was shoulder-length, parted over her left eye, and tucked back behind her ear. If she was wearing nail polish today, it was clear. She wore no rings, no bracelets, earrings, or necklaces. The only jewellery I could see was a discreet gold tank watch with a black leather strap. But then she needed a dawning like the Venus de Milo needed a velvet choker and a diamond tiara. I was beginning to see why Val might prefer Finland to Russia. I wasn't going to open the envelope there and then. I didn't want to look desperate and untrusting. I was both, but I didn't want her to know that. I hadn't had the time to take much notice of her before. The first time I was aware of her was the day that Val arrived in Finland, three days before the lift. Reckies are about planning, not admiring the view. But I did now. I'd never seen a woman with such a perfectly symmetrical face, a strong jaw, full lips, and eyes that felt as if they knew everything but revealed nothing. Her statuesque body looked like it had been shaped by canoeing or rock climbing rather than jumping up and down to music in a gym. The feel of the bundles in the envelope, even through the bubble wrap lining, brought me back to the real world. I put my helmet at my feet, unzipped my jacket, and slipped the envelope inside. She turned and went to sit on one of the chairs beside her purchases. I took up my position against the wall. She invited me to take one of the seats with a wave of her hand, but I declined, preferring to stand and be able to react if Liv had a few of her square-headed friends around and this encounter turned out to be not entirely friendly. I was starting to get jealous of Val. Money and power always attract beautiful women. My pedal bin full of red reminders never had quite the same effect. Liv sat there looking at me in the way that Mr. Spock did on the bridge of the USS Enterprise when he thought things were illogical. It was the same look she'd given me at the hotel, penetrating and searching, as if she was staring right into my head, but somehow managing to give nothing back. It made me uncomfortable, and I stooped to pick up my helmet before leaving. She sat back and crossed her long legs. Nick, I have a proposition for you from Valentin. I left the helmet where it was, but said nothing. I'd learned the hard way that it's worth remembering we have two ears and just one mouth. Her gaze remained cool. Are you interested? I certainly was. In principle, I didn't want to spend all day beating her out the bush, and she didn't look or sound like the sort of person who'd do that anyway, so let's just get on with it. What does he want from me? 
It's a simple task, but one that needs to be handled delicately. He needs someone, and he wants it to be you, to assist another person to enter a house in Finland. The other person is a cryptographer, a highly skilled hacker, if you like. Inside the house are computers, which this other person will use his skills to access and then download the contents onto a laptop for removal. The contents, before you ask, are merely some competitive intelligence which Valentin is keen to have in his possession. She uncrossed her legs and pulled open one of her bags. You mean industrial espionage? That's not entirely correct, Nick. More commercial than industrial. Valentin is asking you to assist in the procurement of this data, but without the house owners knowing that you have done so. We want them to think they are the only ones with this information. It's as straightforward as that. There are are some minor complications which we will discuss if you are interested. I was, but minor complications don't exist. They always turn out to be major. How much? I had to wait for an answer while she fished a cream-coloured cashmere cardigan out of the Harvey Nichols bag with a rustle of tissue paper. Sitting back in the chair, she laid it across her thighs, tucked her hair behind her ear again, and looked directly at me. Valentin is offering you $1.7 million, if you are successful, of course. She put up a hand. Non-negotiable. That is his offer, more than a million pounds. He wanted you to have a round figure in your own currency. You're a lucky man, Nick. He likes you. So far it sounded like a dream come true. That alone made me feel suspicious, but fuck it. We were just at the talking stage. Valentin is powerful enough just to take what he wants by force. Why does he need me? She expertly removed the tags from the cardigan, dropping them back into the bag. This is a job that requires finesse, not muscle. As I said, no one must know that Valentin has this material. In any event, he would prefer this was accomplished outside his normal channels. It's a delicate matter, and it was obvious in Helsinki that you have a certain skill in this area. That was all very nice, but it was question time. What exactly is it I am trying to lay my hands on? She put on the cardigan, her eyes not leaving mine, still measuring me up, I was sure of it. That, Nick, you don't need to know. We just need to be there before the Meliskia. I had to cut in. You mean steal it? before the Meliskia. She smiled. Not steal. Copy. Download it. Your task is to get our man in and out without anyone knowing it has happened. Those are the terms, if you wish me to continue. I get it, I said. Meliskia must be Russian for minor complications. She smiled again, her lips parting slightly to show perfect white teeth. The West call us the Russian Mafia, or simply ROC, as if we were one big group. We're not. We are many groups. The Meliskia are one faction, and Valentin's only real competitor. Whatever you may think about him, he is a man with vision. The Meliskia are not. They are just gangsters. It is very important that they never have access to this information. It would be a disaster for all of us, West as well as East. That is all I am prepared to say on the matter. Now, do you wish me to continue? Of course I did. It's always good to know something about who you're racing against. Not that she'd told me anything Val hadn't. I listened intently as she explained that the target house was still in the process of being prepared to use the competitive intelligence Val wanted. It wouldn't be online for another six or seven days, and only then would I be able to get their man in to copy whatever it was. The problem was that once it was online, the Meliskia were likely to trace its location very quickly. That's the race, Nick. I emphasize again, we must get it first, and no one must know that we've got it. It sounded okay to me. I'd spent years doing this kind of thing for far less than $1.7 million dollars. Maybe this was my chance to sort out my life, and Kelly's, once and for all. 
One big fuck off finger to everybody, especially Lynn. The meeting with him had really pissed me off. He knew the reason I'd been spared and he hadn't was that I was more useful to the firm as an operator on the ground, whereas Lynn was just another pen pusher. And ever since Washington, the firm knew they had me by the bollocks. And I hated it when people had me by the bollocks. I'm concerned about going back to Finland, I said. I don't think I'm very popular there. She smiled patiently. They aren't looking for you, Nick. As far as the Finnish police are concerned, it was a purely Russian event. Valentin has already made a statement to that effect to the authorities. Don't worry, it's not an issue. If it was, Valentin wouldn't have risked offering you this task. She gave me time to consider what she had said as she picked fluff off her new cardigan. They weren't your friends, I hope. She looked up. Perhaps the choice of team was not one of your best decisions? I smiled and shrugged. I had no defence. I thought not. She twisted her forefinger and thumb to release the fluff onto the floor. End of Side 6 Side 7 For the next few minutes I asked questions, and she failed to give adequate answers. The objective, she said, was simple enough, but it didn't sound low risk to me. There were far too many questions left unanswered. How many people were in the house? What defences did they have? Where the fuck was it? I wasn't even allowed to know who I was taking in. I would find out only when I signed on the dotted line. On the other hand, $1.7 million versus £290 a day wasn't the kind of discrepancy I could afford to live with. She held out a piece of folded paper. I walked the five paces and took it. These are the contact details of the man you will be taking with you, assuming you can persuade him. If you can, the fee goes up to two million dollars to cover his cut. Now, one other minor complication. Neither Valentin nor I can risk being associated with this task, so you will be the contact point. It's up to you to convince him to do it. I turned back to my helmet, reading an address and phone number in Notting Hill. Liv said, His name is Tom Mancini. I believe you know him. I turned to face her. The name did ring a bell, but that didn't concern me. What did was that she knew about me, that she knew things about my past. My concern must have been plain to see. She smiled again and shook her head very slightly. Naturally, Valentin has gone to the trouble of learning a lot about you these last few days. Do you think he would employ someone for such a task otherwise? What does he know? Enough, I'm sure. Also, enough about Tom. Valentin is sure you are both the right people for this. Now, Nick, as you will appreciate, there is little time. You need to be in Helsinki by Sunday. All I will require are your travel details. Everything else will be looked after. She gave me the contact details. They were very basic, if not a bit over the top, but easy to understand, which was good, because my head was spinning around with 1.7 million other things at the time. She stood up. Our meeting was obviously over. Thank you for coming, Nick. I shook her hand, which felt warm and firm. I looked her in the eye, probably for a fraction of a second too long, then bent to pick up my helmet. She followed me to the front door. As I reached for the handle, she said, One last thing, Nick. I turned to face her. She was so close I could smell her perfume. Please do not turn your cell phone on until you are far away from here. Goodbye, Nick. I nodded, and the door closed. I heard the locks and chain being put back into position. Going down in the lift, I resisted the urge to dance a jig, or jump up and click my heels. I had never been one to embrace good fortune blindly. I'd never had that much of it to embrace, really. But Valentin's proposition sounded rather good, and what few doubts I had were dispelled by the A2 envelope inside my jacket as long as it didn't go bang on the way home. The lift slowed and the doors opened on the ground floor. 
The concierge was frowning at me as he tried to work out why I'd been up there so long. I pulled the ski mask from under my helmet and nodded to him. She was wonderful, I said. By the time the sliding doors opened and I was facing the security cameras, the mask was over my head again. Chapter 11 Walking up the driveway, I started to pull out the chin strap on both sides of the helmet with my thumbs and forefingers. I'd just got past the gate and onto the pavement when I heard the noise of an approaching car. As I played with the straps, I looked up and to the left to check it was OK to cross. A Peugeot 206 was screaming towards me at the speed of sound. It was dark maroon and dirty from the last couple of weeks of slush and road salt. Behind the wheel was a white-knuckled woman in her early thirties with a chin-length bob. I waited for her to pass, but as soon as she was about ten metres away, she slowed to a more controlled pace. I checked to my right. The Israeli security guy about seventy metres away wasn't fussed about it, nor the uniformed officer who was looking very bored and cold on the opposite side of the road. I watched her get down to the barrier, indicating left, then join the stream of traffic. I pinged the number plate. It was an R reg, but there was something else that was much more interesting. No sticker on the back window, telling me how wonderful the dealership was. I suddenly felt I knew what she was about. Just as quickly, I threw the idea aside. Shit, I was getting as paranoid about surveillance as Val and Liv were about mobile phones. Pulling my helmet on, I put the key into the Ducati's ignition and was just starting to put my gloves on when I pinged another vehicle about 40 or 50 metres further up the road. A midnight blue Golf GTI in a line of vehicles, two up, both sitting back in their seats with no conversation or movement. The side windows were steamed up, but the windscreen had a direct view of the gates to the flats. I took a mental note of their reg. Not that it mattered. Well, that was what I tried to tell myself anyway. P116-something, that was all I needed to know. I decided that if I didn't stop being paranoid, I'd end up in the clinic with Kelly and began to give myself a mental slapping. Then I remembered. Paranoia keeps people like me alive. I had one more look around, my helmet down as if I was checking over the machine. I couldn't see anything else that made me feel uneasy, so I straddled the bike and pushed it off its stand. Turning the engine over, I pushed down the gear selector with my left foot, got into first, revved it up a little, turned left and made my way down towards the main gates. If the golf was a trigger, the team that was about to follow me would have just received a point-by-point, stage-by-stage description of exactly what I was doing over the net. They needed a visual picture of what I looked like, what the bike looked like, its registration and what I was doing. That's helmet on, that's gloves on, not aware, now complete, on the bike. Keys turned, engine on, standby, standby, mobile towards Kensington exit, approaching, no intention, no indicators on to show which way the vehicle is going. Everybody had to know exactly what I was doing and where I was to the nearest ten metres so they could put good covert surveillance on me. It's not like Miami Vice, where the good guys are sitting there with hand mics at their mouths and a big antenna stuck on the roof. All the antennas on E4 vehicles are internal, and you never see any mics. All you've got to do is hit a press cell, a little switch placed wherever you want. My preference had always been to have it fixed internally, in the gear shift. That way you can just talk, making it look as if you're having fun or having a row. Doesn't really matter as long as you're giving the details. Which, if I was getting triggered away from here, these two would now be doing. What made me still feel edgy was that the two cars were ideal for city surveillance. Both were very common models in dark, nondescript colours, and they were compact, so they could zip in and out of traffic and were easy to park up or even abandon if the target went foxtrot on foot. Not all cars have the retailer's sticker in the back window. It's just that surveillance cars would tend not to have them because they could become a VDM, Visual Distinguishing Mark. If they were a surveillance team, they would have to be E4, the government surveillance group that keeps tabs on everybody from terrorists to dodgy politicians in the UK. No one else would be able to stake out anything along this road. There was more security here than at Wormwood Scrubs. But why me? Didn't make sense. All I'd done was to go into an apartment block. 
I got to the barrier, and the guard looked out of his shed and into the cold, trying to work out if I was that bloke who said he was the courier half an hour ago. I turned right and merged with the traffic, which was still a nightmare. I headed the opposite way from the Peugeot and tried to be as casual as possible. I wasn't going to scoot away like a scalded cat and show that I was aware, but check to see if I was a target. It was starting to get dark now as I checked my mirror, expecting a surveillance bike to be up my arse in no time at all. Either the Peugeot driver was a loony and couldn't drive the thing, or she was a new or very useless member of E4. Val would have fitted very nicely into their portfolio, as would quite a few of the residents in this area. I could just be a new face that needed a picture for the surveillance log and general build-up of intelligence on the building. If I was right, she was trying to make a photo or video run on me and had fucked up the timing. It's very hard to make these runs, as you only have one chance and the pressure is always on, but this one was especially incompetent. The car could be rigged with both video and stills cameras, hidden behind the radiator grill or part of the headlight setup, or little bits of the bodywork cut out in the rear so there was just enough light for the lens. The cameras are activated electronically by the driver as they pass the target. The camera takes the whole reel of film at a very fast shutter speed. That's why the timing's so important. Hit the button too soon and the film could be finished by the time you're on top of the target, or the target might have walked behind a parked car as you begin your run, producing nothing more for your efforts than a nice picture of a Ford Fiesta and a hard time from your bosses at the debriefing. The video camera is a much safer option, but all it takes on the move is a few bumpy seconds of the target walking. This time around, all they would have was a visual of a biker with a ski mask on. That made me feel a lot better. I had no idea where those pictures would turn up, but I knew Lynn wouldn't be in the best of moods if they found their way to him. I looked down at my mirror. Right on cue, I saw the reflection of a bike's headlight. It wasn't necessarily a surveillance operator, but I had ways of checking. I was riding like one of those forty-something sad bastards. The family are all grown up, the house is virtually paid for, so now they want the motorbike their mum would never let them have. It tends to be the biggest, fattest touring bike their platinum Amex card can handle, and they ride to and from work without ever getting within spitting distance of a speed limit. Except I wasn't scared to open up the throttle. I wanted to see if the single light behind me would do the same. It didn't. He shot past me at speed on an eight-year-old greasy Honda 500 with a battered old blue plastic box on the back held down by bungees. He was wearing well-used leathers and Wellington boots and turned to look at me through his visor, all beard and disgust. I knew just how he felt. There were other bikes behind me, weaving in and out of the traffic. I moved into the middle of the road and twisted the throttle to jump a couple of cars, then swung back into the stream, crawling along behind a rusting transit van. I led a few more bikes and mopeds past me, and even a push bike, and after a couple more sets of lights it was obvious I had another weekend rider behind me, about two cars back. I turned left at the next junction, and he followed me. Looking for a natural stop, I pulled in at a newsagent's. Resting the bike on its side stand, I went through the charade of undoing my helmet and gloves, as an m -Reg Yamaha VFR came past, probably waffling on the net, telling everybody where I was. Stop, 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 Charlie 1, the bike. Static, on the left, at the newsagents, Bravo 1, me, still complete, on the bike. I took the helmet off but kept the mask on once he'd gone, then got off the bike and walked into the shop. I couldn't just ride straight off again because that would show I was aware. The young woman behind the counter looked alarmed because I hadn't taken my mask off. There was a sign politely asking me to do just that. If she'd asked, I would have told her no in my tear the ass out of it cockney accent and to fuck off because I was cold. I didn't want the team to come and requisition the security videotape with yours truly on it. She wasn't going to argue. Why should she care if I was there to steal the money? It could be dangerous for her. I went back to the bike clutching a copy of the Evening Standard. If I was right, there'd probably be a bike at either end of the road by now. The net would be in chaos as cars hit their horns at the dickhead drivers who had suddenly decided to throw up meaning turn 180, in the traffic, all out of sight to me, trying to get in position for the stakeout. 
A static short-term target is always a dangerous time for a surveillance team. Everyone has to get in position so that next time the target goes mobile, they've covered every possible option. That way, the target moves to the team instead of the team crowding the target. But where was the trigger? I couldn't be bothered to look. I'd find out soon enough. I pushed the Ducati down into first gear and carried on in the same direction I'd been heading before, towards South Kensington Tube Station, about half a mile away. Parking up in the bike row on the north side, I walked into the pack station, looking as though I was unbuckling my helmet, though I didn't. Instead, I walked straight through and crossed the road, still with my helmet on. The south side of the station had a large, busy and very confusing junction, with a big triangular island housing a flower stall. Their propane gas heaters not only blasted out heat as I went by, but also a very comforting bright red light in the gathering darkness. I moved with a crowd of pedestrians to the far side of the junction, past a row of shops along the old Brompton Road. About fifty metres further along, I went into the pub on the corner, took off my helmet and mask, and settled on a bar stool just back from the window. The pub was packed with shoppers wanting to get out of the cold, and office workers having a drink with friends. I saw the golf within minutes, but without the passenger. He, or she, was probably foxtrot, scurrying around in the tube station looking for me. Then I saw the VFR and its black leather-clad rider. They would have found the Ducati now, and the whole team, maybe four cars and two bikes, would be bomb-bursting about, fighting the traffic, calling in the areas they'd covered so their control could try and direct them elsewhere in some kind of coherent pattern. I almost felt sorry for them. They'd lost their target and they were in the shit. I'd been there a thousand times. Chapter 12 I sat and watched as the golf, with a dark-haired male at the wheel, came back round the one-way circuit and pulled in to pick up a short, brown-haired woman. They were off again before her door was even closed. They'd done all they could. Now it was a question of waiting to see if the target returned to his bike. It wouldn't have been a big deal to them when I became temporarily unsighted. This always happens for short periods, but the fact that it had happened at the tube station was a big problem for them. Once they'd failed to pick me up again, their next move would be to stake out the bike. Then some of the team would have checked out known target locations. There were only two. One was the apartment block, and they would be checking with the porter which apartment I'd gone to for sure. The other was the address where the bike was registered, a P.O. box just a few shops down from where it was parked. It was an office supplier's, and instead of having a box number, I had a suite number, because I wanted to make it sound like an expensive apartment block. No doubt that was what the woman was checking out. Nick Davidson was the registered owner of the bike, and suite 26 was where he supposedly lived. The real Davidson was going to be incredibly pissed off if he ever came back from Australia because I'd taken over his life in the UK. He was going to get a hard time from customs, immigration and special branch if he ever stepped off a plane now that this had happened. He'd be listed. It also meant that having Nick Davidson as my safety blanket cover ID was now history. And that pissed me off. It had taken painstaking months to get a national insurance number, passport, bank account, all the things that bring a character to life, and now I had to bin him. Worse still, I'd have to bin the bike. There'd certainly be a trigger on it for the next few hours, depending on how important they thought I was. An electronic device might even be attached to it. The only thing that cheered me up was the thought of what would happen to the person who'd eventually steal it after seeing it standing there for a few days. They wouldn't know what had hit them when the E4 team closed in. I'd nursed a coke while keeping dog through the large Victorian windows. My glass was nearly empty, and if I didn't want to look out of place, I'd need to get a refill. Fighting my way to the bar, I ordered a pint of orange and lemonade and went and sat in the corner. No need to look outside now. I knew a team were on me. I just had to sit it out, keeping my eyes on the doors in case they started to check out the pubs. In an hour's time, it would be the end of the working day. I'd wait until then and lose myself in the darkness and commuter traffic. As I sip my drink, 
I thought about Tom Mancini. His name was certainly familiar. One of my first jobs as a K in '93 had been to drive him from North Yorkshire, where he worked, down to a Royal Navy facility near Gosport, Hampshire. I was told to grip him so much that he begged to be handed over to the firm's people, who I was delivering him to. It didn't take that much. Just a few slaps, a scary face, and me telling him that if he fucked me about, the only thing left ticking on his body would be his watch. Once we got him down in one of the forts built along the coast, he wasn't even given time to clean himself up before the firm's interrogation team explained the facts of life. A technician at Menwith Hill listening station, he'd been detected trying to obtain classified information. I wasn't allowed in on the interrogation, but I knew they told him Special Branch would be arresting him the next day for offences against the Official Secrets Act. They couldn't stop that. However, if he didn't get smart, that would be just the start of his problems. He would shut up in court about what he'd really been tampering with. Whatever that was, it seemed the firm didn't want anyone to know about it, even Special Branch, for the charge would be for a lesser offence. He would tell them who he was getting the information for, and of course he'd have no recollection of this meeting ever taking place. He'd serve a short sentence, and that would be the end of it. If he ever uttered a word to anyone about the deal, however, someone like me would come and pay him a visit. Tom had been fucking about with the big boys. I knew that RAF Menwith Hill on the moors near Harrogate in Yorkshire was one of the largest intelligence gathering stations on earth. Its massive golf ball-shaped radomes monitored Europe's and Russia's airwaves. It might be a British base, but in reality it was a little piece of the USA on British soil, run by their all-powerful NSA, National Security Agency. It was manned by about 1,400 American engineers, physicists, mathematicians, linguists, and computer scientists. The staff was complemented by 300 Brits, which meant that there were as many people working at Menwith Hill as there were for the firm. Menwith Hill operated in close tandem with GCHQ, Government Communications Headquarters, at Cheltenham, gathering electronic information from as far afield as eastern Russia. GCHQ did not, however, have automatic access to the intelligence gathered at Menwith Hill. All information went directly to the NSA at Fort Meade in Maryland. From there, information collected on terrorism that might, for example, affect the UK was redistributed to the Security Service, Special Branch, or Scotland Yard. Britain's contract with the US is that we can only buy American nuclear weapons on the condition that bases like Menwith are allowed to operate on British soil, and that the US has access to all British intelligence operations. Sad, but true. They are Big Brother. Britain is just one of the little runt siblings. From what I could remember, Tom was all mouth and trousers. He came on like a Jack the Lad Cockney trader, which was rather strange because he came from Milton Keynes and was about as boring as his postcode. By the end of the drive south, however, he had been like a small child curled up on the back seat. It worried me that Val knew I had met Tom, that he had access to details about a 24-hour period of my life that I'd all but forgotten about, but I was in it for the money, nothing else, and so I cut that thought away, just in case it made me change my mind. I finished my drink, picked up my helmet and headed for the toilets. Placing the helmet on the cistern in a cubicle, I sat down on the lid, unzipped my jacket and pulled out the envelope. After an afternoon of people missing the pan and flicking dog ends in the urinals, the place stank. I inspected the nylon fibre-type bubble wrap envelope. Then, resting it on my knees and using both hands, I pressed down and started to run my palms over it, fingertips moving up and down the contours of the contents. I turned it over and checked the other side. I couldn't feel any sort of wiring or anything more solid than what I hoped were the notes, but then again, that didn't mean a thing. A wafer-thin battery from a Polaroid film tucked between the bundles would kick out enough power to initiate a letter bomb. It might be Val's special little way of saying thank you. 
I picked it up and put the fold to my nose. If it was a device, and they'd used any exotic or older-style explosives, I might be able to smell them. Sometimes it's marzipan, sometimes linseed oil. I was expecting something more sophisticated, but these things have to be tested for. All I could smell was the urinals. The bar noise rose and fell as the outer door opened and closed. I carried on inspecting the envelope. I decided to go ahead and open it. It felt like money, weighed like money. If I was wrong, the whole pub would know about it soon and a pissed-off insurance company would be shelling out for a refit. I opened the knife blade of my leather man and gently cut down the centre of the envelope, checking inside every centimetre or so for wires. It was looking promising. I started to see green U.S. banknotes. Each bundle of used hundred-dollar bills that I carefully pulled out was banded and told me the bundle contained ten thousand dollars. There were ten of them. I was a very happy Teddy indeed. Val had put his money where his mouth was. I didn't just respect him now. I liked the man. Not enough to introduce him to my sister yet, but then again, I didn't have a sister. Someone else entered and tried the toilet door. I grunted, making it sound like I was having a big boy dump. He checked the next one, and I heard the sound of jeans coming down and him getting on with the business. I smiled as I started to stuff the money into my leathers, feeling quite pleased with myself as my next-door neighbour farted for England. Staying in the pub for another half hour, drinking more orange and lemonade and reading the standard for the third time, I wondered if the team had been called off yet. Nine out of ten times it boils down to money. They were probably hoping to earn a little Christmas bonus out of me. E4 operators get treated as badly as nurses. They work their bollocks off and are expected to carry on regardless. By now they know the address was a P.O. box arrangement, and that would have set their alarm bells ringing. They probably planned to go into the office tomorrow, open up my box and see what was in there. They'd even put me on their own special mailing list. As post address to Suite 26 came through the Royal Mail sorting system, it would be sidetracked for a while so that prying eyes could have a little look-see. All they would find was my access bill, well, Davidson's bill, Perhaps they'd be nice enough to pay it. I certainly wouldn't bother any more. By tomorrow, if they decided to dig deeper, they'd also know that Mr. Davison had been to Norway recently, returning by the same route he'd travelled all those weeks ago. What would they make of that? I doubted that their conclusion would be a skiing trip, after Davidson had been seen coming out of the targeted apartment block where one of the owners was a Russian who just got hit days ago, in a country a mere day trip away from where Davidson had disembarked. Fuck it. It was too late to worry about all that now. As long as they didn't have a photograph of me, I'd be okay. I sat there with another Coke and a packet of ready salted. Thirty-five minutes on, I finally decided to make a move. The rush-hour traffic on all sides of the triangle was moving at about a metre a minute, a confusion of headlights and exhaust fumes. Every fourth car had its indicator lights flashing, thinking the other lane was quicker. The pedestrian traffic, too, was much heavier and moved quicker than the vehicles. Everybody was huddled over, fighting the cold and just wanting to get home. Leaving the helmet under the table... I exited through a door that led out into a different road. The motorbike helmet was a VDM, so were my leathers, but I could hardly discard them. All I could do was cut down on the things that would trigger me. The priority was to get a hotel for the night, before I contacted Tom in the morning. I also needed clothing. Without a bike, there was no way I could walk around looking like Judge Dredd. If you want late-night shops, it has to be the West End. I grabbed a taxi to Piccadilly Circus and changed one thousand dollars at various bureaux de change, throwing in a couple of hundred at a time. The shopping frenzy was another short cab ride away in Selfridges, where I bought clothes, washing and shaving kit, and a nice little hold-all for my new-found wealth. Then I booked myself into the Selfridges Hotel using my Nick Stone credit card. To have used Davidson's would have invited a knock on the door within hours. After a bath and a change of clothes, all very predictable, jeans, Timberland boots, blue sweatshirt and a dark blue nylon puffer jacket, I call room service for a club sandwich and coffee.
End of Side 7 Side 8 Chapter 13 Saturday, the 11th of December, 1999 I woke up and looked at Baby G. It was just after 8, time for a quick couple of laps round the bath before getting dressed. Looking like a kid in his shiny new Christmas Day clothes, I left the jacket with my leathers and went down to breakfast, taking the money bag with me. There was $25,000 left after a very grateful clinic had received not only what was owing to them, but also a wedge on account. It's strange how finance directors will come in of an evening to collect a payment, even brew coffee and pour it. The newspapers were full of doom and gloom, and as I downed my full English breakfast, listening to the Americans or Israelis talking about the shopping they were going to be doing before they went back home, I felt good about fulfilling my responsibilities to Kelly, even though I knew I should be doing a lot more than just paying out money. Back in my room, I settled on the bed and called the number on the paper that Liv had given me. A young woman answered. Her, hello, sounded as friendly as if I was the fourth wrong number in a row. Oh, hi, is Tom there? No, he's not, she snapped. He'll be in coins. Who are you? It sounded as if all was not well in the Mancini household. Just a friend. Coins, did you say? Yes. What is that, a shop or... It's the calf off Lebury Road. I was obviously stupid for not knowing. Thanks, uh... the phone slammed down. Talking pages told me that Coins was in Talbot Road, Notting Hill. I put my squeakily clean blue duvet jacket on, picked up my swag bag, and jumped into a taxi to join Tom for a brew, borrowing a read of the cabbie's A to Z on the way to work out exactly where he lived. The sky might be full of dark clouds, but I was still feeling good. I didn't know Notting Hill at all, just that it had a carnival each year and that there'd been a bit of a frenzy about Julia Roberts coming to stay. During the film's hype, I'd read all this stuff in the papers about the village atmosphere and how wonderful it was to live there. I didn't see much evidence of a village, just expensive clothes shops, the sort with one pair of shoes in the window surrounded by spotlights, a few antique shops and an Oxfam store. We turned corners and drove past stucco-fronted houses, mostly cut up into flats and very run down with chunks of plaster falling off the brickwork. The cab stopped at a crossroads and the dividing window opened. It's a one-way, mate. I'll drop you off here if that's all right. It's just down there on the left. I could see the large awning sticking out over the pavement with plastic side panels keeping the elements off the brave ones who wanted to sip their cappuccinos outside. I paid him and took a walk. Coins turned out to be double-fronted, with a few empty tables outside. The large windows on each side of the door were steamed up from cooking and people. As I went in, it was obvious from the rough wooden floors and plain laminated plywood that the cafe was trying to look down-to-earth and no-nonsense. The kitchen was open-plan, and the smells were very tempting, even with half a kilo of bacon and eggs still weighing me down. There was no sign of Tom so I took a seat in the far corner. There were magazines lying around on the tabletops, designer pictures on the walls and flyers for a shitload of artistic events. The menu was a sheet of A4 paper in a plastic folder offering everything from neat cholesterol to vegetarian sausages and salads. The prices certainly didn't match the decor. Someone was making a down-to-earth, no-nonsense fortune. The clientele seemed to average late twenties, early thirties, trying so hard to look individual that they all looked like clones. Everyone was in baggy cargo trousers and sleeveless puffers, and must have taken ages to get their hair looking like they'd just got out of bed. Quite a few were wearing thick frame rectangular glasses, more to be seen in than to see through. Hi sweetie, what can I get you? An American female voice floated down to me as I studied the menu. Glancing up, I asked for a latte and toast. Sure, sweetie. She turned and presented the world's second most perfect rear, covered in tight black nylon flares. As she walked away, I couldn't help staring at it and was pleased to catch others doing the same. She must bring in a lot of custom. No wonder Tom came here. There was nothing else to do but sit and listen to other people's conversations. 
It seemed that everybody was either just about to get a movie or just about to be in a play, but it just hadn't quite happened yet, and everybody had a fantastic script that was being read by a marvellous man who used to share a flat with Anthony Minghella. The only time people stopped talking was when their mobiles rang, only to talk even louder than before. Jambo, dude, how's it going, man? Rare of the year came back. Here you are, sweetie. She gave me my glass of latte, which burned my fingers as I watched her walk back to the kitchen. I picked up a copy of The Guardian, which a girl sitting on the table next to mine handed over as she left. We smiled at each other, knowing we were both thinking the same thing about our American friend. Looking down at the front page, I waited for my toast and Tom. Half an hour later, the toast was finished and I was on my second latte. Clones came and went. Air kissing as they met and being very important with each other. Then, at last, Tom entered. At least I thought he was Tom. His greasy hair was now ponytailed just past his shoulders, making him look like a member of a Los Angeles garage band. His cheeks were more hamster like than I remembered. Maybe the extra pounds he'd put on had changed the contours of his face. The clothes looked as if they'd come from the same shop as everyone else's here. Canvas daps, brown cargoes, and a faded green sweatshirt with a T-shirt that had started off white, then gone a few rounds with something blue. He must have been freezing. Settling his chubby ass on a tall stool along the breakfast bar facing the window, he pulled a magazine out from under his arm. Some kind of palm top computer and games monthly. At least he looked the part. A small Puerto Rican looking woman took his order. I decided to wait until he'd finished eating, then do my Hello Tom, well, well, fancy seeing you here bit. But my plan got cut short as he suddenly stood up and turned towards the door. Along with a very pissed off waitress, I watched him cross the road and run up a side street, losing him in the moisture on the windows and the shadow of the awning. He must have seen me. I got up and paid my money to rear the year, getting an extra big and friendly bye, sweetie, when she saw the size of tip I'd left on my saucer. Tom had run towards home, so I headed in the direction of All Saints Road, past reggae music stores and plumber shops. His address was a flat in a yellow-painted, stucco-fronted building just off All Saints. Going by the array of bell pushes at the front door, it looked like there were eight flats in the building, which meant each one must have been the size of a broom cupboard. Most houses in the street had been converted into flats and were painted black, green, or yellow, with grimy windows covered by dirty old netting, which drooped in the middle. I bet this road wasn't in the film. I went to press the button for his flat, number four, but the wiring hanging out of the intercom was rusted and frayed. Some names were slotted into the recesses on torn pieces of paper, but half of them, like flat four, didn't even have that. As I rang the bell, I could hear the slight buzz of an electric current. Chances were the thing did work. I waited, stamping my feet and digging my hands into my jacket, but there was no answer. I wasn't expecting one from the intercom, but thought there might have been a shout or a face at a window. Eventually a curtain twitched on the third floor. I rang again. Nothing. It was turning out to be more amusing than frustrating. Tom just wasn't cut out for this sort of thing. If you want to do a runner, you don't head straight home. E4 would have had no trouble pinning him down. I found myself smiling as I thought of him up there, hoping I'd just go away and that everything would be all right. Looking up again at the dirty window, I made sure that whoever was watching would hear me clunking down the steps, really tearing the arse out of it so they'd know I'd given up. Walking back the way I'd come, I hung around at the junction with All Saints, knowing that he'd leave sooner or later. It was the wrong thing to do, so he was bound to do it. He might have the skill to hack into and download whatever it was in this Finnish house, but when it came to common sense... He had trouble inserting the disc, let alone playing the game. Loitering in the doorway of a derelict shop, I was facing a massive pop-art mural that covered the whole gable end of a building. Reggae music blared from a shop as two teenagers came out and danced their way along the road, sharing a cigarette. My own breath was doing a good imitation of smoke in the cold air. I wasn't too sure that I'd be able to see Tom if he tried to do a bunk over the back of the house but he was on the third floor, so it would be quite difficult for him. 
From what I'd seen of him, even if he'd been on the ground floor, it would have been a bit of a challenge. I must have looked like the local loony to the kids, grinning broadly as I thought about him trying to get himself over a six-foot wall. I wouldn't want Mancini as a wingman. Sure enough, twenty cold, boring minutes later, out he came. Still with no coat on, hands tucked under his armpits, not exactly running, but moving quickly. I didn't even have to follow him. He was coming towards me, probably on his way to screw up even more by going straight back to the cafe. I stepped out in front of him, and his look of horror said it all. Hello, Tom. At first he didn't move, he just stood there, rooted to the spot. Then he half turned away, screwing up his face and looking down at the pavement like a dog that thinks it's going to get hit. Oh, please don't hurt me. I, I didn't say nothing to no one. On my life, promise. It's all right, Tom, I said. I have nothing to do with those people now. That's not why I'm here. Chapter 14 Tell you what, I said. Let's go back to your flat. Get the kettle on and have a chat. I was trying to sound nice, but he knew I wasn't offering him a choice. I put an arm around his shoulder and he stiffened. Come on, mate, let's have a brew and I'll tell you what this is all about. It's too cold out here. Being only about five foot five, he was easy to get my arm around. I could feel the softness of his body. He hadn't shaved for a few days and the result wasn't bristle, but the sort of thing you could fill a duvet with. I started to make small talk as we walked, trying to make him feel at ease. Also, this meeting needed to look a bit more normal to any third party nosing out of their window. How long have you been living round here then, Tom? He kept his head down, studying the paving slabs. As we passed the multicoloured houses, I noticed he was shaking. About a year, I suppose. Hey, I called your flat earlier on and a woman answered. She your girlfriend? Janice? Yeah. There was a gap of a second or two before he stopped walking and looked up at me. Look, mate, I have never, ever said nothing to no one about any of that stuff. Not a word. I swear on my mother's life. I haven't even told Jack. Tom, all I want to do is talk. I've got a proposition for you. Let's just sit down, have a brew and a chat. He nodded as I got us both walking again. I think you'll like what you hear. Come on, get the kettle on. We got to the house and walked up the four or five stone steps to the door. Tom fumbled for his key, which was tied to an old bit of nylon string, his hand shaking as he tried to get it into the keyhole. He still thought he was going to get hammered. I decided to let him think it. Maybe it would lighten him up when he finally realised I wasn't here to put him in hospital. It was just as cold in the hallway as it was outside. The threadbare, dirty carpet matched the damp, peeling walls. An old-fashioned pram blocked the hall, and I could hear what sounded like its passenger screaming in the flat to the left, trying to make more noise than the TV talk show sharing his room. Breathing into past the pram and get to the stairs, I felt quite cheerful. Even my house smelled better than this. Heat rises, but not in this place. Number four had its own small landing, with paint peeling off the door and banisters. He managed to get the key straight in the lock, and the door opened into what I supposed was the living room. Dirty grey net curtains made the dirty grey light from outside even gloomier. MFI's flat pack division had done well out of Tom. Shiny waxed pine shone everywhere in the small room. Even the two-seater settee had wooden arms. The rest of the place was in a bad way. More damp walls, worn carpet, and cold. The fireplace was boarded up and a mains gas fire was stuck in its place, just gagging to be turned on. I could still see my breath. A ten-year-old wood veneer TV stood on a waxed pine stand in the corner, with a video machine underneath, the LEDs flashing all the zeros, and a dozen or so videos stacked next to it on the floor. To the right of that was a Sony PlayStation with a stack of games scattered around it, and the world's oldest PC. The buff-coloured plastic was dark and dirty, and the vents at the back were so black it looked like it ran on diesel. Its keyboard was really worn. I could only just make out the instructions on the keys. Not the best of equipment for such a high-tech guy, but very good news for me. 
It would have been harder to get him to come along if he was making a fortune and living in a penthouse. The need for money makes people do things they would never normally dream of. I was a bit of an expert on that front. We both stood there and I could feel his embarrassment. I broke the silence. Put the kettle on, mate, and I'll get the fire going, eh? He walked into a tiny kitchen off the main room and I heard coins getting fed into a meter and the knob turning to give us some gas. I heard the tap filling up the kettle as I threw my money on the settee and tried to light the fire, clicking the pilot light several times before the gas ignited with a whoomph. Opposite was another door that was open about six inches. MFI hadn't got round the bedroom. A mattress lay on the floor, the duvet pulled aside, dangerously close to a portable calor gas heater. The only other furniture seemed to be a digital alarm clock lying on the floor. It felt just like home. There was no telling where the bathroom was, but I reckoned it would be on the other side of the kitchen somewhere. In fact, it was probably part of the kitchen. I stayed down with the fire for a while to warm up. So, what are you doing with yourself now, Tom? Still in the computer business? At last there was a spark of life from him. He hadn't been filled in and I was taking an interest in his subject. He stuck his chubby head into the living room. I'd forgotten how it jutted backwards and forwards like a cockerel's when he larged it. Yeah, I've got a few irons in the fire. <laughs> know what I mean? Games. That's where the money is, mate. I've got a few movers and shakers in the business. Gagging for my ideas. Know what I mean? Gagging. I was still kneeling down, rubbing my hands by the flames. That's really good to hear, Tom. Yeah, things are sweet. This is just temporary while I decide who to sell my idea to. Then it's gravy time. Look for a house to buy. Cash, of course. And start my own show. Know what I mean? I nodded, knowing exactly what he meant. He had no money, no job, and was still full of bullshit. He was going to like what I was about to tell him. His head disappeared back into the kitchen and things started to be washed up. Standing up to go over to the settee, I saw a pile of plain white cards on the mantelpiece. The top two had lipstick kisses and a handwritten message on. I hope you like my dirty panties, love, Juicy Lucy, cross, cross. I picked one up. At least the lipstick was genuine. I raised my voice as I walked over to the settee. How long have you been with Janice? She sort of moved in a couple of months ago. What does she do? Just part-time at Tesco's bits and pieces, you know. He stuck his head round the door again. Sugar? No, just some milk will be fine. He came in with two mugs and put them on the knots of new carpet. Sitting on the floor by the fire, facing towards me on the settee, he passed mine over. His, I noticed, was without milk. I saw him clock the open bedroom door and worry whether I'd seen what lay beyond it. We both picked up our tea at the same time. Don't worry about it, mate. I spent my childhood living in places like this. Maybe I can help you find somewhere better until the game thing kicks in. He tried to sip his tea as his eyes flicked towards the Mickey Mouse alarm on top of the fire. Time to get down to business. By the looks of it, Things ain't that good, are they? You on the social? Jack the lad came back with a grin. Yeah, who ain't? I mean, free money. Madness not to, am I right or what? He went back to concentrating on his tea. Tom, I think I can help. I've been offered a job that would earn you enough to buy a flat and pay any debts outright. He didn't trust me. A fair one. It wasn't as if he knew me as Mr. Nice Guy. His eyes were still checking Mickey Mouse now and again. How much? He tried to make it sound casual, but didn't quite pull it off. I avoided burning my lips on my tea and took a sip. It was horrible. It should have been in a scent bottle, not a mug. I don't exactly know yet, but I reckon your share would be at least 130,000. Cash? That's the minimum. All I need is a week of your time. Two weeks at the most. I didn't have a clue how long the job was going to take, but once I got him to Finland, what could he do if it took longer? Getting him there was priority number one at the moment. Uh, is it legal? Uh, I ain't doing anything dodgy, mate. I don't want any more trouble. Uh, I'm not getting banged up again, know what I mean? My brew went back on the carpet. It was shit, anyway. Look, first of all, my name is Nick, 
And no, it's not illegal. I don't want to go to prison either. It's just that I've been given this opportunity and I need someone brilliant with computers. I thought of you. Why not? I'd rather you had the money than anyone else. You even get a free trip to Finland out of it. Finland? Jack the Lab was returning once again, head jutting. Hey, everyone is online up there. It's the cold, know what I mean, Nick? Too cold, like. Nothing else to do. He laughed. I laughed along with him as his eyes moved over to Mickey again. Tom, do you need to be somewhere else? Nah, you're all right. It's just that Janice is home soon, and the fact is, well, she don't know nothing, you know, my old work, getting banged up, all that stuff. I haven't really got round to uh, telling her. I'm just a bit worried that, you know, if she came in and you said something, hey, no problems, I'll keep quiet. Tell you what. When she comes in, I'll just say that I've got a small computer firm and I'm offering you a couple of weeks' work up in Scotland, testing systems. How's that sound? Nice one. But what's the form, you know? What are you after in Finland? It's very, very simple. All we need is to access a system and then download some stuff. Until we get there, I don't know what, how and when. He immediately looked worried. I had to get in there straight away. I needed some lies. It's not what you're thinking. It is legitimate. All we're going to do is find out about some new photocopier technology. And we've got to do it in a totally legal way. Otherwise, the money men don't want to know. I couldn't think of anything more boring and non-threatening than a photocopier. And I waited for a bolt of something to come at me through the window. God must have been asleep or had all his lightning still in the freezer. I carried on before Tom had a chance to think about it and ask questions. I can get us into the place, I went on, but I need someone who knows what the fuck they're looking at once we're in front of one of those things. I pointed at the heap of crap in the corner that was trying to look like a computer. He didn't say anything but looked at his greasy monitor screen, maybe thinking of the boiled, sweet-coloured Power Mac and matching iMac laptop he could buy with his cut. Everything will be laid on when we get there, Tom. They know where the place is. All you've got to do is access and download it. Not steal, mind, just copy. Easy money. I braced myself in case God had stirred in time to hear that last bit. Tom fidgeted on the carpet, so I kept going for it before God woke up or Janice got home. You know as much as me now, mate. I'm going half on the money with you. One hundred and thirty grand. Maybe more if we get the job done quickly. That's a shitload of cash, Tom. I paused to let him visualise a wheelbarrow full of tenors. Fifteen seconds was enough. Chance of a lifetime, Tom. I sounded like a double-glazing salesman. If you don't take it, someone else will. I settled back on the settee to signal that the pitch was over. The next stage would be a shed full of intimidation to make him come with me if the soft soaping failed. You're absolutely sure it's safe, Nick. I mean, banged up. I don't want that again. Things are sweet here, you know what I mean? I'm going to be earning big bucks soon. Explaining to him that I knew he was bullshitting would have to wait until I read him his horoscope. Look, mate, even if it was illegal, there's no such thing as prison when it comes to these jobs. Think about it. If they discover that you've found out about their poxy photocopier, are they really going to go to the police? Are they fuck? Think about the shareholders. Think about the bad publicity. It doesn't work like that, mate. Trust me. What happened to you before was different. That was government business. I couldn't help my curiosity. By the way, what was it they caught you doing up at men with? He started to get edgy. No, mate. I ain't saying nothing. I've done my time and I don't say nothing to nobody. I never want to go back. He was starting to sound like an old record. He was in a state. I knew he wanted the money, but he was struggling to make a decision. Time for a new tack. I tell you what, why don't you just come with me anyway? Have a look, and if you don't like it, you can come back. I'm not trying to fuck up your life, mate. I'm just trying to do us both a favour. He was shifting from one buttock to another. I don't know, Janice wouldn't like it. I moved forward once again on the settee, so my ass was on the edge and went conspiratorial. Janice doesn't need to know. Just say you're going to Scotland. Easy. The hiss of the gas fire could be heard clearly above my whisper. I decided I'd give him a bit more incentive. Where's your toilet, Tom? 
through the kitchen, you'll see the door. I stood up and took my bag with me. Nothing personal, I said. Work stuff, you know. He nodded, and I didn't really know if he understood or not, because I didn't. I went into the toilet. I'd been right. The bathroom was part of the kitchen, partitioned off by a bit of plasterboard so the landlord could claim more rooms and charge the DHSS a fortune for people to live here. I sat on the pan and counted out six grand from the dollars. I was about to shove it in my pocket when I decided to calm down a bit and put two grand back in the bag. Pulling the flush, I came out talking. All I know is that it's an easy job, but I need you, Tom, and if you're honest, you need the money as much as I do. Look, this is what I want to do for you. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out the four grand, making sure I rolled it with my other hand to make it look and sound extra attractive. He tried hard to stop himself looking at it. Even this amount could probably change his life. This is how I'm getting paid, US dollars. Here's four grand. Take it. It's a gift. Pay your bills, whatever you want. What more can I say? I'm going to go and do the job anyway. If you're coming with me, though, I need to know today. I can't fuck about. If he didn't give me a yes by this evening, it would be horoscope time. He'd still get paid. He just wouldn't enjoy the work so much. He fingered the money and had to split it in half to get it into his jean pockets. He tried to put a serious business expression on his face. It wasn't working. Nice one. Thanks, Nick. Thanks a lot. Whatever happened, he could have the money. It made me feel good. And with everything else going down the tubes in my life, I needed that. But I needed to make sure he didn't fuck up with it and let it be traced back to me. Don't go to the bank to change it or make a deposit. They'll think you're a drug dealer, especially with an address round here. His smile broadened. Take it to a few bureaux de change. The rates will be shit, but there you go. Have a nice day out. Hire a taxi. You can afford it. Just don't change any more than $300 at a time. Oh, and for fuck's sake, buy yourself a warm coat. He looked up and the grin turned into a laugh as he did his cockerel impression. It stopped just as quickly at the sound of a key going into the door lock. Shit, it's Janice. Don't say Jack. Promise me, Nick. He stood up and made sure his sweatshirt was covering the two bulges in his cargoes. I joined him and we waited in front of the fire as if the Queen was about to visit. She opened the door, felt the heat and looked straight at Tom, ignoring me completely. Have you picked up the laundry? Heading towards the kitchen, she started throwing off her brown greatcoat. Tom grimaced an apology at me as he replied, Oh, uh, no, it wasn't ready. The dryers were broken. I'm going to pick it up in a minute. This is Nick. He's the one that called, you know, this morning. She threw her coat onto the arm of the settee, looking at me. I gave a smile and said, Hello, nice to meet you. Hello, she grunted. You found him then? And disappeared into the kitchen. End of Side 8 Side 9 Janice was mid-twenties, not unattractive, not attractive, just sort of ordinary. Her hair was pulled back in a ponytail, slightly longer than Tom's. It wasn't exactly greasy, but had that not-washed-today look. She was also wearing just a bit too much makeup, and there was a line around her chin where it stopped. I sat back down, but Tom stayed standing by the fire, not really knowing what to say to me about his obnoxious girlfriend. In the kitchen, cupboard doors were banged as she made her presence felt. She came back into the living room with a bar of fruit and nut and a can of Coke. Pushing the coat onto the floor, she plonked herself on the settee next to me, pulled the foil off the chocolate, opened the can and started attacking both. The noise of her drinking would have made a thirsty bricklayer proud. Between gulps, she pointed at the mantelpiece. Tom, pass me the cards. He did as he was told. We both watched as she pulled out a lipstick from her coat pocket and threw it on her lips. Then, while she slurped and munched, she kissed the remaining blank cards. She looked up and stared at me for a few moments, then turned to Tom. Pass me the rest. He picked up an A4 envelope near the fire and passed it over, red with embarrassment. Pouring the white cards onto the floor, she started to reapply the red stuff and kiss away. 
The signing was obviously done later, during a gentler moment. We weren't going to get any more talking done. It was time for me to leave. Thanks for the tea, Tom. I think I'll be off now. Nice to meet you, Janice. She nodded, not bothering to look up. Tom looked nervously at me, then at Janice's head. As I got to my feet and picked up my bag, he blurted, Tell you what, I'll walk down with you. I've got to collect the laundry anyway. We didn't speak as we walked down the stairs. I knew what I wanted to say, but what was the point? Someone calling your girlfriend an obnoxious dog wouldn't exactly induce you to go away with him. As we walked back towards All Saints Road, he stammered, It's not a, you know, Lucy Lucy. She gets a tenner for every two hundred. This week it's Lucy. I think next week it's Gina again. I help her out, he rubbed his chin. I have to shave, though, otherwise I leave stubble marks in the lipstick. We have piles of dirty knickers in the bedroom. A bloke drops them off on a Thursday. I couldn't help but laugh at the picture of him in front of the fire, kissing cards and packing knickers for the country's crotch sniffers. His head went back into cockerel mode. Yeah, well, like I said, it's only until the money comes in. They're really keen. Activision, the Tomb Raider lot, all the big boys. I'm just about to hit it big time, know what I mean? Yes, I do, Tom. I knew exactly. I gave it one more try once we'd turned the corner into All Saints and Janice couldn't see us if she looked out. I stopped and faced him outside a window full of taps, waste pipes and assorted plumber's shit. Tom, think about this seriously. I'm not going to do anything that's wriggly. I'm too old for that sort of stuff. All I want to do is make some money the same as you. I need you with me, but I must know by tonight if you're up for it. He was looking at the pavement, shoulders slumped. Yeah, but, you know, the cold was starting to get to him. I didn't know whether he didn't have a coat because they hadn't kissed enough cards, or if he was just too stupid to remember to put one on. We got to Westbourne Park Road, a main drag. I wanted a taxi, so I stood on the corner. He stood next to me, shifting from one foot to the other. I put a hand on his shoulder. Listen, mate. Go and change some money and think about it, and we'll meet up tonight, all right? I started looking for cabs as he nodded at the pavement again. I'll call you about seven-ish, and we'll have a drink, OK? A yellow light appeared in the gloom, and I stuck out my hand. The cab stopped and the diesel engine chugged away, but not as fast as the meter. Tom was still stooped, hands dug deep in his pockets, shivering. I talked to the top of his head. Tom... This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance. Think hard about it. The top of his head moved in what I took to be another nod. I couldn't stand his shivering any more and unzipped my jacket. For fuck's sake, put this thing on, will you? He protested feebly, then returned my grin as he took the coat. At least I could see his face now. Once in a lifetime, mate. I got into the taxi, asked for Marble Arch, and turned to close the door and pull down the window. Tom was finishing zipping up. Hey, Nick, bollocks to it. Why not? I'm up for it. The cockerel had returned. I didn't want to show how pleased I was. That's good. I'll call you tonight with the details. We have to leave tomorrow. Is that OK? You've got a passport? No probs. Excellent. Remember, I pointed to his cargoes. There's plenty more where that came from. One week, maybe two, who knows. I put my thumb to my ear and my little finger to my mouth to mime a call. Tonight at seven, he did the same. Nice one. Tom, one last thing. You have a credit card? Uh, yeah. Why's that? I haven't got mine. You might have to pay for the tickets, but don't worry, I'll give you the cash before we go. I didn't give him time to think too much about that one. As the taxi pulled away, I was feeling pretty pleased with myself, and I had a sneaking suspicion that Tom wouldn't be sharing his newfound wealth with Janice. I knew I wouldn't if I was him. After giving the cab driver a new drop-off point, I bought myself a blue ski jacket in Oxford Street and went to a chemist for some bits and pieces I'd need for the DLB, dead letterbox, so I could leave our details with Liv. Before E4 pinged me at the flat, I'd thought Liv wanting to use a DLB just to hand over some flight details was a bit paranoid, but now I knew it was essential. If E4 were onto her, I didn't want any more contact with her in the UK, 
The last thing I needed was for Lynn to have a picture of that on his desk. The shit would be so high I'd never be able to dig myself out. I booked the flights from a phone box and they held them in Tom's name. I'd get him to pay for them with his credit card at the airport tomorrow. Now that Davidson was history, I had no choice. No one needed to know that Nick Stone was leaving the country. I wondered if Tom was still being monitored now that he was a known subversive, but decided I'd have to take that risk. There wasn't time to do anything about it. With my new coat to keep me warm, I decided I'd walk it to the DLB she'd given me. It wasn't that far away. Fighting my way through the Saturday shopping frenzy, I eventually made the 200 metres or so to Oxford Circus. The BBC studios in Portland Place were in front of me on the right. I stayed on the opposite pavement and headed for the Langham Hilton. About 50 metres short of the hotel, I walked under some scaffolding. Beneath it were two old-style red telephone boxes. In the windows of each were maybe 20 calling cards held in position by lumps of blue tack. The council would be around at some point today to clean them out, but they'd be restocked an hour later. I went into the left-hand box and saw Susie G's card three quarters of the way up, facing Oxford Circus. She looked very sultry, on all fours and kissing the air. At the same time as I peeled her off the glass, I got out a large black marker pen and scored a line down the window. Folding Susie into my pocket, I moved on towards the hotel. It was a bit premature to leave the DLB loaded sign, but I wasn't expecting any problems. With my bag in hand, I walked through the hotel's revolving doors, which had been started for me by a guy dressed in a green three-quarter length tunic and something that looked like a cross between a turban and a beret on his head. He looked a right nugget. The interior of the Langham was very plush and very full of businessmen and wealthy-looking tourists. It was Indian-themed with the chucker bar to my left as I walked into the marble reception area. Liv's instructions were perfect. To the right and up a few steps was the reception desk, and ahead of me was a restaurant-cum-tea room. My destination, however, was the basement. Down below was every bit as plush as above. Air-conditioned and soft-carpeted, it housed the conference rooms and business centre. Standing on an easel outside the George Room, a black felt board with white press-on letters announced, Management 2000 welcomes our conference guests. Passing it and two wall phones that I would be coming back to, I headed for the toilets. Opposite the toilet doors were more phones, a cloakroom and a table rigged up with tea, coffee and biscuits. Sitting ready to serve were a black guy and a white woman talking in that shifty tone that you just know means they're honking about the management. As soon as they saw me, they gave me their corporate smiles. I smiled back and headed for the gents. Sitting down in one of the cubicles, I took out a little plastic pillbox from my boots bag, the sort that people use to hold their day's supply of vitamins, along with a pack of adhesive-backed Velcro patches. I stuck both a female and a male patch onto the pillbox, just in case she'd fucked up on what side to use. It would be embarrassing if it didn't stick. Inside the pillbox went a small scrap of paper with my message. Arriving 15 15 12th. That was all that she needed to know. Putting the boots bag back in my pocket and checking that the two little squares of Velcro were secure, I came out of the toilet, smiled again at the two people in the cloakroom, turned right and went back to the first two telephones I'd passed. They were positioned quite low down the wall for the convenience of users in wheelchairs. I put the bag between my legs and shuffled a chair up closer to the phone. Liv had chosen well. Not too busy, no video cameras about, and a reason to be there. As I sat down, I got out a pound coin and Susie's card, picked up the phone and dialed, wondering if Janice and Tom had done any lipstick cards for her lately. I wanted the display to show money being used up, otherwise it would look suspicious if anyone passed and saw that I'd been there a few minutes and was only pretending to make a call. It was a small detail, but they count. I used my right hand to keep the phone to my ear, waiting for Susie, and felt under the wooden veneer shelf below it with my left. In the far corner there should be a large patch of Velcro that Liv had put there. 
As I fumbled about, the doors to the George Room opened behind me and out surged a stream of Management 2000 delegates. As I listened to the ringing tone, I watched the herd move to their grazing area by the cloakroom. A young woman in her twenties sat on a chair next to me and put a coin in the box. An aggressive Chinese woman answered me. Hello? I could hear my fellow caller tap out her number as I replied, Susie? No, you wait. I waited. The woman next to me started talking about her child who needed picking up from nursery as she was going to be late. The person at the other end was obviously annoyed. That's not fair, Mum. It's not always the same excuse. And, yes, of course she remembers what her own mother looks like. Kirk is home early tonight. He'll pick her up. A man came from behind and placed his hand on her shoulder. She kissed it. His management 2000 badge said, David. Not quite the conference making her late home then. The noise level doubled as people talked management over coffee. I found what I was looking for as I heard footsteps approaching the receiver at the other end. It was female Velcro, the soft bit, just as Liv had said. A very husky, middle-aged voice picked up the phone. Hello, can I help you, my love? Would you like me to run through the services? I ummed and ahed as the maid named the tariff for spending half an hour in France, Greece, and various other countries of the world with Susie. To spin out the call, I asked where Susie was based, and then for directions to the address near Paddington. That's great, I said. I'll think about it. I put the phone down, picked up the bag, moved the chair back, stood up and headed back the way I'd come, leaving the woman telling her mother it absolutely would be the last time she'd have to do this. I turned before going through the doors, checked the box couldn't be seen from that level, and went upstairs. Gunga Din did his trick with the revolving doors and I was back on the street. Turning right, I headed back the way I'd come. Last light was soon. By 4.30, it would be dark. All I had to do now was call Tom at seven and tell him the timings for tomorrow morning's flight, then go and dump my leathers in a bin and my weapon in London's biggest armoury, the River Thames. Chapter 15 Sunday, the 12th of December, 1999. Tom stood in a different queue for immigration. I told him in the nicest way that he must keep away from me until we were in the arrivals lounge. Security and all that. He talked too much and too loudly to sit next to in an aircraft. We'd even checked in separately. He'd agreed with his usual, No drama, mate, gotcha. On the tube to Heathrow, he told me that Janice was fine about him going away. I told her I had some work with my old mate Nick in Scotland, he said. I told her straight. That version was about as straight as Elton John. Janice was probably severely pissed off that he was enjoying himself north of the border for two weeks, while she slaved away kissing cards for Lucy. I wondered if he'd said anything to her about the money, but didn't ask. I didn't want him sounding off about his plans for world domination in the world of IT. At least he hadn't wanted to drown himself in free alcohol on the way over. It seemed he didn't drink. A by-product, maybe, of serving a jail sentence. Just as well, because there would be none of that until we were back in the UK. He'd made an effort and smartened himself up a bit for the journey, which was good. I wanted him to resemble an average citizen, not look like food for customs to pull to one side for a slow once-over. He was still wearing my jacket, but had swapped the flared jeans for a new normal pair, and he was also wearing a new red sweatshirt. However, he still had the same canvas daps on, and though he'd finished off by washing and combing his hair, he hadn't shaved. I watched him slap his jacket as if he was doing some sort of dance. This was the third time since leaving London that I'd seen him think he'd mislaid his passport. We got through immigration and customs, and there was no need to wait for suitcases. I told him that all he needed was a bit of soap and a toothbrush, and he could wash his underwear in the bath with him at night. The sliding doors opened to admit us separately into the arrivals hall. Tom didn't know it, but no one would be there to meet us yet. We weren't on the flight that arrived at 15.15, as I'd told Liv. We were on the 13.45. I always liked to be early in order to watch who might be waiting for me. 
Walking into an arrivals lounge to meet people I didn't know gave me the same feeling as knocking on a strange door, not knowing who or what was on the other side. We met up in the hall. Tom seemed to be feeling very laddish today, eyeing the women as they moved around the terminal. What now, mate? Where are we going? We're a bit early for our pickup. Let's get a brew. We followed the signs to the coffee shop. The glass and steel terminal building wasn't packed, but busy enough for a Sunday, more with tourists than business traffic. I could see a dull grey sky beyond the glass walls, with snow piled up at the roadside and ice hanging from parked vehicles. As we neared the cafe, Tom bouncing along at my shoulder like some younger brother, we passed two tall, blonde and beautiful women at a phone booth. Cool. Check out the arse on that. I love these Nordic birds. The two of them caught his drift and laughed to each other as they looked at us. I just walked on, embarrassed. They would have had him for breakfast. Tom seemed not to notice. Hey, Nick, do you know there's more people up here who are on the internet and have mobiles than anywhere else, you know, per capita. That's interesting, Tom. For once he had said something that was... He liked that. That's right, mate. Must be all that darkness up here. Fuck all else to do, I suppose. I looked at him and smiled, even though the joke had been better first time round. His face beamed and his hamster cheeks nearly covered his eyes. These people are at the cutting edge, know what I mean? He caught up the step that separated us and whispered in my ear, his head jutting in time. That's why the photocopier know-how is here. I'm right, aren't I? I was bored but managed the reply. It's probably the long hours of darkness. There's nothing else to do but Xerox, I suppose. Coffee, Tom? Ah, tea. Herbal or fruit, if they have it. We were soon at a table, me with coffee, Tom with a pot of hot water and an apple-flavoured tea bag wrapped in foil. Opposite was a bank of screens, obviously internet stations. It was only a matter of time before Tom saw them too and I would be sitting alone, which wouldn't be a bad thing. His eyes lit up and sure enough he was getting to his feet. I'm going to have to go and check that out. You're coming? He did, taking his tea with him. I didn't. He was back very quickly before I'd even tasted my coffee. You ain't got any coins, have you, mate? I've got no money. Well, finish money. Only dollars, know what I mean? I hoiked out the change from the drinks as he grinned at his own joke. I decided to have a walk round to see if I could spot anything threatening. I'd shaken off E4, but Val obviously had enemies, and while I was working for him, that made them my enemies too. My documents always stayed with me, but there was something else I wanted from my hold all before I wandered off. Digging around for the leather zip-up organiser, I dropped both our bags at Tom's feet and headed for the departures lounge upstairs. There was nothing out of the ordinary, nobody waffling into their lapels or facing into the crowd while pretending to read a newspaper. I took a walk outside, but not for long, the cold biting into my face and hands. I hadn't seen anything that looked as if it was bad and intended for me. Back inside arrivals and in the warm, there were a couple of boys in suits with A4 clear plastic folders showing the names of people they were there to collect. Tom was still in internet heaven. Look at this, Nick. Fucking cool or what? Look, virtual Helsinki. I was looking at a screen that displayed everything you needed to know about Helsinki from street maps to images of hotels and booking facilities for travel or theatre tickets. There was even a route plan where you actually walked down a road as if you were in a game. Still leaving the bags with him, I went and got myself another coffee, sat at the same table and watched and waited, thinking how lucky I'd been not to have had a kid brother that I'd had to drag around with me when I was growing up. Fifteen minutes later, he was back with the bags. He must have run out of money. I just emailed Janice and told her I, I definitely can't get in touch for a while, up in the hills, testing kit and all that. I put the organiser back in my bag and finished my brew. We might as well make a move, they should be here by now. Our lift was easy to spot, smartly dressed in a grey suit and overcoat, with spiky light brown hair and a red complexion, presenting himself to the people pushing their trolleys through the automatic doors of the customs hall. He was holding up an A4 card with felt-tip lettering on, Nick and another. We went up and introduced ourselves. As we shook hands, he virtually stood to attention and clicked his heels together.
Side 13 Freshly showered, I lay on my bed and visualised once again making entry on target. I always found it easy to run the film in my head as if my eyes were the camera lens and my ears the recording equipment. I listened to what the snow sounded like as we walked to the veranda, then the creak of the wooden decking, working out how I would deal with it, attacking the lock on the door and then moving Tom around the house until we found what we were looking for. I replayed the footage three or four times, from leaving the car to returning to it. Then I started to edit it with different versions. What if Tom and I were on the veranda and the door opened? What if there were dogs in the compound? What if we were compromised in the house? I played the different versions and stopped the film at the crisis points, thought about what I should do, and then hit replay, trying to come up with answers. It wouldn't go exactly to script. It never did. On the ground, every situation would be different. But the film was a starting point. It meant I had a plan. From there, if the shit hit the fan, it would be a matter of adapting the plan in the one or two seconds available so that I could react to whatever the threat was instead of standing there feeling sorry for myself. I'd been in my room for about two hours when there was a knock on the door. Nick? Tom poked his head round the corner. Liv's back. You won't tell her you know, will you? It's just that, well, you know. I got off my bed and walked out with him, using my forefinger and thumb to mime zipping up my lips. She was in the living room, dropping her hat and black leather coat on the settee. There was no exchange of eye contact between them, and her whole manner announced there was no time for small talk. Good morning, she said briskly. It's been confirmed they are now online. She must have been to meet her St. Petersburg friend as well this morning. Could you two give me assistance? There are quite a few bags. We followed her downstairs, where the first thing she passed me was a sheet of paper with a weather forecast printed out in Finnish. It says there is a possibility of snow showers in the early morning. It is good for you, no? Tom was busy opening the rear door of the Merc. What do they mean by early morning? She shrugged her shoulders. I asked the same question. I'm afraid no one could tell me exactly. Anything between two and ten? I handed it back to her and walked to the rear of the 4 by 4 not letting Tom see my concern. This was bad. Snow is good for hiding sign, but bad for making it. We had to get in and out as quickly as possible, otherwise the only footprints left on the ground at first light would be our fresh ones, not mixed in with the others I'd seen in the compound last night. Unless that was, the shower kept falling for long enough to cover our tracks once we had left. This wasn't good at all. You just don't take that sort of risk if a job has to remain covert. But a deadline is a deadline, and I had no choice but to go in regardless. I was flapping and hoped that God hadn't really been listening to me in Tom's flat, just waiting to get his own back by stopping the snow the moment we got into the house. Tom picked up a set of 18-inch bolt cutters from the back seat and held them out with a quizzical expression on his face. I had lifted the tailgate and was holding an armful of bags and boxes. Just a bit of standby kit we might need tonight, mate. Come on, let's give her a hand. Tom followed me upstairs, the bolt cutters under his arm and his fists full of carrier bag handles. He dumped it all next to the stuff I'd carried up on the wooden floor outside the kitchen and was soon sniffing around in the bags like a child on the hunt for sweets. Liv was close behind. It was time to put the work disc into my hard drive again. It's pointless you two hanging around, I said. Give me a couple of hours to sort myself out here, and after that I'll explain why I needed all this stuff. Make sure those daps are clean, Tom. No mud that could flake off or grit in the soles, OK? He nodded. Liv looked at him, puzzled. Daps? The canvas shoes I've been wearing. He had already put his new boots on. She nodded mouthing the new word to herself as she logged it in her memory bank and left in the direction of her room. I'll see you both later. Tom was looking at me as she disappeared into the corridor, and the door closed. I knew what was going on in his head. Don't worry, mate. Not a word. He smiled, relieved. Thanks. Cause, well, you know. He waved to me as he walked towards our side of the house. Tom, 
Is there anything you need me to do for you? No, thanks, mate, he said with a sudden twinkle. Liv's already done it. He stopped, turned and tapped his forehead with his index finger. Nah, seriously, everything I need is up here. Do you want me to run through it? No point. I'll concentrate on getting us in and out of there. What are you looking for, anyway? He grinned. I won't know till I see it. He disappeared, and I emptied the carrier bags and boxes onto the floor. I sorted the clothing first, as it was the easiest to check. Shiny nylon puffer jackets were not what we needed at a time like this. All the stuff I'd asked live for was made of wool and thick cotton. We had to have clothes that weren't going to rustle, and they had to be dark and completely non-reflective. No shiny buttons or safety tape. I cut out any Velcro holding pockets or flaps with my leather man. Velcro makes quite a noise when pulled apart, and I couldn't afford for that to happen on target. Anything dangling, like draw cords, I also removed. Once in the house, I couldn't afford for something to get caught and be dragged onto the floor. All this might sound over the top, but people have been killed for less. I'd learned by others' mistakes, and I'd never forget seeing a mate of mine hanging from the top of a fence in Angola by the nylon cord in his combat smock. He didn't have anything to cut himself free with and had to watch as guards came, stopped to take aim just metres away, and put at least fifty rounds into him. Liv had chosen some good woollen outer gloves for us, as well as a pair of thin cotton contact gloves, so I could manipulate the door lock, or whatever, without my bare hands freezing onto the metal. There was also a pair of trainers for me to wear, from which I cut out the reflective heel piece. I hadn't ordered any for Tom. He had his daps. We would put them on just before entering the house. Heavy-soled boots make noise and drag in snow, leaving sign. The outside world needs to stay out there. I found a bag of six-inch nails, some lengths of one-inch thick nylon webbing, and a handful of metal washers. The length of wood was exactly as specified. I couldn't help laughing to myself at the thought of Liv in a DIY shop. She probably hadn't even known these places existed. There was a neat little hacksaw in a cardboard and plastic shrink wrap. I ripped it out of its packaging and used it to cut half a dozen six-inch lengths of wood. Liv had done her work well. The washers went over the six-inch nails and were stopped by the nail head. I slipped two washers over each, since they would be taking quite a strain. Fifteen minutes later, I had six fist-sized lumps of wood, each with a nail hammered through. The nail had then been bent into an acute angle about halfway along with pliers, so the whole thing looked a bit like a docker's hook. The exposed metal of the nail, apart from the bit at the bend, and about half a centimetre either side of it, had then been covered with rubber bands to eliminate noise when they were used. Tom and I would use one hook in each hand and carry one each as a spare. The dark green two-inch webbing was meant for strapping skis to a roof rack. I cut four six-foot lengths of it, knotting together the ends of each so that I ended up with four loops. These I put to one side with the hooks away from the chaos around me. The climbing kit was ready. Liv had been right. The old ways sometimes are the best, and this method took a lot of beating. It was a little gem from the files of MI9, created during World War II when they were asked to think up new ideas and design equipment so that POWs could escape from their camps and travel through occupied Europe to safety. They came up with silk maps sandwiched between the thin layers of a playing card and sent in red cross parcels. They even changed the design of RAF uniforms to make them easily convertible into civilian clothes. This hook-and-loop device, easy to make and easy to use, was just one of the many ideas they'd come up with for scaling POW camp fences. It had worked for them. I hoped it was going to work for us. Next, I unwrapped the Polaroid camera and four packs of film. Once the film was inserted, I took a quick test shot of my foot. The camera was working fine. I stripped the other three films of their wrapping. Each cartridge of film contained its own battery power source but batteries tend to get sluggish in cold weather, and I couldn't afford for that to happen. To keep them warm, I'd make sure I kept them close to my body. Once we'd put on our trainers and I'd made entry, 
I would take pictures of wherever we were on target, camera noise and flashlight permitting. On a covert operation, everything has to be left exactly as you find it. People notice straight away when something is not precisely where it should be. It could be something obvious, like a folded rug that has suddenly been laid flat. But more often, it's something almost indefinable that compromises the job. They just feel instinctively that something is wrong. Maybe their pen isn't in the position they always leave it, even by as little as half an inch. Or the morning sunlight isn't shining through the blinds exactly how it normally does, lighting up half the desk. Or some dust has been disturbed. We might not consciously notice these things, but our subconscious does. It takes in every detail and tries to tell us. We aren't always clever enough to understand, but we feel that something isn't right. A switched-on target will know that even an out-of-place paperclip constitutes a drama and will take whatever action he feels is called for. The fact that people would be on target gave this job a high chance of compromise, but I couldn't let it affect the way I thought about what I needed to do, just the way I planned it. I'd been successful on similar jobs in the past, so why should this one be any different? Thinking about making entry reminded me to charge up the electric toothbrush. I went into my bathroom and plugged it into the shaver socket. Back in the living room, I picked up the set of Allen keys. A large metal ring held about twenty of the things in order of size. I chose the smallest one and eased it off the ring. The room was beginning to look like Santa's workshop, with sawdust, ripped packaging, plastic bags, clothes tags, and me sitting in the middle of it all. The Allen key had a right-angle bend about half an inch from the end. With the pliers and hammer, I straightened it out until the angle was more like forty-five degrees than ninety, being careful not to snap the soft steel. Then, having ripped the metal file from its shrink wrap, I started to round off the end of the shorter section. It only took about ten minutes. Going downstairs to the main door, I slipped it into the cylinder lock to check. It fitted perfectly. Back in Santa's workshop, I opened the pack of isopon and mixed equal amounts of resin and hardener from both tubes on a piece of cardboard. I took it and the Allen key back to the bathroom. Not many minutes later, the key was fixed firmly to the oscillating steel shaft of the toothbrush, the bit the brush head would normally fit into. When I'd watched the door of the target house being kicked closed, no keys had been turned. It had just been shut and left which suggested that the lock was a Yale-type cylinder. This gadget should do the trick. Bringing back two white hand towels, I sat on the floor and started to file another Allen key the same way. What I had made with the toothbrush and the first Allen key was a makeshift Yale gun, a device that simulates a key by manipulating the pins inside a lock. The oscillation of the toothbrush shaft would move the Allen key tip up and down strongly onto the pins, with any luck, it would displace them long enough for the lock to be opened. If not, it would be down to the old way. Still using the Allen key on the toothbrush, but with no oscillation this time, I would have to push up one pin at a time, then hold it there while I attack the next one in line. For this, a second Allen key was needed, and that was what I was busy filing down. Once I had attacked the second pin, I would simply move the other Allen key along, so that it held both pins up. Then keep on going until, in theory, I could open the door. That was if it wasn't bolted on the inside, of course. Which it probably would be if they had even one brain cell allocated to security. It took me another hour to finish preparing the kit and packing it into a medium-sized dark blue day sack. Everything was wrapped in my nice white towel so as not to make any noise or get smashed by the bolt cutters, the handles of which were sticking out each side of the top flap like a major league V sign. Tom wouldn't be needing a day sack. The only kit he'd have with him was the think pad and leads in their carry bag. Liv emerged from her corridor. By now, the jumper was off and she was in her tight jeans and a white T-shirt. No bra. That would have been interesting a couple of nights ago. But now I was getting on with the job. The circumstances had changed. She surveyed the mess as coolly as ever. Having fun? I nodded. Want to get Tom in to see what toys I've made for him? She walked past me to the lead room and I got to my feet. 
I was still brushing off sawdust when they both reappeared. Tom laughed. Tell you what, mate, Lego would have been easier. I smiled my, yes, very funny smile. Tom, I'm going to show you how to use this stuff. I pointed at the hooks and straps by the settees. OK, but one question. He was looking quite serious. I don't see an egg box or an empty washing up liquid bottle anywhere. He looked at both of us to see if we got the joke. I didn't have a clue what he was on about, and nor did Liv. Blue Peter! You know, egg boxes, toilet rolls, sticky pack plastic. It was too late for a laugh. Ah, right. Blue Peter. I'd never watched it as a kid. Liv still didn't have a clue, and clearly wasn't going to wait for an explanation. Tom watched her disappear into the kitchen. I even got a badge once. Right. Well, there's your clothes, mate. You're going to need a bit more on you than you bought yesterday. He picked up the contact gloves and tried them on. Hey, Nick, I'll wear my silk stuff underneath and be a bit kinky, eh? <laughs> I smiled. As far as I was concerned, silk thermals were about as much use as paper life jackets. Mr. Helly Hansen's stuff was the one for me. He pointed down at the hooks and straps. Go on in, what are they for? When I explained, he looked a bit taken aback. We'll be like fucking Spider-Man or what? His head jutted, but not as confidently as normal. You sure you'll be all right doing this, Tom? Have you climbed before? I'm sure I have. He thought about that for a second. Can I have a practice? Afraid not, mate. There isn't anywhere. He picked up one of the hooks and twanged an elastic band. Is this the only way, Nick? I mean... Listen, this is the only thing you've got to do for yourself. Everything else, I'll do for you. I broke into a whisper as if we were in a conspiracy that I didn't want Liv to join. Remember, we're in for a lot of money here. He seemed to spark up a bit, and I felt quite proud of my little speech. The coffee arrived, well, for Liv and me. The string of one of Tom's newly purchased herbal tea bags was hanging over the rim of the third mug. We sat down, Tom at my side. OK, I said. What I want to do now is explain exactly how we're going to get into and out of this place with your... I looked at Liv as she pulled her feet up onto the settee. Box of tricks. There was no need to set out the various phases military style as if I was briefing an orders group running through all the actions on for each phase. It would be counterproductive. I didn't want Tom to have so much stuff floating around in his head that I ended up confusing him. If he got muddled, he might get even more scared. He didn't have to know why, just how. I unfolded the map and pointed at the key locations with a pen. This is where we're going to park, then we're going to walk down here. I ran my pen down the marked track as he took small, sharp sips of his brew. Once we get to the area of the house, we climb the fence using the hooks and straps. Then I'll get us into the house and you can do your stuff. After that, it's out of there the same way. I'll tell you exactly what to do and when to do it. If you see or hear anything different or there's a drama, stop doing whatever it is you're up to and stay exactly where you are. I'll be there to tell you what to do, OK? OK. I want to leave dead on nine, so you need to be ready 15 minutes before. If the weather's good, we'll be in Helsinki before first light. Then we'll organise the exchange. This time, they both nodded. OK. Now I'm going to get something to eat and then get my head down for a couple of hours, and I suggest you do the same. I was going to treat him like an ET, escort to Target, telling him only what he needed to know, and if there was a drama... All he had to do was stand still. I would be there to take action and tell him what to do. The less the person you're looking after has to think about, the better. I stood up and nodded a see you later to them both as I went to the kitchen for some of the cheese and cold cuts in the fridge. Tom left for his room. As well as not telling Tom too much to save confusing him, I also didn't want to scare him by suggesting anything about dramas, let alone the problems we were likely to have with the snow. Once people get negative thoughts into their heads, their imaginations go into hyperdrive and they start to flap. Every noise or shadow becomes a major event, which slows down the job and also increases the chance of a compromise. Tom already knew what to do if we got split up without realising it. Get himself to Helsinki Railway Station. 
He had enough money in that bag to charter a private jet home. I started to pull the fridge to bits, throwing all sorts onto a plate. I'd have loved to have left straight away and be on target before it had a chance to snow, but what was the point? We couldn't get in until people were asleep. I knew better than to worry any more about the job. It only gets you all keyed up. Too keen to get on with it, then you hit the target before the time is right, and fuck up. I headed for my bedroom with the food, picking at it as I went. Liv had gone. Once on my bed, I started visualising again exactly what I was going to do, with some more what-ifs, except that now in my film, it had started to snow. There was a knock on the door. I looked at baby G. I must have been asleep for three hours. The door opened and Tom appeared, his long hair dangling over his shoulders. Got a minute, mate? Sure, come in. As if I was going anywhere. He came and sat on the bed, looking down and chewing his bottom lip. I'm worried about this hook thing. Look, to tell you the truth, I ain't never done anything like that before, know what I mean? What happens if I can't do it, you know, if I get it all wrong? I sat up. His shoulders were hunched and his hair covered his face. Tom, it's a piece of piss. Don't worry about it. It's all in the legs. I stood up. This is how easy it is. Putting my hands above my head, I bent my knees and slowly lowered myself till my arse was level with the floor, then lifted up again. Not exactly difficult, is it? Can you do that? He nodded. Suppose so. Come on, let's see you then. As he lowered himself towards the floor, knees cracking and creaking, he looked and sounded very uncertain, but he managed to do it. I gave an encouraging smile. That's all you need to do. If your legs can do that later on, we're home and dry. But remember, small movements. No more than a foot at a time, OK? Small movements. Gotcha. He didn't look convinced. Just do what I do. Like I said, a piece of piss. You sure? Positive. He bit his lip again. I don't want to mess things up, you know, get caught or whatever. You know, what we talked about last night. You won't. Fucking hell, kids do this for fun. I used to do it when I was a kid, trying to bunk school. The school I was talking about was Borstal, and I only wished I'd known this little trick at the time. I would have been out of that shithole quick fast. Tom, relax. Have a bath. Do anything you want. Try your clothes on. Just don't worry about it. The only time to worry is when I look worried, OK? He hesitated in the doorway. I waited for him to speak, but he changed his mind and turned to go. And hey, Tom. His body stayed facing out and he just turned his head. Yep. Don't have anything to eat when you get up, mate. I'll explain later. He nodded and left with a nervous laugh as he closed the door behind him. I stretched out on the bed and went back to visualising each phase of the job. I wasn't happy about the prospect of snow, and I wasn't happy about not having a weapon. The vegetable knife I'd used to cut the cheese with wasn't much of a substitute. Chapter 20 I got up groggily just after eight and took a shower. I hadn't slept, but because I'd been trying so hard, I now wanted to. Dragging myself to the kitchen for a brew, I found Liv and Tom in dressing gowns, sitting on the settee with mugs in hand. They both looked as tired as I felt, and we exchanged only mumbled greetings. I still had one more thing to do with the kit before I double-checked the lot, so I took my brew with me to my room and got dressed properly. At just before nine o'clock, I took everything down to the car. Tom was on parade, showered and dressed. Liv didn't follow us down. She would be emptying the house tonight and was probably already busy getting it sterile. She'd take our bags with her, handing them back with the money in them. Tom and I faced each other as I checked him out. First, his pockets to make sure the only stuff in them was the equipment he needed. Daps, spare hook nylon loop, and money. He didn't need a hundred marks in change rattling around in his pockets, just the paper money in a plastic bag tucked into his boot to get food and transport if he was in the shit. Most important was the think pad and leads. 
jammed into the nylon carry bag, hanging over his shoulder but under his coat. I didn't want the battery getting too cold and slow on target. I then had to make sure that none of it fell out, especially his spare hook. I got him to jump up and down. There were no noises, and everything stayed in place in his large, padded blue check coat. Finally, I made sure he had his gloves and hat. All right, mate. No drama, he sounded convincing. I put the day sack on over my coat. We looked like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Okay, you check me now. Why? Because I might have fucked up. Go on. He checked me over from the front first. Then I turned so he could check the day sack was securely fastened. Everything was fine until I jumped up and down. There was a noise coming from the pocket my spare hook was in. Tom looked almost embarrassed as he reached in and brought out the two nails that had been rattling around. These things happen, I said. That's why everyone needs to be checked. Thanks, mate. He was very pleased with himself. It's amazing what a couple of well-placed nails can do to boost someone's confidence and make them feel they're contributing to things. Tom and I got into the car and wheels turned just after nine o'clock. Liv still hadn't made an appearance to say goodbye. He was pretty quiet for the first twenty minutes or so. As I drove, I talked him through each phase again, from stopping the car when we got there, to entering the house and finding what we were looking for, to me turning the ignition back on once I had the think pad securely in my possession. I concentrated on being relentlessly positive, not even beginning to suggest that things could go wrong. We got to the drop-off point after three and a half hours, with me flapping every time I'd had to turn the wipers on to clear the windscreen of shit thrown up by cars in front, thinking that the snowfall had started. Once in the fire break near the target, I killed the lights, but I left the engine running as I looked over at my passenger. You all right, Tom? When we'd done the drive past a couple of minutes earlier, I'd pointed out the track we were going to go down. He took a deep breath. Ready to roll, mate. Ready to rock and roll. I could sense his apprehension. Right then. Let's do it. I got out of the car, closing the door gently onto the first click, just enough for the interior light to go out. Then I unzipped my flies. Tom was on the other side of the car doing the same, exactly as I'd told him. I could only manage a little dribble as I checked the skies for even the slightest sign of snow. I couldn't see a thing in the darkness, of course, but somehow it made me feel better. I got the day sack and my coat out of the car and rested them against one of the wheels. It was bitterly cold and the wind was getting up, each gust biting at the flesh of my face. At least we should be out of it as we moved down the track, protected by the forest, and the noise of the swaying treetops would help cover any sound we made. The bad news was that the same wind would be bringing the snow. I put my coat on and watched Tom do the same as the day sack went on my back. So far, so good. He even remembered to close his door slowly to keep the noise down. After fully closing mine, I pressed the key fob. The lights flashed as I walked round to Tom and made sure he watched me as I placed the key behind the front wheel, covering it with snow. Getting back up, I went to his exposed ear and whispered, Remember, no flaps. I wanted him to keep his ears exposed. Two sets were better than one, and I still wanted him to think I needed his help, though I wasn't holding my breath on that one. He nodded as our vapour clouds billowed together in front of us. We're going to have to keep quiet now. I had to force myself to keep my mouth against his ear. This boy needed to do something about his earwax. Remember, if you want me, don't call. Just touch me. Then whisper right in my ear. Okay on that? Got it! Do you remember what to do if a vehicle comes? Yeah, yeah, make like Superman. His shoulders heaved up and down as he tried to suppress a nervous laugh. Okay, mate, ready? He nodded and I clapped him on the shoulder. Right, let's go then. I felt like an old sweat in the First World War trying to coax a young bayonet over the top. I set off slowly, my ears exposed to the night, with Tom two or three paces behind. When we were about five metres down the track, I had a check of Baby G. 
It was just before a quarter to one. Hopefully, friends was crap tonight and they'd gone to bed. We were going down the gentle incline, coming towards the bend that would take us into line of sight of the house, when I stopped, and so did Tom, just as he'd been told to. If I stopped, he stopped. If I lay down, so must he. Moving back to him, I put my mouth to his ear. Can you hear that? I backed my head away so he could listen. He nodded. Generator! We're nearly there, mate. Need another piss? He shook his head and I slapped him on the head in my best what-good-fun-this-is sort of way and started to walk on. Keeping in the left-hand tyre rut, the compacted snow solid beneath our feet, we slowly rounded the bend. All I could hear was the wind high above us, whipping the tops of the pines. The sound of Tom moving behind and the generator, its throbbing getting louder as we closed in. I looked at the sky. Fuck it. It didn't matter if it snowed now or not. I was totally focused on doing the job. Even my nose and ears didn't feel as cold as they had last night. There was nothing I could do about the weather and nothing I could do about the conditions of the contract. It was tonight or nothing and I was desperate for the money. Once we were virtually in direct line of sight of the house, I stopped again, listened, had a good look round, then moved on another eight or nine steps. My night vision had fully kicked in. I'd explained to Tom how to look at things in the dark, just above or below an object to ensure a good focus, and how to protect his night vision. It was a waste of time explaining why he had to do these things. All he needed to know was how. From what I could see at this distance, there didn't appear to be any lights on in the house, nor anything else to indicate that anybody was up and about. That didn't mean, however, that I was just going to bowl up to the gate. Every few steps I stopped, turned, and checked on Tom, giving him a thumbs up and getting a nod back. It was more for his benefit than mine. I just wanted to make him feel a bit better, knowing that somebody was thinking about him. We were a few metres short of the gap between the tree line and fence when I stopped again and listened. Tom did the same, one pace after mine. If they had NVG, night viewing goggles, and were keeping watch, we would find out very soon. There was nothing I could do about it. This was our only approach. Tilting my head so my ear pointed towards the house, I tried to listen just that little bit harder my hearing trying to overcome the noise of the wind, while at the same time edging my eyes round in their sockets towards the house to check for movement. I must have looked like a mime artist to Tom. There was a faint glimmer of light coming from the left-hand shutter on the ground floor. It was far weaker than last night. I could only just see it. Did that mean everyone was in bed or crowded round the TV? I put my hand up in front of his face and signalled Tom to wait where he was. Then my fingers did a little walking sign motion. He nodded as I moved off into the darkness, following the wheel rut towards the gate. I was exposed to the wind once I'd passed the tree line. It was now strong enough to push against my coat, but not enough to affect my walking. Nothing much had changed on the other side of the fence. Even the 4 by 4 was parked in the same position. On the recce there hadn't been any electrical current running through the fence. I would have known when I touched it. If there was some tonight, I was just about to find out. Biting off my right outer glove, I pulled the touch glove down and quickly felt the gate, not even taking a breath in anticipation. Fuck it, just get on with it. If it was wired up, the shock wouldn't be any different because I'd hesitated. As I put the gloves back on, I checked the padlocks. They hadn't been left undone, not that I'd expected them to be. That would be too much like good luck. There was no way I could cut the gate chains or fence because that would compromise the job. The bolt cutters weighing a ton in my day sack were only to get us out of the compound if we were compromised on target. Without them, we'd be running around in there like rats in a barrel. Getting out of a place had always been more important to me than getting in. Chapter 21 I headed back to Tom and out of the wind. He hadn't moved an inch since I'd left him, head down, arms by his side, a vapour cloud rising above him. Slowly easing the day sack off my shoulders, I knelt down in the wheel rut and tugged on his sleeve. Tom lowered himself to join me. 
You only take out one bit of kit at a time from a day sack, then deal with it, which means packing so the first item you want is the last bit you put in. Getting him to keep the day sack upright by holding the bolt cutter handles sticking out on either side of the top, I undid the clips and lifted the flap. Then, moving some of the toweling that stopped everything from flinging around, I took out one webbing loop and a hook. Twisting two turns of the strapping around the nail hook where it emerged from the wood, I handed the device, now with a three-foot loop hanging from it, to Tom. He gripped the wood in his right hand, exactly as he'd been shown, with the hook angled down and protruding between his index and middle fingers. Attaching another webbing loop in exactly the same way to another hook, I handed it over, and he took that in his left hand. I then assembled the other two devices in the same way, and reclipped and replaced the day sack on my back, then took one in each hand. Looking around at both the target and the sky, I noticed no discernible change in either. I just hoped it would stay that way. Taking a step closer to Tom, I whispered into his ear, Ready? I got a slow nod and a couple of short, sharp breaths in return. I started to move the last few meters towards the gate. My eyes were fixed on the house, but my brain was already crossing the fence. It was going to be our most vulnerable time. If things went wrong in the house, fine, I could react. Up there on the fence, we'd be fatally exposed, just like my friend hanging from his jacket cord, watching helplessly as they walked up and shot him. I stopped, my nose six inches from the gate, and turned. Tom was two paces behind, head bent to the left, trying to keep the wind out of his face. Turning back to the gate, I raised my right hand to just above shoulder height, the hook facing the diamond-shaped lattice, and gently eased the bent nail into a gap. The elastic bands around the nail were to eliminate noise, but I deliberately left the bend itself exposed. When I heard and felt metal on metal, I'd know it was correctly in position. Otherwise, if weight was applied with the hook badly positioned, there was a possibility of the nail straightening under the strain. That was why we both had a spare device. If there was a drama and one of these things started straightening while we climbed, the other loop and hook would have to hold our weight while the knackered one was replaced. The bend in the nail engaged the fencing with the gentlest of scrapes, the bottom of the strapping loop hanging about a foot above the wheel rut. I inserted the left hook about six inches higher and a shoulder width apart. It was pointless at this stage worrying about being so exposed to view from the house. All we could do was just get on with it, hoping they didn't see us. There was no other way. If I'd tried the previous night to find somewhere to cross on the side or rear of the building, I would have left tracks everywhere for someone to spot this morning, and my boot prints sure didn't look like reindeer hooves. Even if I'd been able to wreck all the way around, I would still face the problem of sign inside the compound. At least the front of the house was crisscrossed by footprints and tire tracks. Gripping both chunks of wood so the hooks took my body weight, I placed my right foot in the right loop and, using my right leg muscles to push my body upwards and pulling up with my hands and arms, I slowly rose above the ground. As the loop began to take the strain, I could hear the nylon creaking, stretching just a few millimetres as the fibres sorted themselves out. The gate and chains rattled as the structure moved under my weight. I'd expected this to happen, but not so loudly. I froze for a few seconds and watched the house. Satisfied that the right loop was supporting me, I lifted my left into the bottom of the one about six inches higher. It was now a foot off the ground only about another forty-four to go. I didn't bother looking at Tom again. From now on I was going to concentrate on what I was doing, knowing that he would be watching me closely and that he knew what was required of him. I shifted my body weight again until all the pressure was on my left foot and hand. Now it was this loop's turn to protest as it stretched that few millimetres for the first time. Lifting out the right hook, but keeping my foot in the loop, I reached up and put it back into the fence six inches above the level of the left one, again a shoulder width apart. Tom was right. It was like Spider-Man climbing a wall, only instead of suction pads, my hands had hooks and my feet had loops of nylon strapping. 
I repeated the process twice more, trying to control my breathing through my nose as my body demanded more oxygen to feed the muscles. I checked below me. Tom was looking up, his head angled against the wind. I wanted first to gain height and clear the snowdrifts in the gap, then traverse left over them and continue climbing near a support post. I didn't want us to climb directly above the wheel rut, not only because a vehicle or people might appear at the gate, but also because the higher we climbed, the more noise the fence would make as our weight moved it about. I was aiming for the first of the steel poles that the lattice sections were fixed to. If we climbed with our hooks each side of it, it would stop the fence from buckling and lessen the noise. I now moved vertically to the left, six inches at a time. After three more moves, I was off the gate and onto the fence proper, and halfway up the first of the three sections that gave the fence its height. The smooth, unmarked snow was a couple of metres below me. There was still a few feet to go before I reached the support, but I didn't want to get too far away from Tom. Stopping, I looked down at him and nodded. It was his turn to play now and follow my route. He took his time. There was a slight grunt as he took the weight on his right leg, and I hoped he remembered what I'd said, that it was all in the leg muscles, even though that was a lie. He'd need quite a bit of upper body strength as well, but I wasn't going to tell him that. I didn't want to put him off before he'd even started. The gate moved and the chains rattled far too loudly for comfort. Thankfully, the wind was blowing from left to right, carrying some of our noise away from the building. Tom hadn't quite got the hang of how to balance himself. As he went to insert his left foot in the loop, he started to swivel to the right, forcing himself round to the left so he was flat against the fence once again. I could hear clown music playing in my head already. As I looked down at him under my right armpit, I thought of all the other times I'd had to climb over obstacles or move along roofs with people like Tom, experts in their field, but simply unused to anything that demanded more physical coordination than boarding a bus or getting up from a chair. It nearly always ended up in a gang fuck. He looked so ridiculous that I couldn't help smiling even though his incompetence was the last thing I needed right now. For a moment I thought I'd have to go back down to him, but he eventually got his left foot into the loop and made his first descent. Unfortunately, he was so jittery that he started to swing over to the left as he released the right hook from the fence. Tom worked hard at it, huffing and grunting as he struggled to sort himself out. Then, strangely, he found the traverse a bit easier. He still looked a bag of shit, but he was making progress. I kept my eyes on target while he made his way towards me. Moving up and across a few more times, my hooks were soon each side of the first support. The massive steel pole was maybe a foot in diameter. I waited again for Tom, who was generating less noise now that he'd traversed onto the more rigid fence. The wind burned my exposed flesh as I forced myself to look around and check. The snot from my runny nose felt as if it was freezing on my top lip. Ages later, Tom's head was less than a metre below my boots. Beneath us lay a deep drift of snow which extended back five metres to the tree line. Now that we both had a hook on each side of the support, the going was good and firm. All we had to do from here was climb vertically and get over the top. Pulling one hook away at a time, I checked the nails. They were standing up to the strain. Tom was going at it like this was Everest, great clouds of vapour billowing round him as he panted for breath, his head moving up and down with the effort of sucking in more oxygen. He'd be sweating big time under his clothes, as much from the pressure he was under as from the huge amounts of physical energy he was needlessly exerting. End of Side 13 Side 14 I moved another six inches, then another, edging my way upwards, wishing we were going a bit quicker. About two-thirds of the way up, I looked down again to check on Tom. He hadn't moved an inch since I'd last done so, his body shaped flat against the fence, holding on for dear life. I couldn't tell what had happened, and there was no silent way of attracting his attention. I willed him to look up at me. He'd completely frozen a common occurrence when people climb or abseil for the first time. It certainly has nothing to do with lack of strength. Even a child has enough muscle to climb. 
But some people's legs just give out on them. It's a mental thing. They have the strength and know the technique, but they lack the confidence. At last he looked up. I couldn't make out his expression, but his head was shaking from side to side. From this distance there was no way I could reason with him or offer assurance. Fuck it, I'd have to go down to him. Extracting the right hook, I began descending and traversing to the left. This was turning into a Billy Smart Circus act. Getting level with him, I leaned across until my mouth was against his left ear. The wind picked up more and I had to whisper louder than I wanted. What's the matter, mate? I moved my head round to present an ear for his reply, watching the house as I waited. I can't do it, Nick. I'm fucked. It came out somewhere between a sob and a whimper. I hate heights. I should have told you. Oh, I was going to say, but, you know... It was pointless showing him how pissed off I was. That's just the way some people are. It's no good shaking them or telling them to get a grip. If he could, he would. I knew he wanted to get over the fence just as much as I did. Not a problem. Moving his head away from mine, he looked at me, half nodding, half hoping I was going to call it a day. I got my mouth into his ear again. I'll stay alongside you all the time, just like I am now. Just watch what I do and follow, OK? As I checked the house, I heard him sniffing. I looked back. It wasn't just snot. He was in tears. No point rushing him. Not only did we have to get over, but we had to do it again once we'd done the job. If it started snowing now, this really would turn into Billy Smart's evening performance. My feet were in the wrong position. His right foot was down, but mine was up. Moving to alter that, I put on my best bedside manner. We'll just take it nice and easy. Lots of people are scared of heights. Me? I don't like spiders. That's why I like coming this far north. There's none of the fuckers here. Too cold. Know what I mean? He gave a little nervous laugh. Just keep looking at the top of the fence, Tom, and you'll be okay. He nodded and took a deep breath. All right, I'll go first. One step, then you follow, all right? I slowly put my weight on the left strap, moved up one, and waited for him. He shakily raised himself up level with me. We did the same again. I leaned towards his ear. What did I tell you? Piece of piss. While I was close to him, I quickly checked his hooks. They were fine. I decided to let him have a rest, let him bask in his glory and gain some confidence. We'll rest here a minute, all right? The wind gusted around us, picking up ground snow in flurries. Tom was staring straight ahead at the fence, just inches from his face. I was watching the house, both of us sniffing snot. When his breathing had calmed down, I gave him a nod. He nodded back and I started climbing again, and he kept pace, stride for stride. We reached the top of the second of the three sections. Tom was getting the hang of it. A dozen or so more pulls on each side would take us to the top. I leaned across. I'll get up there first and help you over the top, OK? I needed to traverse again. I wanted to cross away from the top of the pole so we didn't kick off any of the snow that had collected on its top. Something like that would be too easy to notice in daylight. Tom was getting worried again and started to slap my leg. I ignored it at first. Then he grasped my trousers. I looked down. He was in a frenzy, his free hand waving towards the track as his body swung from side to side. I looked down. A white-clad body was fighting its way through the snow that was nearly waist-deep in the gap on the other side of the track. Behind him were others and yet more were emerging from the tree line and moving directly onto the track. There must have been at least a dozen. I could tell by the position and swing of their arms that they were carrying weapons. Shit! Meliskia! Nick, what do we do? I'd already told him a few hours ago what to do if we had a drama on the fence. Do what I did. Jump! Fuck it! Jump! Chapter 22 Gripping the wood hard and lifting with my arms so the hooks took my body weight, I kicked my feet from the loops and let go with my hands. I just hoped the snow was deep enough to cushion my ten-metre fall. I plummeted past Tom, who was still stuck to the fence, and prepared myself for the jump instructor's command when the wind is too strong and the drop zone, which should have been a nice empty field, has suddenly become the M1. Accept the landing. 
I plunged into the snow, feet first, and immediately started a parachute roll to my right, but crumpled as my ribs banged hard against the tree stump, immediately followed by one of the handles of the bolt cutters giving me the good news on the back of my head. It was starburst time in my eyes and brain, pain spread outwards from my chest, the snow that enveloped me muffling my involuntary cry. I knew I had to get up and run, but I couldn't do a thing about it. My legs wouldn't play. Eyes stinging with snow, I moaned to myself as I fought the pain and tried to work out how deep I was buried. Tom had found the courage to jump. I heard the wind being knocked out of him as he landed to my left, on his back. I still couldn't see anything from under the snow. He recovered, panting hard. Nick! Nick! The next thing I knew, he was towering over me, brushing the snow from my face. Nick! Come on, mate! Come on! My head was still spinning, my coordination screwed. I was no good to him, and knew it would be only seconds before we were caught. Station! Tom! Go! Go! He made an attempt to pick me up by my arms and drag me, but there was no way that was going to happen. It would have been hard enough for him in normal conditions, let alone in deep snow. Tom! The station! Go! Just fuck off! His breathing laboured a second time as he tried to take me with him. The pain in my chest increased as he pulled my arms, only to be relieved as he let me drop back down. At last, he'd got the message. I opened my eyes to see him pulling the spare hook out of his coat. For a split second, I couldn't work out why, and then I heard grunting right behind me. The Meliskia had got to us. Tom launched himself over me. There was the sound of a thud and a scream that was too low-pitched to be his. The next thing I knew, Tom fell beside me, sobbing. There wasn't any time for that shit. He had to go. I pushed him away from me with my hands. Not checking behind him, he left, stumbling over me on the way. I wanted to follow, but couldn't. Rolling over onto my stomach and pushing myself onto my hands and knees, I started to drag myself up out of the hole. As I crested the top, I saw Tom's victim, just three metres away and trying to get to his feet. He brought his weapon up. Blood oozing from the thigh of his white, cold-weather gear and all around the climbing hook that was embedded in it. Diving back down into the snow, I heard the unmistakable, low-level click-thud, click-thud, click-thud of the SD, the suppressed version of the Heckler & Koch MP5. The click was the sound of the working parts as they ejected an empty case and moved forward to pick another from the magazine. The thud was the gas escaping as the subsonic round left the barrel. I heard another click-thud, click-thud, as two more rounds were fired. I wasn't his target, but I lay there not wanting to move and risk getting hit. I wasn't even too sure if he knew I was there. The firing stopped and I heard short, sharp breaths as the hooked body took the pain. Then more arrived and I heard a shout. OK, buddy, it's OK. My pain suddenly disappeared to be replaced by an enormous feeling of dread. Shit. They were Americans. What the fuck was I in here? The hooked man answered haltingly between anguished gasps. Help me to the track, man! Ah, oh, sweet Jesus! They were swarming all around me, and I knew it wouldn't be long before I got the good news. I turned my head, and as I opened my eyes and looked up, Two white-covered figures with black balaclavas under their hoods were nearly on top of me, their breath clouds hanging in the cold night air. Hovering over me, one pointed his weapon soundlessly at my head. It's OK, mate. I'm not going anywhere. The other came forward, snow crunching beneath his boots, keeping out of his mate's line of fire. Vapour was the only thing coming from his mouth. There still wasn't any communication between them. I heard gasps and laboured breathing as Tom's victim was helped back to the track. He was in a bad way, but he'd live. Other bodies passed, pushing hard through the waist-high snow, heading in the same direction as Tom. Any thought of escape or trying to give them a hard time was laughable. I curled up and waited for the inevitable subduing, closing my eyes and gritting my teeth to protect my tongue and jaw. The breathing was now directly overhead and I could feel their boots disturbing the snow around me as I waited for the first kick to open me up for a search. It didn't happen. Instead, a cold snow-covered glove pulled my hands from my face and I caught a glimpse of a canister. I didn't know if it was CS, CR liquid or pepper and it didn't really matter. Whichever it was and even if I closed my eyes, it was going to fuck me over big time.
The moment I felt the ice-cold liquid make contact, my eyes were on fire. My nose filled instantly with even more snot, and I felt as if I was choking. The flame spread all over my face. I was conscious of what was going on, but was totally incapacitated. There was nothing I could do but let it take its course. As I choked and retched, a hand forced my face back into the snow. There were no commands to me, or any communication between the bodies. Snorting and gasping like a suffocating pig, I struggled for oxygen, trying to move my head against the hand that was still holding it down, desperate to clear the snow pressing on my face so I could breathe, but he wasn't letting that happen. A kick aimed at the side of my stomach got between my arms, which were wrapped protectively around it, and I half coughed, half vomited the mucus that had built up in my mouth and nose. As I rolled with the pain, Spray Man pulled me onto my back, arched because of the day sack. My neck stretched as my head fell backwards. I was still choking and snot was running into my eyes. A gloved fist hit me across the head and my jacket was unzipped. Hands ran over my body and squeezed my coat pockets. They found the spare hook, the vegetable knife, the makeshift Yale gun. Everything was taken from me, even the Polaroid film. One of them pressed his knee into my stomach with all his weight and vomit flew from my mouth. The taste and smell of strong tea from the journey filled the air around me as it spilt onto the snow. I tried lifting my head to cough up the last remaining bits in my throat, only to be slapped down. There was nothing I could do but try to keep breathing. The character kneeling on my stomach was joined by the weapon pointer on my right-hand side, and his freezing, fat muzzle raked against my face, pushing into the skin. The two of them just knelt there, waiting. The only sounds were their heavy breathing and me snorting like a pig. They knew I was fucked and were just maintaining me in that position. From what I could make out through watery, painful eyes, they looked far more concerned with what was going on by the gate. I knew I had to recover from the impact of the fall and the spray before doing anything about getting out of this shit. I accepted I had no control over myself physically but I still had control of my mind. I had to watch for opportunities to escape, and the quicker I tried to do it, the better chance I would have of succeeding. There is always confusion in the heat of things. Organization only comes later. I analyzed what I had seen. They were all in winter warfare whites. They even all had the same weapons and were highly organized, and at least two of them spoke English with American accents. This wasn't the Meliskia and this wasn't about commercial intelligence. I started to feel even worse about my future prospects, and was pissed off big time with Liv and Val, who obviously hadn't told me everything. I just hoped I'd be able to get my own back. I thought about Tom, and hoped that if he was alive, he'd make it back to the real world as quickly as he could. He had tried to save me. The bullseye with the hook was probably more to do with luck than skill, but at least he'd had the bollocks to do it. Winning a fight isn't important. It's having the bottle to get stuck in that is. I'd been wrong about him. As I lay passively facing the sky, I felt something wet and cold dissolve on my lips. The first heavy flakes of a snowfall. The few seconds of silence were broken by the crunch of snow coming from the direction of Tom's escape route. It must be the bodies returning from pursuing Tom or collecting his corpse. I tried to look, but my vision was too blurred for me to see anything. I was down in my hole, and they didn't walk near enough for me to see if they had him. If so, he must be dead. I couldn't hear him, and I assumed he'd be in pain if shot, or crying if captured, thinking about returning to jail. There was the crash of the chain as the gate was forced open, but still no sound from the two with me. Their silence made the situation feel even scarier than it was already. Tom and I were probably a sideshow they hadn't been expecting. They must have had their hands covering their mouths, trying not to scream with laughter, watching our attempt to climb the fence, just biding their time for when we were at our most vulnerable. Whatever we were trying to get hold of, so were they. That scared me very much. It seemed the race wasn't only against the Meliskia. Things were happening at the house. The front door was being battered. Then I heard screaming cutting through the wind, men's voices that couldn't be from one of the teams. These were the voices that went with high-pitched, big-time flapping. 
My two new friends were still looking around, and whatever they were waiting for, they got it. Muzzle man tapped spray man on the shoulder, and they both stood up. It was obviously time to go. As soon as the pressure on my stomach was released, I was thrown over onto my front, face down in the snow while the left-hand strap of my day sack was cut, accompanied by their laboured breathing. My right arm was dragged behind me as it was pulled away from my body. Gritting my teeth, I took the pain it generated in my chest. Then I was kicked over onto my back again, and I brought my knees up instinctively to protect myself. I didn't want eye contact. Not that much of it could be done in this darkness, but I wouldn't want them to construe any look I might give them as defiance and get them sparked up, or as a sign that I wasn't as injured as I was trying to pretend. Through semi-closed, angled eyes, I could only see one of them, swinging his weapon on its chest sling until it was across his back. Nightmare sounds were still coming from the house as he knelt down, gripping my throat with one wet, cold-gloved hand, putting another round the back of my neck, and started to pull me to my feet. I wasn't going to resist at this stage and jeopardise any chance of escape. As my body emerged from the snow hole, the wind started hitting the tears and mucus on my face. My snot started to feel like freezing jelly. I was frog-marched, with hands still in place around my throat, following tracks that had already been made in the snow. Not leaving sign didn't seem to be a high priority for these boys. We went through the now open gate. I could feel the wind forcing the falling snow against my face and hear the crunching footsteps of my escorts. Looking towards the house, I felt like I'd dived into a swimming pool and was moving up towards the surface, the shimmering shapes and sounds slowly becoming more distinct. I made out more white shapes through the snow falling in front of me in the lights that were now blazing on both floors. There were ransacking noises, furniture being thrown about and glass breaking, but the screaming had stopped. Still not a murmur from the team. The only reason the injured guy and his helper had spoken was probably because they hadn't realised where I'd landed. I was dragged past the four-by-four four and bounced onto the wooden veranda, my shins banging painfully against the steps, no doubt adding to the bruises I'd got last night. They carried on along the veranda with me, the sound of their footsteps echoing along the boards. A battering ram had been abandoned on the threshold, a long steel pole with two rectangular handles on either side. The top hinge of the door had been pushed in, and the bottom one was holding the door at a 45-degree angle inwards, the glass from its windows in shards on the floor. These guys hadn't bothered with electric toothbrushes. We crunched over the broken glass and entered the house. The warmth enveloped me, but there wasn't time to enjoy it. A few paces inside I was forced face down onto the wooden floor of the hallway. To my right were three other people, tied up and face to the floor, two of them in just boxer shorts and T-shirts. Maybe this was the reason there was no voice contact. They didn't want these three to know who they were. The three captives looked about Tom's age with long blonde hair. One of them had his done up in a ponytail. Another was crying, and his hair was sticking to his wet cheeks. Shit, and I'd been worrying how many bayonets would be on target. They looked at me with the same question in their eyes as I had in my head. Who the fuck are you? I looked away. They weren't important to me. Working out how to separate myself from these Americans was. As I turned my head, a boot tapped me on the side of the face and motioned for me to look down. I rested my chin on the floor, and my hands were forced in front of me, where they could be seen. They'd taken prisoners before. I counted a few seconds, then lifted my eyes and tried to look around, trying to gather as much information as possible to help me escape. I saw no scenes of frenzy. Everybody seemed to know what they were doing. There was a lot of efficient movement by bodies in white, some with their hoods down, exposing their black balaclavas. There are many different reasons for wearing uniform, but mainly, in situations like this, it's for identification purposes. The atmosphere seemed to be that of an efficient open-plan office. They were all armed, everybody had the same type of weapon, all suppressed. The pistol that each of them carried was very unusual. It had been a long time since I'd seen a P-7, 
but if I remember correctly, it fired 7.62 mm rounds. There were seven barrels, each about six inches long, and contained within a disposable, Bakelite type plastic unit. The unit was sealed and watertight and clipped into a pistol grip. The rounds were fired conventionally by pulling the trigger, but instead of a firing pin, an electrical current was sent to one of the barrels each time the trigger was pulled, via terminals, which married up when the barrels and grip were clipped together. The power source was a battery in the pistol grip. Once all seven rounds had been fired, you simply removed the barrel unit, threw it away, and put on another one. The P-7 was originally designed to be fired at divers at close range and underwater to penetrate their diving sets and, of course, their bodies. I didn't know if they were any good at longer range. All I knew was that they were silent and extremely powerful. Because of their size, they were being carried by these guys in shoulder holsters over their whites, along with thick black nylon belt kit that held their HK mags. I couldn't remember who made P-7s or if it was the weapon's real name. Not that it really mattered to me at the moment. What did matter was that these people were uniformed and efficient, and they hadn't been sent here because the computers on site weren't Y2K compliant. They had to be from a security organisation, CIA maybe, or NSA, it didn't matter which. It was highly unusual for them to be carrying out such an operation within a friendly nation's territory. That sort of thing was normally left to dickheads like me so that everything could be denied if it went wrong. The reason they were on the ground must be that they desperately wanted something that belonged to them, and whatever it was, it must be so sensitive that they didn't want, or trust, anyone else to go and get it. Had I been trying to nick American secrets? I hope not. That was spying, and with no help from HMG, I'd be lucky if I got out of prison in time to see Kelly's grandchildren. I realised what had been causing the dull glow from the left-hand side of the house. Through an open door I could see it hadn't been room light escaping from the broken shutter, but the glare from banks of TV screens. I made out CNN, CNBC, Bloomberg and some Japanese programme, all with anchor men and women talking business. Running captions displayed financial information across the bottom of the screen, so it wasn't friends after all. I felt even more depressed. This was just like the weather, getting worse every minute. In amongst the TVs were banks of computer monitors, most of them turned off, but some with streams of numbers running vertically down the screen, just like I'd seen Tom messing about with. The computers and VDUs were being unplugged, while more white-clad figures fiddled with other machines and keyboards in the room. I saw one hand sticking out from its whites and working some keys. It was immaculately manicured, feminine, and wore a wedding ring. The rest of the horizontal surfaces were in shit state, covered with sweet wrappings, pizza boxes, cans, and large half-empty plastic bottles of Coke. It looked like a student's flat, but with a couple of truckloads of cutting-edge technology thrown in. I realised what they'd been carrying in last night from the 4x4. It must have been pizza time. My little recce was cut short when I saw pairs of black boots coming towards me, snow still in the stitching and laces. They were Dana boots, an American brand. I knew the make well, as I had a pair, high leg, with leather outer and Gore-Tex inner. The US military wore them too. The Tom lookalikes on the floor behind me were moving about or being moved. The one who'd been crying suddenly sounded muffled, as if he was resisting something. I risked turning my head to see what was happening, but I was too late. A hood got pulled over my head, smearing the snot even more over my top lip, mouth and chin. It was pointless resisting. I just let him do it as quickly as possible. I'd learned that the best thing to do was concentrate on breathing through these things and let your ears do the work. The drawstrings were pulled at the bottom and I was in a world of total darkness. Not even the faintest glimmer of light could penetrate. My face started to sweat up rapidly as the hood moved against my mouth and then out again as I breathed and tried to recover completely from the spray. I heard boots on both sides of my head, followed by heavy breathing as my hands were forced together in front of me and a plastic cuff was applied. 
The short, sharp sound of ratcheting was accompanied by the pain of the plastic tightening around my wrists. There was more movement next to me and the rustling of clothes. The pizza boys were getting dressed. That was a good sign. They wanted them alive, and I hoped me, too. Between the sounds of muffled sobs and zips being done up, I could hear, Danke, Kiitos, Spasiba, Thank you. Obviously, these boys didn't know the nationality of the men in white and were hedging their bets wildly, sounding off like Brussels translators. The floorboards flexed under the pressure of bodies walking past, heading towards the door. Trailing wires and plugs dragged and clattered across the floor just past my head. Some plugs hit the steel ram in the doorway and sent out a dull ring. I presumed the computers were being lugged out. By the sounds of it, Everything was being piled up outside on the veranda. The roar of engines filled my hood as vehicles drove into the compound. The temperature inside the house had started to drop as the wind whistled through the main door. To my left, I could just make out the low mumble of voices exchanging short sentences on the veranda as the vehicles approached. They stopped and handbrakes were pulled up on lock. Engines were left running, just like a heli on an operational sortie. It never shuts down in case it doesn't start up again. Doors opened and closed, and there was a flurry of bootsteps around the veranda. I could hear the creak and echo of what sounded like the door of an empty van. It was confirmed when I heard a sliding door lock into the open position. This area was beginning to sound like a superstore's loading bay. I tried moving my arms as if to get comfortable, but in fact to see if we were being guarded. My answer came very quickly when a boot made contact with my ribs, the same side as my fall. I stopped moving and concentrated on the inside of my snot-lined hood as I took the pain. I lay there waiting for the agony to subside. The sobbing and snuffling next to me got louder. The culprit was given the same sort of booted persuader to shut him up, but it just made him worse. The boy was flapping big time, and he made me think of Tom. I was hoping that he wasn't dead and had got away, or was he, like this boy, hyperventilating in a hood, stuck in one of those vehicles? The floorboards still gave and plugs clattered and rattled out towards the veranda. Others loaded the staff into the wagons. I could hear their boots on the van's metal floors. The floorboards bent even more as the three lying next to me were hauled to their feet, amidst muffled groans and cries. The sobbing one was dragged past me and taken outside. The others followed. As the last of the three bodies passed, I heard a scream from the first one echo inside a van. I tried to convince myself they wouldn't go to all this trouble if they didn't want us alive. As I listened to the second being manhandled after his mate, boots came for me. The creaking leather stopped just millimetres from my ear. Two pairs of large, aggressive hands grabbed each side of me, under my armpits and on the arms, dragging me upright. I let my boots trail on the floor. I wanted to appear weak and slow. I wanted them to think I wasn't any sort of threat. Somebody not worth worrying about, just a grey man in a bad way. The two guys were grunting under the strain as we crossed the threshold onto the veranda. My toe caps banged over the door ram and back down onto the wooden floor. At the same time, my hands and neck were blitzed by the freezing cold. Then it moved onto my face as the hood, made wet with my condensed breath, started to get cold inside. Stumbling between my escorts down the steps from the veranda, I was dragged straight ahead. Then all of a sudden, they stopped at the command of a gloved clap and turned right, jerking me round with them. Perhaps they were going to separate me from the others. Would that be good or bad? Within five seconds of being dragged in a new direction, I knew I was indeed going into a different wagon. It wasn't a cold metal box. It felt like the back seat area of a 4x4. Four four. There was a climb up to get into it, and it was carpeted and very warm. I was short-term pleased. The door opposite was opened and hands reached over, gripping my coat and pulling me in, with grunts to match the effort. My shin scraped painfully over the door sill, and I was finally pushed down into the footwell. I could feel one of the rear heating vents against my neck, blowing out hot air from under the seat. It was wonderful. Even through the hood I could smell the newness of the interior, 
and for some reason it made me feel a bit happier about my predicament. The vehicle rocked as somebody jumped into the rear seat above me, their heels digging into me one by one, followed by a muzzle jabbed into the side of my face, smearing mucus back towards my ear. Nothing was said, but I got the idea. Keep still. I was powerless to act anyway, so the best thing to do was just lie there and take advantage of the heat. Our rear doors were kept open and the loading bay activity was still audible. A few feet away I heard the telltale creak of a van's door's retaining arm push back under pressure and then slam shut. There was a double tap on the side of the vehicle to let the driver know it was secure, but no one moved yet. We must be waiting to go in convoy. A few seconds later, another sliding door was shut, and there was silence. There was still no talking from these people. Either they were working by hand signals, or they knew exactly what to do. The vehicle's suspension went into overtime as more bodies piled in. All the doors closed, and it felt as if there were at least three people on the back seat. Boots were all over the place, a couple of pairs digging in their heels to keep me down. Another kicked my legs out of the way so he could rest his feet properly on the floor. I wasn't going to argue. We seemed to be the first vehicle to move out of the compound, in low ratio to handle the wheel ruts and ice, with the windscreen wipers slapping side to side to counter the snow. One of the people in the front was pressing switches on the dashboard. There was a burst of music, some terrible Europop. It was turned off and I heard them laugh quietly. No matter who they were and what side they were working for, at the end of the day, they'd just done a job, and so far, it had been successful. They were releasing a little bit of tension. I couldn't tell whether we'd reached the bend because it was a long, sweeping curve, and I wouldn't feel it at this slow speed, but I soon sensed we were driving uphill. It wouldn't be far to go now before we hit the road. I was in deep, frozen shit, and there wasn't a thing I could do about it. Chapter 23 We moved on for a few more minutes and stopped. There was a clunk as the driver disengaged low ratio and shifted into high, then set off again with a sharp left turn. We had to be on the gravel road, and the left turn meant that at least we wouldn't be driving past the Saab. That was further up on the right towards the dead end. Did they already know where it was? Had they been here the night before, watching me carry out the recce, then followed me back to it? It made me worry about Tom again. Maybe they hadn't bothered to chase him too hard because they knew where he was heading. It wasn't whether he was dead or alive that worried me. It was just not knowing. We began to accelerate gently. The front passenger seat back moved and creaked under what must have been a very large body pushing against my face. He was probably trying to get into a comfortable position with belt kit on. The snow was now melting off the clothing of the three in the back and dripping down my neck. It wasn't the worst thing that had happened to me tonight, but it pretty much fitted in with the way my luck was going. There wasn't a lot I could do about it at the moment, apart from prepare for the ride by not tensing my body up and trying to relax as much as the three pairs of Dana boots would allow. The front passenger suddenly bounced around in his seat with a shout of, What the fuck? The accent was unmistakably American. Jesus! Russians! A split second later, the driver hit the brakes. There was a crash of metal and glass behind us and the heavy caliber sound of automatic fire. The clear-cut, no-messing New England accent and the sound of rapid fire got me flapping big time. It got worse as our wagon came to a quick, sliding stop, turning sideways on the snow. The doors burst open. Cover them! Cover them! The suspension bounced as everyone leapt down from the wagon, using me as a springboard. I suddenly felt very vulnerable, hooded and plastic cuffed here in the footwell. A vehicle is the natural focus of fire. But I didn't care what was going on and who wanted what from whom. It was time to disappear. Wind whistled through the open doors and the engine was still running. The heavy automatic fire was only about 50 metres away. A series of long, uncontrolled bursts echoed off the trees. This was my opportunity. Pulling up my plastic huffed hands, I tried to tug the mask off my face, but the drawstring got stuck on my chin. My fingers were grappling with it when I heard hysterical shouting further down the road. 
The one advantage of working with Sergei and his gang was that I had learned to recognize some Russian. I might not know what it meant, but I knew where it came from. This had to be the Meliskia. If I could get the hood off, my plan was to crawl into the driver's seat, then just go for it. As I was struggling with the string, I got a little reminder to keep my head down. Safety glass cracked as a round came through the rear windscreen and hit the headrest above me. At almost the same instant, two rounds from the same burst ricocheted off a slab of granite at the roadside and shrieked up into the air. There were more shouts, this time from American voices. Move! Come on, let's do it! Let's do it! My 4x4 wasn't going anywhere, but other engines revved, doors slammed and tires spun uselessly in the snow. At last I got the mask off. Pulling myself up, I couldn't feel any of my pain and had just begun to move towards the gap between the seats when I realised it wasn't an option. About five metres away, at the side of the track behind a mound of granite, a white-clad figure was pointing an SD at my centre mass. I knew because I could see the red splash of his laser sight on my jacket. The black-covered head screamed at me above the nightmare that was happening down the road. Freeze! Freeze! Down! 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 Change of plan. With the laser on me, the only problem he had was not missing. There were more screams and shouts mixed with the heavy Russian fire. I got down as flat as possible in the rear footwell. If I could have crawled under the carpet, I would have done. I was feeling even more exposed now I'd seen what was happening behind me. Headlights shone in all directions, illuminating the snowfall as the Americans tried to make their escape around the van that was directly behind our 4x4. It was off to the side of the track, its left wing wrapped around a tree. The driver must still have been in his seat as I could hear and see the wheels spinning in a frenzied attempt to get back on the gravel. The shadows thrown by the headlights caused even more confusion as bodies moved within the tree line. I saw the muzzle flash of the Russian fire, but coming from way behind the convoy now, they were moving back. My cover must have seen movement in the tree line nearer us. He brought his weapon up and started to fire, putting down a series of rapid, well-aimed, three-round bursts. It sounded pathetic compared with the heavy caliber opposing fire. These weapons were not designed to be used at long range. Even twenty meters was a long way for an SD. Stoppage! The boy needed to change mags. I watched as he gripped his outer glove in his teeth, keeping his eyes on me. The moment the glove was off, I saw a white silk touch glove in the headlights. The empty magazine went down the front of his white smock, and, producing a new mag from his belt kit, he slapped it into place. He then hit the release catch, which told me these guys were the newer version of the SD, even more indication that these were official. It was all very slick. I wasn't going to escape just yet. He had a holstered P7, and his weapons drills were so good that even with him under fire, there was no way I'd have time to do anything. I kept my head down and lay still. Wagons screamed past me with skidding wheels, the tree-loving one in the lead, glass smashed and holes in the bodywork, revving far too fast trying to gain speed. Our vehicle group must have been giving covering fire while they moved out of the danger area. The New England voice was back in a shot. Move on! Move on! Come on! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! The guy covering me got up, still pointing his weapon at me as he moved forward. He jumped into the wagon, ramming his heels down onto my back and the weapon into my neck. The barrel was very hot and I could smell cordite and the oily odour of WD-40. He'd probably smothered it in the stuff to protect it from the weather and it was now burning off the weapon. The last thing I had a chance to see was him getting hold of the hood, then pulling it back down over my head. All the others were now jumping back in, making the vehicle rock with their weight. I felt the gear shift being engaged and we started to move off faster than we should, the tyres slithering and sliding as we turned back on line to move up the track. The doors were slammed shut and I was hit by a rush of air from above. The electric sunroof was opening. A moment later, I heard click-thud, 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 and a yell of, Get some! Get some! Get some! as New England fired through the open aperture. I couldn't hear any reply from the Russians. One of the others turned and opened fire through the rear window, adding more holes to the safety glass. Click-thud! 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 
Empty cases hit the side window with a metallic ping, 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 then fell and bounced off my head. Freezing cold air blasted through the roof, then the motor whined and the rush of air stopped. Anybody down? I didn't see anyone. That came from the rear. If there is, they'll be in the wagons. No one was left. I got a heavy slap around the head. Fucking Russians! Who do you think you are, man? The front passenger was, without doubt, the commander. His accent sounded as if he should have been standing on an orange box fighting an election for the Democrats in New Hampshire, not trying to sort out a gang fuck in Finland. But thankfully, he seemed to be sorting it out rather well. I was still alive. There was a short pause. Maybe while he marshalled his thoughts, then, bravo Alpha, he had to be on the net, listening to his earpiece. Situation? There was silence from the others. Well-trained operators know better than to talk when somebody's on the net. The Democrat let out a cry. Shit! They have Bravo's vehicle. He got back on the net. Roger that. Did you toll the kit? There was five seconds of silence before he replied in a low, depressed voice. Roger that, Bravo. He addressed the vehicle crew. The sons of bitches have some of the hardware. Shit! There was no reply from the crew as the Democrat composed himself before getting back on the net. Charlie, Alpha, situation? He checked through all his call signs. There seemed to be four of them. Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. How many people at each call sign I didn't know, but there had seemed to be loads of them at the house. It seemed the whole thing had been a gang fuck for everyone. Me getting caught? Tom? Well, I didn't know. The Americans and Meliskia each only getting part of the hardware they wanted. As for the three Tom lookalikes from the house, they must be more pissed off than all of us put together. The radio traffic had been in clear speech, which indicated they were using secure and probably satellite comms, not like my Motorola's at the Intercontinental. As they transmit, these radios skip up and down through dozens of different frequencies, in a sequence that only radios with the same encryption fill, fluctuating at the same rate and frequency, can hear. Everybody else just gets an earful of mush. He must have got a message from Echo. OK, roger there, Echo. Roger that. He turned towards the bodies in the back. Bobby has gotten hit in the leg, but everything's fine. It's cool. There was a sigh of relief from the back. I felt the fabric press against my face as he turned. Is that asshole still breathing? My cover answered, oh yeah. He gave me another dig with his heel and a muttered insult in Texan drawl. I moaned in deep Russian acknowledgement. The commander's arse swiveled again and my head moved with it. He got back on the net. All stations, this is Alpha. We're still going as planned. My group will take the extra paxes. Acknowledge? I imagined him listening in to the other call signs on his earpiece. Bravo. Charlie, roger that. Delta, roger. Echo, roger D. It seemed that I was the extra Paxes. Whatever happened to me now, it would be down to the Democrat. End of Side 14 Side 15 We drove in silence for another twenty minutes, still on the tarmac road. By my estimation, we hadn't gone far. We couldn't have been travelling that fast because of the heavy snow. The Democrat got back on the net. Papa Juan Alpha. There was a pause while he listened. Any news yet on Super 6? More silence, then. Roger that. I'll wait. Papa Juan and Super 6 didn't sound like ground call signs. Where possible, these are always short and sharp. It stops confusion when the shit hits the fan or comms are bad, factors which normally go hand in hand. Ten minutes later, the Democrat was back on the net. Alpha? He was obviously acknowledging somebody. There was silence. Then, roger that. Super 6 call signs and no go. And no go. After a pause of two seconds, he announced, All stations, all stations, OK, here's the deal. Go to the road plan. The extra Paxes still goes with me. Acknowledge? Nothing more came from him, as he got the acknowledgement from the other call signs. At least these guys were having a shit day, too. 
The Super 6 call signs must have been helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft that couldn't fly in these conditions. In better weather, we would have been flown out of here by people who work for their firm. Nine out of ten times, these are civilian pilots with background jobs as commercial flyers, so they have solid cover stories. They'd fly in on NVGs, maybe pick us all up, or at least the kit, injured and prisoners, and scream back out of the country to a US base. Or maybe, if they were helis, they'd land on an American warship in the Baltic, where the computer equipment and its operators would be sorted out and moved on to whoever was so keen to have them. If I didn't sort my shit out soon and escape, I'd land up with them in one of the Americans' reception centers. I'd been shown them in the past. The rooms ranged from cold and wet three-by-nine foot cells to virtually self-contained suites, depending on what was judged the best way to get information out of paxes like me. No matter how you looked at it, they were interrogation centers, and it was up to the interrogators, CIA, NSA, whoever they were, whether you got processed the easy way or the hard way. Fuck the pizza boys. I didn't care what happened to them, but now being one of the Meliskia, I'd be checking straight into my personal 3 by 9 with corner on suite. There was nothing I could do about that for the time being. I could only hope I'd have a chance to escape before they found out who I really was. Chapter 24 We drove quite slowly for about another 20 minutes. It was physically painful lying crammed in the footwell, but that was nothing compared with how depressed I felt about what the future held. Bubba One Alpha, at Blue One. The Democrat was back on the net. Papa One must be the operating base. The Democrat was counting down to it, sending a report line so that Papa One knew the group's location. A minute or so later, we turned a sharp right. Papa One, Alpha, Blue Two. I could hear the material on the driver's arms rustling as he worked at the wheel, and the tyre noise told me we were still on tarmac and snow. There was a sharp right turn, and my head was squeezed against the door. Then we were bumping over what felt like a sleeping policeman, and drove another thirty metres or so before the vehicle came to a halt. The Democrat got out, leaving his door open. As the rear doors opened, other vehicles passed and stopped all around me. The screech of tyres on a dry surface told me we were under cover, and judging by the echoes made by the vehicles, we were somewhere large and cavernous. The three on top of me started to exit. Elsewhere, engines were still running as other doors were pushed or slid open. People clambered out and walked around, but there was no voice noise, only movement. Then came the echoing clatter of steel roller shutters being pulled down manually with chains. Whatever kind of building we were inside, they didn't waste money on heating. Maybe it was an aircraft hangar, which would make sense if we were going to have a pickup with a fixed wing or heli. Then again, maybe it was just an old warehouse. I couldn't see a single glint of light through my mask. The air was becoming heavy with vehicle fumes. As soon as the three pairs of feet had used me as a platform to get out of the wagon, a pair of hands gripped my ankles and started to pull me out, feet first. I was dragged over the door sill and had to put my arms out to protect myself as I dropped the two feet or so onto the ground. The dry surface was concrete. There was lots of movement around me, and the same sort of sound as there had been in the house, the shuffling and dragging of electric plugs. The equipment was being moved out of the vans. I heard the telltale clunk of metal on metal as working parts were brought back and weapons unloaded, along with the clicking of the ejected rounds being pressed back into magazines. I was turned over onto my back and my feet were released and left to drop to the floor. I gave a very Russian moan. Two pairs of boots walked round to my head. They pulled me up by the armpits and started frog-marching me. My feet dragged along the concrete, toes catching on bumps and potholes, and now and again colliding with a lump of brick or other hard debris. It might have seemed to the two either side of me that I was doing nothing, but at brain cell level I was really quite busy, trying to take in all the sensory information around me. They dragged me past a wagon, and even through the hood I caught the aroma of coffee, probably them opening the flask they had waiting for them at the end of the job. 
We passed some subdued sounds of pain and short, sharp breathing. It sounded like a woman. There were men around her. Okay, let's get another line up. It seemed that Bobby, in callsign Echo, was a woman. They were getting fluids into her and treating her GSW, gunshot wound. We kept moving, my feet dragging through bits of wood, cans and newspapers, theirs occasionally crunching down on plastic drinks cups. I heard the rip of Velcro, then was dragged sideways through a heavy door. They steered me round to the right as the door swung back. The pizza boys were already here. The sound of crying, moans and groans filled what felt like a smaller area than before. The echoes made it sound like we were in a medieval torture chamber, and even in the sanitizing cold this place stank of decay and neglect. A couple more paces and we stopped, and I realized the others were being kicked. That was why they were screaming. I heard boots making contact with bodies and the grunts of the kickers. I was pushed down to the ground and given a good kicking as well. The moans and sobs seemed to come from my right and were now somehow muffled one by one. We weren't all in one big room. I guessed we were being put into cupboards or storage spaces. The moment my head banged against the toilet bowl, I knew where I was. A toilet cubicle. Another scream and a grunt echoed as the boys were subdued and persuaded into their new accommodation. I didn't know what was worse, their noise or the fact that the kickers were doing all this without a word, making best use of the echoes to put the shits up everyone. Guided by their kicks, I crawled into the far right corner of the cubicle, coming to rest on what felt like years of debris. The paper I felt was crispy and brittle, like very thin poppadoms. Still getting kicked, I felt a hard brick wall against my back and the base of the toilet pan against my stomach. I kept my head down and knees up in protection, gritting my teeth and waiting for the worst. Instead, my hands were gripped and pulled up into the air, the plastic now tighter against my wrists because they were swelling up. I felt a knife go into the plastic cuffs and they were cut. Pinioning my left arm over the waste pipe at the rear of the toilet bowl, they grabbed hold of the other arm and shoved it underneath, so I had a hand on either side. It was pointless resisting. They had total control over me. There was nothing I could do yet, apart from save my energy. They gripped my wrists together. I tensed up my forearm muscles, trying to bulk them out as much as possible. The plastic cuffs came on, and I heard the ratcheting and felt the pressure as they were tightened. I moaned as soon as it seemed the right thing to do. I wanted to appear as petrified and broken as the pizza boys. They left slamming the door behind them. I tried resting my head against the pipe, but it was unbearably cold. If there was any water inside, it must be frozen solid. I lay there amongst the rubble and trash, trying to get comfortable, but feeling very aware of the cold floor through my clothing. There was a loud, prolonged creak as the heavy main door into the hangar area swung closed. Then there was silence, even from the pizza boys. Certainly no sounds of dripping plumbing. It was too cold for that. I couldn't hear any of the vehicles either. Nothing but pitch black silence. A couple of seconds later, as if the pizza boys had all been holding their breath, waiting for the bogeyman to go away, the moaning and hooded sobs began once more. After a few moments of that, the boys muttered a few words to each other in Finnish, trying to give each other a boost. They sounded severely scared. I shifted my position in an attempt to get some pressure off my wrists, trying to find out if that extra millimetre or two of muscle flexing had given me any chance of moving my wrists in the plastic cuffs. As I stretched my legs, I connected with what sounded like an empty can. The noise as it rattled and scraped over the concrete gave spark to an idea. I waggled my head past the waste pipe so that it was resting on top of my hands. Then, feeling with my teeth through the hood... I got hold of my right outer glove. That came off easily enough, and I let it drop to the ground, leaving the touch glove still on my hand. I reached forward with my head, positioning the bottom of the hood over my fingers, and got to work. I now knew the hoods were done up with a drawstring and ties round the bottom, and it wasn't long before it lay on the ground. It seemed a total waste of effort. The cubicle was in complete darkness. 
and now that I had the hood off, my head was getting cold. My nose started to run almost immediately. Leaning as far forwards as I could to free up my hands, I started to feel around on the ground. My fingers sifted through old paper cups and all sorts of garbage until I found what I wanted. I readjusted my body around the pan to make myself comfortable while I pulled off my other outer glove with my teeth. Then, with both touch gloves still on, I squeezed the thin metal of the drinks can between my thumbs and forefingers until the sides touched in the middle. I then started to bend the two parts backwards and forwards. After only six or seven goes, the thin metal cracked, and soon the two halves were apart. I felt for the ring pull end and dropped the other one next to my gloves and hood. Feeling gently around the broken edge, I looked for a place where I could start to peel the side down like an orange. The sensation had virtually gone in my swollen hands, but the touch glove caught on the aluminium, and I found what I wanted and started to pick and tear. My fingers slipped a couple of times, cutting me on the razor sharp metal, but there wasn't time to worry about that. Besides, I couldn't feel the pain, and it was nothing to what would be inflicted on me if I didn't get away from here. Once I'd pared the metal down to under an inch from the ring pull end, I tried moving my wrists apart as much as possible. It didn't work that well because plastic cuffs are designed not to stretch, but there was just enough play to do what I wanted. Cupping the can in my right hand with a sharp edge upwards, I bent it towards my wrist, trying to reach the plastic. If I'd left more tin sticking out, it would have gone further, but the edge would have buckled under the pressure. That was also why I used the ring pull end. The thicker rim gave the cutting edge more strength. I knew that establishing a cut into the cuffs was going to take the most time. But once I'd got into that nice smooth plastic, I could go for it. It must have taken just a minute or two for the jagged tin to finally bite. Then, when I was about three quarters of the way through, I heard the loud, echoing creak of the swing door opening. Light and engine noise spilled through a gap of about two inches under the cubicle door. There was the sound of boots on rubbish heading in my direction. The light got stronger, and I started to flap big time. Dropping the can and scrabbling for the hood, and once it was on, trying to find my gloves. I didn't manage it, but just as I was gritting my teeth for the inevitable confrontation, the footsteps went past. There was a flurry of muffled pleas in English from the boys as their doors were kicked open and they got dragged out and subdued. They must have heard the Americans during the contact too, as there was no multilingual begging now. Doors banged. And soon I could hear their feet dragging past me. Within moments, the door swung shut, and silence was restored. I felt around for the can end, not bothering to take the hood off. I couldn't have seen anything anyway. I started to work with more of a frenzy. I had to assume that they'd be coming for me next and soon. After two or three minutes of frantic soaring, the plastic finally gave. Pulling the hood off, I felt around for the gloves and put them in my pocket. Keeping just the touch gloves on. Next, I located the other can end. Getting slowly to my feet and enjoying being vertical, I felt around the cubicle. I found the door handle, opened it, and walked very slowly and carefully out into what I could feel was a narrow corridor with painted brick walls. A faint glimmer of light under the swing door trickled into the corridor, about ten feet up on my left. Picking my feet up and putting them down with infinite care, my left hand supporting me on the wall, I made my way towards the light. As I got closer, I began to hear a vehicle engine revving, then starting to move off. Once at the door, I couldn't find a keyhole to look through, so clearing the debris on the ground, I got down on my knees. Chains rattled as the roller shutter was pulled open. I wondered if the pizza boys were leaving town. Lying flat on the floor on my right side, I managed to get my eyeball close to the bottom of the door. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out the bottom half of the can, the one I hadn't worked on. Using the light to find a place in the metal where I could start peeling this time, I got to work and put my eye back against the gap. I'd been right; it was some sort of hangar or factory space. 
It was mostly in darkness, but lit in places by twelve-inch long fluorescent lighting units, the sort that campers use. These had either been perched on the bonnets of wagons or were being carried around. The pools of almost blue light and shadow made the place look like the set of the twilight zone. Several vehicles were parked up in a row on the far left, about forty metres away. Saloons, estates, MPVs and SUVs, some of which had roof racks piled with skis. My thumb slipped and ran along the ripped can. I still couldn't feel it, but at least some sensation was returning to my hands. Pins and needles had started to work their way around my fingers while I carried on peeling the metal back. I looked straight ahead to the exit, my only way out, then at the people who would try and stop me. They were mostly by the two remaining vans, parked haphazardly in the middle of the hangar. A group of maybe five or six bodies were hurriedly unloading their weapons and taking off their white uniforms and bundling them into what looked like Lacon boxes, aluminium air freight containers. They were in a hurry, but not flapping. No one was talking. Everyone seemed to know what was required. When one of the bodies did a half turn so that it was in profile, I realised that Bobby wasn't the only woman on this job. As they continued to throw off their kit, I could now see where the sound of Velcro had come from. She was ripping apart the side straps from sets of body armour before stacking them in the boxes. Another group of maybe eight were out of their whites and unpacking civilian clothes from holdalls. Others were combing their hair in the wing mirrors, trying to make themselves look like normal citizens. I caught a glimpse of the four by four I'd been transported in. Its back window safety glass was pockmarked with holes where the rounds had passed through. Beyond it were the shapes of the other vehicles used on the job, which were now probably going to be abandoned. Strike marks from automatic weapons were not the best kind of modification to be sporting at traffic lights. I couldn't see any evidence of the computer kit. I assumed they'd moved it straight on, along with the pizza boys and probably Bobby and the guy with the hook hanging from his thigh. They'd be in need of proper trauma care. Since the weather had put a stop to a quick exfiltration, the next destination would be a secure area like the U.S. Embassy. From there, the equipment would probably be moved by a diplomatic bag back to the U.S. Dip bags are basically mail sacks or containers that, by mutual agreement, other governments cannot have access to, which means they can contain anything from sensitive documents to weapons. Ammunition and dead bodies. I've even heard a story of the intelligence service bringing back the turret of a new Russian armored personnel carrier in what must have been a party-sized one. The pizza boys would be stuck in the embassy or a safe house until a heli could get in sometime tomorrow and airlift them out of the country, unless there was a U.S. warship in dock. If I didn't get a grip of this situation, I knew I'd soon be following them. Everyone was now out of their whites and in jeans, duvet jackets, and hats. The woman was still organising the loading of the lacons. Loud metallic echoes filled the hangar as the boxes were moved into the vans. One man seemed to be running the whole show. I couldn't see his face from this distance, but he was the tallest of the group, maybe six foot two or three, and a head above everyone else. He gathered everyone around him and seemed to be giving them a brief. They were certainly doing a lot of nodding. But his voice wasn't loud enough for me to understand what he was saying. While he finished the briefing, the doors of the two vans slammed, both engines revved, and they started to leave. Their headlights swept across the group as they turned towards the shutter. I felt around the rim of the half can in my hands as the chains went into action. I wasn't doing particularly well with it because I hadn't really been concentrating. I watched the Democrats' team disperse as they moved off towards the line of vehicles, like aircrew to their fighters, lights swinging in their hands. They were probably going to split up and do their own thing, probably in exactly the same way as they'd come into the country in the first place. They would now be sterile of anything implicating them in the job. They would have cover documents and a perfect cover story, and would certainly no longer be armed. All they had to do was wander back to their chalets and hotels as if they'd had a good night out, which I suppose they had. None of them was dead. More engines revved, doors slammed, and headlights came on. I could see the fumes rising from exhausts. 
It looked a bit like the starting grid before a Grand Prix. The people from the embassy will probably take care of the abandoned vehicles. Their priority was to get away from here now that the equipment and pizza boys were safely on their way. Their only problem was that they had a little bonus. Me. It looked like the Democrat and another woman were taking on that responsibility. The vehicles were now leaving, but they were still on their feet. The woman with a set of jump leads dragging along the floor as she moved out of the way of the holiday makers, they were leaving nothing to chance. Red brake lights lined up as they took it in turn to exit and hang left. Snow was still falling. I could see it clearly now as full beams shone out into the darkness. Soon there was just one car left stationary, its engine running and its lights blazing. The Democrat was sitting sideways in the driver's seat with his feet on the concrete, the glow of a cigarette intensifying as he sucked on it. The interior light was on, and I could make out thick curly hair on a very large head. The jump leads were thrown into the rear seat and the woman disappeared into the darkness. At last I'd finished the other half of the can. The blood from my fingers felt cold as it was soaked up by my touch gloves. It was a good sign. The feeling had returned to my hands. It was quiet for a few moments, with just the engine ticking over. And then chains started rattling and the shutter closed. The woman emerged from the shadows once again and bent towards the glowing cigarette. I couldn't make out any of her features because her hair covered her face. They talked for a moment. Then he turned back into the car to stub his cigarette in the ashtray. He was clearly too professional even to leave DNA evidence on the floor. By then, she was round the back, pulling open the boot. The Democrat started walking in my direction, his long legs silhouetted by the vehicle's headlamps. There was a flicker of bright white light. Then the fluorescent unit in his left hand burst into life. I could see that he'd just finished pulling his balaclava back on. I watched his right hand go under his coat and come out again holding a multi-barreled P7, which went into his coat pocket. My body banged into shock. He was coming to kill me. I made myself calm down. Of course he wasn't coming to kill me. Why would they have gone to the trouble of bringing me here? And why the hood to hide his identity? He was taking precautions in case I'd pulled my hood off. The car edged forward with the boot open as he got within about ten metres of the door, the light still swaying in his left hand. It was time to get into gear, otherwise I'd soon be given a dose of the medicine I'd forced Val to take last week. I got to my feet and moved to the right of the door, away from the toilets, flapping at the prospect of taking on a guy of his size. All that stuff about the bigger they are, the harder they fall, is a myth. The bigger they are, the harder they hit you back. I wasn't sure how long the corridor was, but I soon found out. I'd only taken four steps when I banged into the end wall. Turning back, I faced the door, fumbling in my pocket for the other half can, breathing deeply to oxygenate myself in preparation. The door swung open with a metallic screech of its hinges, momentarily flooding the area with bright white light. I could hear the car whining in reverse. He had turned right his massive back to me now as he took the first few steps towards my toilet cubicle. I moved quickly as the door closed, not exactly running because I didn't want to trip over, but taking long, fast steps to get some speed and momentum with my right arm raised. With the main door closed and car engine running, there was no way she was going to hear this. He did, though, and when I was still a couple of metres away, he started to turn. I focused on the shape of his head as I leapt up and at him, Landing with my left foot forward, I swung my whole body to the left, my right arm crooked and the palm held open. Sometimes a really firm, heavy slap to the face can be more effective than a punch, and that's absolutely guaranteed if you're wielding a sawn-off drinks can with razor-sharp edges. It hit his head hard. I didn't care where the can connected, just as long as it did. There was a loud groan. I didn't feel the can digging in, just the pressure of my arm being stopped mid-swing as the rest of my body carried on swivelling. The light danced as the fluorescent unit in his hand clattered to the concrete and he started to follow it. I swung to the right with my left arm slightly bent, still focusing on his head. I hit the mark. I could feel the softness of his cheek under the left half of the can, then felt it scrape around the contour of his jaw as he fell. He moaned again, this time louder and with more anguish. 
By now, he was on his knees. As I brought my right hand down hard onto the top of his head, the metal edges dug deep, then hit bone, stripping back the skin as he fell. I gouged a thick furrow from his scalp. The can held for a couple more inches, then broke free. He slumped to the ground, hands scrabbling to protect his head. For a few more frenzied seconds, I continued to slash at his hands and head. Then his hands fell away and he lay very still. He wasn't feigning unconsciousness. He wouldn't have risked dropping his hands and exposing himself to further attack. He had gone into shock, but he was still breathing. He wasn't dead. He was never going to get a job modelling for Gillette, but he'd live. There had been no other way out. If you're going to stop somebody, you have to do it as quickly and violently as you can. The fluorescent unit threw a pool of light across the floor and onto his balaclava. The walls still look remarkably intact, as it does when a sweater rips and the tear seems to knit itself together, unless you look at it close up. Blood was seeping through the material. Dropping the cans, I rolled him over onto his back, and putting my knee into his face just to make things worse, I pulled out the P7 and a mobile that was also in there. That went into my pocket. My breathing was now very fast and shallow, and just slightly louder than the engine ticking over immediately beyond the swing door. I could see the red glow from the taillights under the door gap, and my nose was filling with exhaust fumes. Getting to my feet, I got hold of the top of his balaclava and pulled it off. At last I saw the extent of the damage. He had some severe gouges where the can had gone right through his cheeks, and flaps of skin hung across his mouth. In places I could see bone through the blood-soaked hairy mess of his skull. I pulled the mask over my head, trying to cut down on the chances of being recognised later. It was wet and warm. I checked his body for a radio as he whined weakly to himself. There was nothing. He'd have been planning to be sterile like the rest of them. He'd had to hang on to the P7 to sort me out. I turned towards the door. It was the woman's turn next. Pushing through, I moved into a cloud of red fumes and brake lights. The vehicle was no more than three feet away, engine idling, boots still open, and waiting for me. I moved straight to the left-hand side as the swing door banged shut behind me. Bringing the pistol up into the aim, I pointed it at the woman's face, the muzzle a foot from the glass. If she opened the door, she couldn't knock the pistol out of line quickly enough to do anything about it. If she tried to drive forward, she would die first round. She stared, wide-eyed, at the barrel from under her multicoloured ski hat. In the glow from the instrument panel, I could see her trying to make sense of what her eyes were telling her. It wouldn't take her long. My blood-soaked touch gloves and the Democrat's mask would soon give her a clue. With my left hand, I motioned for her to get out. I was supposed to be Russian. I wasn't going to open my mouth unless I had to. She kept staring, transfixed. She was bluffing. She dropped me at the first opportunity. Moving further back as the door inched open, I decided to put on a heavy Slavic accent. Well, what I thought sounded like one. Gun! Gun! She stared up at me with frightened eyes and said in a little girl voice, Please don't hurt me! Please don't hurt me! Then she opened her legs to show me a P7 nestled between her jean thighs. They were definitely travelling sterile, otherwise they would have had conventional weapons for this phase. I motioned for her to drop it in the footwell. She moved her hand very slowly downwards to comply. The moment she dropped it, I moved in, grabbing her by her shoulder-length dark brown hair and heaving her out of the car and onto all fours. With the P7 jammed into her neck, I felt for a mobile. It seemed I had the only one. Moving back three paces, I pointed at the far wall, where the car had originally been parked, and she got up and started walking. I didn't care what she did now that she was disarmed. All their radios would have been stashed. I had the mobile, and there was no one left that she could turn to for help. I got into the warm car, a Ford, threw it into first gear and screamed towards the closed shutter. She was probably in the corridor by now to find out what had happened to her friend the Democrat. Stopping alongside the four vans and the shot-out four-by-four, I got out with a P7 in hand and splashed through the small puddles made by melting snow from the vehicles, ready to shoot out some tyres. 
You don't just go up and fire straight at rubber. There's too high a chance of the round ricocheting back. You use the engine block to protect you. Lean round the wing and then do it. The P7's signature thud was nothing to the high-pitched ding that echoed round the hangar as the round hit metal. Then there was a hiss as air escaped under pressure. I took a look behind me. There was nothing happening from the corridor yet. Once all vehicles were taken care of, I jumped back into the driver's seat and aimed for the shutters, though this time in reverse, so the headlights were pointed at the swing door. If she came for me, I wanted to see. I braked, threw the gearbox into neutral and leapt out. The ice-cold metal chains burned my hands even through the touch gloves as I pulled down in a frenzy to open the shutters. Raising them just enough to get the car out, I clambered back in and reversed out into the snowfall, pointing the vehicle in the direction everyone else had gone. I left the hangar behind, not knowing whether to feel sorry for the Democrat, relieved at still being alive, or angry with Val and Liv. I checked the fuel tank. It was nearly full, as I would have expected. The mobile went out the window and buried itself in the snow. No way was such a fantastic tracking device going to stay with me. The snow was falling heavily. I didn't have a clue where I was, but that didn't really matter as long as I got away. Pulling at the mask, I felt the Democrat's blood smear across my face. It finally came off, and I threw it into the footwell along with the other P7. Hitting the interior light, I took a look in the mirror. There was so much red stuff on me, I looked like a beetroot. There was no way I could drive after first light or in a built-up area looking like this. The steering wheel, too, was smeared with blood from the touch gloves. I'd have to sort myself out. After maybe an hour, I pulled off the road and had a quick wash in the freezing snow. Then, with a cleaned-up body and car and the blood-soaked gear buried in a snowdrift, I drove through the night, looking for signs that would steer me to Helsinki. The more I thought about it, the more severely pissed off I became. Whether Liv and Val knew about the Americans wanting to join in the fun, I wasn't sure, but I intended to find out. Chapter 25 Wednesday, the 15th of December, 1999. I sat on the floor next to a radiator in the corner of the station, facing the row of telephone booths that displayed the DLB loaded sign. The black marker strike down the side of the right-hand booth was clearly visible from the bus station doors immediately to my right. I had a copy of the International Telegraph, an empty coffee cup, and, in my right pocket, a P7 with a full seven-round unit. Detached from its pistol grip in my left-hand pocket was the other unit, containing three remaining rounds. As soon as the shops opened that morning, I'd bought a complete set of clothes to replace the cold, wet ones I was wearing. I was now in a dark beige ski jacket, gloves, and a blue fleece-pointed hat. I didn't care if I looked a numpty. It covered up my head and most of my face. My pulled-up jacket collar did the rest. Pain lanced across my left shoulder as I adjusted my position. The bruising probably looked horrendous. There was nothing I could do about it but moan to myself and be thankful I hadn't fallen on anything sharp. I dumped the car off at a suburban railway station just after eight o'clock that morning and trained into the city. The snow was still falling, so the vehicle would be covered by now and the plates would be uncheckable. On arrival at Helsinki, I'd pulled off the left luggage ticket from under locker number 11 and collected my bag, cash, passports and credit cards. I also checked for Tom's ticket under number 10. It was still wrapped in its plastic and taped under the locker. I'd been thinking about him a lot. If the Americans or the Meliskia hadn't killed him last night, the weather would have. Tom had skills but playing at Grizzly Adams wasn't one of them. I felt pissed off, but not too sure if it was for him or me. It was then that I wrote him off. There has to be a stage when that happens, so your mind can be free to concentrate on more important things, and I wasn't short of those. I left his bag ticket where it was. It would be an emergency supply of money and a new passport once I'd tampered with it, 
in case what I was about to do went to ratchet. Despite my best efforts, I found I couldn't help feeling sorry for Tom as I sat and watched the constant flow of travellers moving through the doors. It was my lies and promises that had got him where he was now, face down in the snow or bundled up somewhere in an American body bag. The thing that made me feel even guiltier was that I knew I was just as pissed off about not making any money as I was about his death. Cutting away from that, I buried my hands deeper into my pockets, wrapping them round the P7 barrels. I was getting even more annoyed because I'd dumped the bag and blanket that could now be keeping my arse warm and comfortable, and because I knew that Tom's death would become yet another of those niggling little glitches that would surface in the hours before first light while I tried to sleep. The station was packed. Father Christmas had already done two circuits, collecting money for neglected reindeer or whatever. People had been dragging in the snowfall on their footwear, and thanks to the large Victorian-style radiators, puddles had formed around the door area and gradually spread further into the station. I looked at Baby G. It was 14.17, and I'd been here over four hours already. I was gagging for another brew, but needed to keep a trigger on the doors. Besides, once I drank, I would inevitably need the toilet at some stage, and I couldn't afford to miss Liv when and if she arrived. It was going to be a long food and coffee-free day, and maybe night. From the point of view of third-party awareness, it's not too bad hanging around a railway station. You can get away with it for quite a long time. I adjusted my numb, cold arse again, deciding not to waste time speculating about what the fuck had happened at the Microsoft house. The facts were, I had made no money, Tom was dead, and I could be in a world of shit with the Americans and a universe of shit with the firm. If my involvement was discovered, I'd end up helping to prop up a flyover in a concrete pillar somewhere along the new Eurotunnel high-speed link. I'd never been too worried about dying, but to be killed by my own people would be a bit depressing. The longer I'd thought about what had happened on the drive last night, the more I'd boiled over with hostility towards Liv and Val. I had to come up with a plan that still got me what I needed and not waste time and energy trying to work out how to get even. Apart from anything else, that wouldn't pay any clinic bills. Plan B was taking shape in my head. The Meliskia's money would pay for Kelly when I lifted Val and offered him to them for cash. My life had been up for grabs for years, and for a lot less money. I had no idea how I was going to do it yet. I'd have to hit the ground running, but the first phase would be to let Liv think I had the ThinkPad with the downloaded information on it, and, because of last night's fuck-up, I'd only deal with Val now, and only in Finland. Who knows? If Val turned up with the money, I could just take that and save myself the hassle. But that wasn't the message I'd left in the plastic box I'd placed in the DLB. It was empty, just there so that when she came to get it, there was something to unload, so as not to arouse suspicion. Everything needed to be as it should be. As she left the station, I would grab her and tell her in person, so she made no mistake about what I wanted. I'd been sitting there for another twenty minutes when a large group of school kids on an excursion tried to get through the bus station doors all at once, juggling bags, skis and Big Macs as they tried to walk, talk and listen to Walkmans at the same time. Less than thirty seconds later I saw Liv come through and walk straight past the loaded sign without even turning her head, but I knew she would have seen it. Her long black coat, Tibetan hat and light brown boots were easy to spot among the crowd as she moved through the hall, brushing snow from a shoulder with one hand and carrying two large paper stockman bags in the other. She carried on past the kiosks and toilets, manoeuvring through the school kids who were now waiting for one of their teachers to sort his shit out with the tickets. I kept my eye on the peak of Liv's hat. I had a good check to make sure she hadn't been followed in just in case she brought any protection with her, or worse, in case the Democrat had a few of the party faithful on her tail. The hat disappeared as she turned left into the ticketing and metro hallway. There was no rush. I knew where she was heading. 
Once on my feet and past the school trip, I pinged her again, just about to sit on top of the DLB, next to some more kids. The busker was in his normal spot, knocking out some old Finn favourite on his accordion. The noise mixed nicely with the rumpus from a group of drunks on the other side of the benches. They were having an argument with Father Christmas, much to the amusement of those passing. Liv sat down as Santa poked the chest of one of the drunks. Staff began to step in to separate them. I watched Liv bend down and pretend to mess around with her bags. Her hand moved to pick up the DLB. The empty container was pulled from the Velcro and dropped into one of the bags. It wouldn't get red here. I waited for her to leave, positioning myself in a corner so that whatever door she decided to head for, I wouldn't be in her line of sight. A few minutes passed before she stood up, looking towards the ticketing area and smiling broadly. Her arms went out as the man from St. Petersburg emerged, smiling from the crowd. They embraced and kissed, then sat down together, talking in that smiley, hand-in-hand, nice-to-see-you way, their noses only inches apart. He was dressed in the same long camel-hair coat, this time with a dark maroon polo neck sticking out of the top. Today, he also carried a light brown leather briefcase. Making sure I wasn't in line of sight of the platform doors, I checked the departures and arrivals board high on the wall. The St. Petersburg train, going on to Moscow, was leaving from Platform 8 at 15.34, just over half an hour's time. They talked for another ten minutes and then both stood up. Liv's contact picked up her bags in one hand, his briefcase in another, and they walked towards the platform doors. Alarm bells started to ring in my head. Why had he picked up her bags? My heart started to pound even harder when they both went through the doors and out onto the snow-covered platform. Shit! Was she going with him? Maybe the courier had just given her the news about what had happened at Microsoft HQ, and Liv was bailing out while she could. I counted to ten and pushed my way out into the cold. Platform 8 was to the right of me as I headed towards the left luggage area. The snow was falling gently and there wasn't a breath of wind. I walked with my head down, hands in pockets, glancing sideways across the tracks. I saw they were heading for the carriages, about midway along the train. I walked slowly towards the left luggage room, watching until they got on board. Then, checking my watch as if I'd just remembered something, I turned on my heels. There were about seventeen minutes to go before they left for St. Petersburg, and it looked like I'd have to go with them. End of Side 15 Side 16 I went past two of the Russian train staff standing in the guard's van at the rear of the train, their high-peaked Nazi officer-style caps pushed onto the backs of their heads as they glumly took a swig of whatever was in their bottle. I climbed aboard and entered a clean, though very old, carriage, with a corridor facing the platform and compartments all the way along to my right. I moved along the warm walkway and sat down on one of the hard, fabric-covered seats in the first empty compartment. The strong, almost scented cigarette smell probably never left these trains. What now? I had money, but no visa. How was I going to cross into Russia? Hiding in the toilets only works in Agatha Christie movies. Maybe a bribe would get me in. I'd play the dickhead tourist who hadn't got a clue about needing a passport, let alone a visa and offered to be very generous with my dollars if they would just be so kind as to stamp me in or whatever they could do for me. After all, only a lunatic would want to get into Russia illegally. I sat and watched snow-covered Nazi hats strolling along the platforms below the windows. My carotid pulse was throbbing on both sides of my neck and there was a pain running up the centre of my chest as I heard whistles being blown and the heavy carriage doors slamming closed. I checked Baby G. Three minutes to go. It wasn't dealing with the guards and immigration people that was getting me flapping. It was the possibility of losing Liv, my only quick and certain link to Val. My compartment door was pulled open and an old woman in a long fur came in, carrying a small overnight bag. She muttered something and I gave a grunt in reply. Looking up, I caught a glimpse of black leather moving on the platform. Now what was happening? Liv carried on past with her bags, head down against the snow. 
I felt huge relief as I jumped up and moved along the corridor, but I couldn't get out yet in case the courier was watching her and wondered why someone else had decided to jump train. She disappeared into the station and I leapt onto the platform, not checking to see if he was looking, and headed for the doors she had just passed through. I pinged her hat above the crowd, heading for the bus station exit. She must know by now that there was no message in the box. I fell in behind, waiting for my chance to grip her. I was about twenty paces behind as she pushed her way through the bus station doors. Once through them myself, I looked out into the snowfall. All I could see were buses and lines of people trying to get on them. Liv must have turned off as soon as she hit the pavement. I was moving down the steps when there was a shout behind me. Nick! Nick! I stopped, spun round, and looked back up towards the doors. Liv! How lovely to see you! She was standing by one of the pillars, left of the doors, smiling, arms outstretched, getting ready to greet another of her long-lost friends. I switched on and played the game, walking into her arms, letting her kiss me on both cheeks. She smelled great, but what I could see of her hair under her hat wasn't as well-groomed as usual and was knotted at the ends. I thought I would wait for you. I knew you would be around somewhere. Otherwise, why leave an empty container? Still embracing, I looked at her with my wonderful-to-see-you smile. Tom is dead, I said. The look on her face told me she knew how I felt. She pulled back and smiled. Come, walk with me. You have a right to be angry, but all is not lost, Nick. She invited me with her gloved hand to carry her bags. As I bent down, I saw the boyfriend's light brown briefcase. Still smiling at her, I gripped her arm and more or less pulled her down the stairs. Once on the pavement, I turned right towards the front of the station and the town centre. What the fuck's going on? We got hit by an American team last night. I was lifted. Then the fucking Russians hit them. She nodded as I ranted away at her, doing her normal trick of knowing everything but giving very little away. I said, You already know that, don't you? Of course. Valentin always finds out everything. You and Val have been fucking me over big time. Enough. I want him here tomorrow, with the money. Then I'll give him what he wants. I have the ThinkPad, and it's downloaded with what you want. I wish I'd taken Tom up on his offer back at the lead house to let him tell me exactly what he was doing. She hadn't even been listening. Are you sure Tom is dead? If he's out in this shit, I held my hand out. She looked exactly the same as she had done in the hotel, calm and in control, almost as if she was in another place and I wasn't talking to her. I increased my grip on her arm and guided her down the road, not caring what passers-by might think. Listen, I have the download, but I'll only deal with Val now, not you. There will be no more fuck-ups. Yes, Nick. I heard you the first time. Now, tell me, this is very important. Valentin will not do a thing unless he has all the details. Did the Americans take all of the hardware with them from the house? Yes. Did the Americans capture any of the occupants from the house? Yes, I saw three. Did the militia then manage to take any of the hardware or occupants from the Americans? She was like a doctor working through a list of symptoms with a patient. Not the occupants. They got one of the wagons that contained some hardware, for sure. She nodded slowly. We joined a small crowd at a crossing, waiting for the green man to illuminate, even though there was no traffic to stop us all crossing. I whispered into her ear, This is bollocks, Liv. I want Val here, with the money. Then I'll hand everything over and fuck off and leave you lot to it. My rhetoric was having no effect on her whatsoever. We crossed the main drag to the sound of the warbling signal, heading for the cobblestone pedestrian shopping area. That, Nick, will not happen. He will not come for the simple reason that you haven't anything to trade, have you? She spoke very evenly. Now, please answer my questions. This is very important for everyone, including you. 
Fucker. I wasn't waiting for any more questions. Besides, she was right again. Why did the Americans hit the house? Whatever we were going in for belongs to them, doesn't it? It's not commercial. It's state. She treated me to her best, Mr. Spock look, as I dragged her along. Turn right here. I turned the corner. We were on one of the shopping streets. Trams, cars and trucks splashed through the slush. The Americans were NSA, Nick. Oh, fuck. My heart sank to hear my suspicion confirmed and the pain returned to my chest. I wanted money, but not that badly. This was a big boy fuck-up. Those people were the real government of America. Are you sure? She nodded. They also hit my house last night, about two hours after you left. How did you get away? She flicked at the ends of her hair. By having a very cold and long night out on the lake. How did they know to hit you? They must have been guided to the house, but I don't know how. Now, please, you are just wasting time, and we don't have a lot of it. I didn't even notice a van passing and giving my jeans and her coat the good news with some slush. I was busy feeling more depressed than pissed off now. The NSA. I really was in the shit. She gave me more directions. Cross here. We waited like sheep again until a little green man told us to cross. Jaywalking must carry the death penalty in this country. Moving on green, it was safe to talk again. Tell me, did you or Tom use email, telephone, fax or anything like that while you were at the house? Of course not, no. And then I remembered what had happened at the airport. Wait, Tom did. Tom, she turned her head sharply. What? What did Tom do? He used email. He sent an email to someone in the UK. The calm, controlled look drained from her face. She stood still, pushing me away as people skipped around what looked like a domestic row just about to erupt. I told you both not to do that. I pulled her back towards me as if I was in command, leading her down the street. She composed herself, and finally, very calmly, she said, So it was Tom who brought the Americans here. She pointed to the right, down another cobblestone street. Valentin wants me to show you something. Then I am to make you an offer that your pocket and conscience will not let you refuse. Come, this way. As we turned, I decided to keep quiet about the fact that it wasn't necessarily Tom's fault. E4 might have followed me from the moment I'd left her flat in London, or kept tabs on us via Tom's credit card. But fuck it, I couldn't do anything about that now. We'd ended up by the harbour. A fish and vegetable market had been set up on the quayside, steam billowing from under plastic awnings that protected the traders and their merchandise from the snow. Over there, Nick. My eyes followed hers, hitting on what looked like the world's largest Victorian conservatory a couple of hundred metres away from the market. Let's go and get out of the cold, Nick. I think it's time you knew what's really going on. Chapter 26 The tea house was hot and filled with the aroma of coffee and cigarettes. We bought food and drink from the counter and headed for a vacant table in a corner. With our coats over a spare seat and her hat now removed, it was even more obvious that Liv had had a bad night. We must have both looked pretty rough compared with the American tourists who were beginning to fill the place, fresh off the cruise liner I could see down in the harbour. The sharp hiss of the cappuccino machine punctuated their conversations, which, for some reason, were louder than everybody else's. The Finns seemed to speak very quietly. Our table was by a grand piano and partly screened by potted palms. The less conspicuous, the better. Liv leaned forward and took a sip of tea from her glass while I shoved a salmon sandwich down my neck. She watched me for a while, then asked, Nick? What do you know of the UK-USA agreement? A camera flash bounced around as the tourists posed with their tea glasses and big wedges of chocolate cake. I took a swig of tea. I knew the bones of it. Set up by Britain and America in the late 1940s, 
since when Canada, Australia and New Zealand had also become part of the club. The agreement basically covered the pooling of intelligence on mutual enemies. Beyond that, however, the member countries also used their resources to spy on each other. In particular, the UK spied on American citizens in the USA, and the Americans spied on British citizens in the UK, and then they traded. Technically, it wasn't illegal, just a very neat way of getting round strict civil liberties legislation. Liv's eyes followed three elderly Americans in multicoloured duvet jackets as they squeezed past our table, loaded down with tea trays and elegant paper carrier bags full of finished crafts. They didn't seem able to make a decision about where to sit. Liv looked back to me. Nick, the three men in the house last night were Finns. They were engaged in accessing a technology called Echelon, which is at the very heart of the agreement. You mean, you were trying to get Tom and me to access state secrets for the Russian mafia? She looked calmly around the other tables and took another sip of tea. She shook her head. It's not like that at all, Nick. I didn't explain everything to you before, for reasons that I'm sure you will understand. But Valentin wants commercial information, that's all. Believe me, Nick, you were not stealing secrets, state or military. Quite the contrary, you were helping to stop others from doing precisely that. So how come the NSA were involved? They simply wanted their toy back, I promise you. Valentin has no interest in the West's military secrets. He can get those whenever he wants. It's not exactly difficult, as I'll demonstrate to you shortly. She glanced at the Americans to make sure they weren't listening, then back at me. What do you know of Echelon? I knew it was some kind of electronic eavesdropping system run by GCHQ, intercepting transmissions and then sifting them for information, a bit like an internet search engine. However, I shrugged as if I knew nothing at all. I was more interested in hearing what she knew. Liv sounded as if she was reading from the Echelon sales brochure. It's a global network of computers run by all five nations of the UK-USA agreement. Every second of every day, Echelon automatically sifts through millions of intercepted faxes, emails and mobile phone calls, searching for pre-programmed keywords or numbers. As a security precaution in our organization, we used to spell out certain words over the phone, but now even that has been overtaken by voice recognition. The fact is, Nick, any message sent electronically anywhere in the world is routinely intercepted and analyzed by Echelon. The processors in the network are known as the Echelon Dictionaries, an Echelon station, and there are at least a dozen of them around the world, contains not only its parent nation's specific dictionary, but also lists for each of the other four countries in the UK-USA system. What Echelon does is to connect all these dictionaries together and allow all the individual listening stations to function as one integrated system. For years... Echelon has helped the West shape international treaties and negotiations in their favour. To know anything from the health status of Boris Yeltsin to the bottom line position of trading partners. That's serious information to get hold of, Nick. Why do you think we are careful not to use any form of electronic communication? We know that we are tagged by Echelon. Who isn't? Princess Diana's calls were monitored because of her work against landmines. Charities like Amnesty International and uh, Christian Aid are listened to because they have access to details about controversial regimes. From the moment Tom started working at Menwith Hill, every fax and email he sent, as well as phone calls, would have been intercepted and checked. Those fins had designed a system to hack into Echelon and piggyback off it. 
the firewall that Tom breached was their protection around that system to stop them being detected and traced. They were online last night for the very first time. Trying to do what? Hack into NSA headquarters or something? She shook her head slowly as if in disbelief at their naivety. We knew from our sources that their sole objective was to pick up sensitive market information that they could then profit from. All they wanted was to make a few million dollars here and there. They didn't understand the true potential of what they had created. But what has all this got to do with me, I asked. What is Val's offer? She leaned even closer, as if we were exchanging words of love. We might as well have been the way she spoke with such passion. Nick, it's very important to me that you understand Valentin's motives. Of course he wants to make money out of this, but more than that, he wants the East eventually to be an equal trading partner with the West. And that is never going to happen as long as ambitious men like him do not have access to commercial information that only Echelon can provide. Ambitious? I laughed. I can think of plenty of other words I'd use before that one to describe ROC. She shook her head. Think of America a hundred and fifty years ago, and you have Russia now. Men like Vanderbilt didn't always stay within the law to achieve their aims, but they created wealth, a powerful middle class, and that in time creates political stability. That is how you must see Valentin. He's not a Dillinger. He's a Rockefeller. Okay. Val is businessman of the year. Why didn't he just strike a deal with the Finns? It doesn't work like that. It would have alerted them to what they had, and then they'd have sold it to the highest bidder. Valentin didn't want to take that chance. He was happy for them to make access and try to play the markets while he found out where they were and got to them before the militia. And the Americans? If you had been successful last night in downloading the program, Valentin would have told the Americans where the house was. They would then have gone in and closed it down without knowing that he also had access to Echelon. Remember what they said in London, that... Nobody must know. Very clever, I thought. Val would have carried on logging onto Echelon, and the West would have slept soundly in its bed. But the Americans did know. Yes, but our security was watertight. The only way they could have found out was through Tom. Before we got sidetracked into conjecture about who was to blame, there were plenty of other questions I wanted the answers to. Liv. Why Finland? She answered with evident pride. We are one of the most technologically minded nations on earth. This country probably won't even have currency by the next generation. Everything will be electronic. The government is even thinking of doing away with passports and having our IDs embedded on the SIM cards on our mobile phones. We are at the cutting edge of what is possible, as these young men demonstrated. They had the skills to hack into Echelon, even if they lacked the street sense to know what they could really do with it. She waited as I took a sip of tea. The sandwiches had long gone. Any more questions? I shook my head. There were many, but they could wait. If she was ready to explain the new proposal to me, I was ready to listen. Nick, I have been authorized by Valentin to tell you that the offer of money still stands, but your task has changed. Of course it has. Tom is dead and the NSA have Echelon back. Her eyes locked onto mine as she shook her head. Wrong, Nick. I didn't want to tell you this until the information was confirmed, but our sources believe the Maliskia have Tom. Unfortunately, we believe they also have the ThinkPad. This is very disturbing as it still has the firewall access sequence that I fought to keep my composure. Tom's alive? Fucking hell, Liv, I've been sitting here thinking the man was dead. 
Her daughter of Spock face never changed. The Meliskia think he's with the Finns? They naturally assumed, she waved her hands across the table. Remember, they also want access to Echelon. So you want me to get Tom back? Before I tell you the objective, Nick, I must explain a complication. A complication? This wasn't complicated enough. She bent down and lifted her boyfriend's briefcase onto the table. It was dark outside now and Christmas lights twinkled in the marketplace. Liv opened the case. Inside was a laptop which she fired up. I watched as she reached into her coat and brought out a dark blue floppy disk in a clear plastic case. As she inserted the disk, I heard the Microsoft sound. Here, read this. You need to appreciate the situation completely so you can understand the gravity of the task. I could just tell you all this, but I think you might want confirmation. She handed the briefcase over to me, the floppy still spinning as the laptop did its stuff before displaying it on the screen. The disk icon came up on the desktop and I double-clicked it. Adjusting the screen and ensuring that only I could see its contents, I started to read as the group from outside came in and greeted their mates and lost no time in showing them their purchases of Russian-style fur hats and reindeer meat salamis. There were two files on the disc. One was untitled. The other said, Read Me First. I opened it. I was presented with a web page from the London Sunday Times, dated 25th of July, and displaying an article entitled, Russian Hackers Steal U.S. Weapon Secrets. Liv stood up. More tea? Food? I nodded and got back to the screen as she went to the counter. By now the tourists were a group of six and making enough talk for twelve. American officials believe Russia may have stolen some of the nation's most sensitive military secrets, the article began, including weapons guidance systems and naval intelligence codes, in a concerted espionage offensive that investigators have called Operation Moonlight Maze. The theft was so sophisticated and well-coordinated that security experts believed America might be losing the world's first cyber war. The hits against American military computer systems were even defeating the firewalls that were supposed to defend the Pentagon from cyber attack. During one illegal infiltration, a technician tracking a computer intruder watched a secret document be hijacked and sent to an internet server in Moscow. Experts were talking of a digital Pearl Harbor where an enemy exploited the West's reliance on computer technology to steal secrets or spread chaos as effectively as any attack using missiles and bombs. With just a few taps on a computer laptop, it seemed anyone could totally fuck up any advanced nation. Gas, water and electricity utilities could be shut down by infiltrating their control computers. Civil and military telecommunication systems could be jammed. The police could be paralysed and civil chaos would take over. Fuck it. These days, who needed armies? Even top secret military installations whose expertise was intelligent security had been breached. At the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command, SPAR War, a unit in San Diego, California, which specialised in safeguarding naval intelligence codes, an engineer was alerted to the problem when a computer print job took an unusually long time. Monitoring tools showed that the file had been removed from the printing queue and transmitted to an internet server in Moscow before being sent back to San Diego. It was not clear precisely what information was contained in the stolen document, but beyond its role in naval intelligence, Sparwar was also responsible for providing electronic security systems for the Marine Corps and federal agencies. It was suspected that several other intrusions had gone undetected. The piece went on to say that President Clinton had called for an extra $600 million to combat the problem of Moonlight Maze. But that still might not be enough, as China, Libya and Iraq were developing information warfare capabilities, and according to one White House official, so were certain well-funded terrorist groups. It didn't take much imagination to think of the damage Osama bin Laden and his mates could do if they got their hands on it.
As for the massive Russian probing, that could very well be the Meliskia. I double-clicked the next file. What came up on screen confirmed the story of the hit against Spar War in San Diego could very well be true. The Sunday Times might not know what was in the file, but I did now. The naval intelligence crest in front of me headed a list of maybe 50 code words that corresponded to radio frequencies. Liv sat down with more tea and sandwiches. Have you read both? I nodded, and as I closed the files down and ejected the disc, Liv leaned over and held out her hand. Nick, you can help stop this from happening if you want to. I passed the disc over and started to close down the laptop as she continued. The Russian government aren't the only people who buy this information from the Meliskia. So can anyone with a big enough chickbook. Obviously Val's was big enough, otherwise I wouldn't have been reading the code lists. As I said before, Nick, if they get echelon capability and start to exploit it, even without selling the information to others, just think of the consequences. They are already on the way to achieving the capability to close down the UK or US with their Moonlight Maze operations. With Echelon, they will have complete and unrestricted access to any information worldwide, state, military, commercial. You can stop it, Nick, if you want. She paused and looked me straight in the eye. I handed the briefcase back to her across the table. She was right. If this was the truth, it was an offer my conscience couldn't let me refuse. The idea of these machines listening to everything we did and said was very big brother, but shit, I'd rather have just the agreement countries accessing it than every man and his dog with enough cash. As for the leak of military information, that had to be stopped. I didn't give a shit about people finding out about the latest surface-to-air missile technical details or whatever. It was people's lives, including my own, that mattered. I had been part of enough fuck-ups where friends had died because of insecure information. If I could stop it and come away with a suitcase full of money, it seemed to touch every base. So, what exactly do you want me to do? She heard the acceptance in my voice. You must destroy the Meliskia's Moonlight Maze capabilities and any advance they've made with Echelon. That means destroy the complete installation, computers, software, the lot. This time, however, you'll be completely on your own. Valentin cannot be seen to be attacking the Meliskia. Any conflict would cause disharmony and distract him from his aim. So, if you encounter a problem... I'm afraid he or I will not be able to help you. I might be the most cynical man in the UK about the UK, but I was not a traitor. And if all she was saying was true, I was sure that Val would be happy to open his checkbook a little wider, especially if I was having to go in single-handed. I sat back and held up three fingers. There wasn't a flicker in her face. Dollars? Since she'd even asked the question, the answer was obvious. Sterling, the same arrangements as for the exchange. She nodded. Three million, you will be paid. It worried me slightly that she'd agreed so easily. What guarantees do I have? You don't, and there's no money up front. But Valentin is well aware of the lengths you went to to track him down before, and that no doubt you'd do the same again. Correct. I didn't need to explain about never making a threat you cannot keep. She knew. As I've said a number of times, Nick, he likes you. You will get your money. So tell me, where is the installation? She pointed behind me, out towards the harbour and the sea. It's that way. Estonia. I frowned. The only thing I knew about Estonia was that it had been part of the old USSR and now wanted to be part of NATO, the EU, Tesco's loyalty scheme, you name it, anything to detach it from Russia for good. The population is still 30% Russian. The Meliskia find it easier to operate from there. 
She lifted the cup to her lips and screwed up her face. The tea was cold. There was one rather important point she seemed to have overlooked. If the Meliskia have Tom, I said, I take it he'll be at this installation. Do you want me to bring him back here after I've lifted him or just take him back to London? She stared at me as if I was an idiot. Nick, I thought you understood. Tom must be considered part of their capability. She kept her gaze fixed on me for several moments while waiting for the penny to drop. It finally did. She saw it in my face. I don't wish to state the obvious, Nick, but why else do you think Valentin would pay you three million? Tom must die. I was almost lost for words. But why? I mean, why don't I just get him out at the same time? That's not an option, Nick. Tom will very quickly be coerced into helping them with Echelon. As we both know, he can breach the firewall. We know they have at least some of the software. We know they have Tom, and probably also the ThinkPad. As soon as it all links up, what's in his head, what's in his pocket, what's in the van? She shuddered. If the Meliskia get access to Echelon and add it to their Moonlight Maze capabilities, they will have all the ingredients for catastrophe. It will affect not only Valentin's vision for the East, but bring the West to its knees. Look, Tom has the ThinkPad. He has the ability to use it. The risk is too great. What if you are killed or taken before finishing the task? Even if you did rescue him, he would still be in the country, and the possibility of capture by them is a risk Valentin is not willing to take. It is simply better that Valentin sacrifices Tom and the opportunity to access Echelon himself than risk the Meliskia having it. No one, Nick, can afford for the Meliskia to have Echelon. I was still finding this hard to accept. But why not just tell the Americans? Val was going to tell them about the Finn's house. Unthinkable. What if they take Tom and he explains exactly what has been going on? Nick, I don't think even you would want that, would you? Tom would go back to prison for life and you'd be in the adjoining cell. Bending down and placing the briefcase in her bag once again, she seemed to be rounding up. I'm sorry, Nick, but I have many things to do now as you can appreciate. We'll meet tomorrow at Stockman, 11 a.m. in the cafe. That is the soonest that I'll be able to get more information. One thing is certain. After that, you must leave as soon as you can. If the Meliskia have got Tom to cooperate, every hour counts. I looked at her and nodded. This new information. Is it coming in on the 6.30 a.m. train from St. Petersburg? She didn't bat an eyelid. Yes, of course. Nick, I want to apologize once more for what has happened. It was just that if you'd known exactly what was going on, I wouldn't have done the job in the first place. Precisely. I must go now. She busied herself in standing up and fastening her coat. I think I need about fifteen minutes. I nodded. I'd get another brew while she got clear of the area. Then I'd go and find out exactly where Estonia was and how the fuck to get there. Chapter 27 Thursday, the 16th of December, 1999 Ten minutes before she was due to arrive, I settled into a corner seat in the Café Avec in Stockman. On my way over, I'd stopped at an internet café and checked out the Moonlight Maze story on the Sunday Times website. It was genuine. The Avec seemed to refer to the fact that you could have your coffee with a shot of anything from the bar, from Jack Daniels to local cloudberry liqueurs. The locals were knocking them back like there was no tomorrow. Placing two coffees and two danishes on the table, I put a saucer over the top of Liv's cup to keep it hot. The cafe was just as packed as when I'd been there with Tom. I'd spent a lot of time thinking about him last night, lying in my cheap and, more importantly, anonymous hotel room. 
The sad fact was that stopping the Meliskia from combining Echelon with their Moonlight Maze operations and getting the money for doing it was more important than Tom's life. Then I pictured him leaping to my defence after we'd come off the fence. Killing him was not going to be easy. I had even considered going to the consulate and calling Lynn on a secure line, but then I realised I was losing sight of the aim, which was money. If Lynn knew, that would be the end of it. All I would get was a pat on the head if I was lucky. This way I got to pocket three million pounds. Plus, I did democracy a good turn. It was bollocks, of course. The trouble was, it even sounded like bollocks. After my tea stop with Liv yesterday, I'd gone straight down to the harbour to check out the ferries to Estonia. Its capital, Tallinn, seemed to be the destination for an array of roll-on, roll-off ferries, high-speed catamarans and hydrofoils. The faster craft made the 80-kilometre journey in only an hour and a half, but the girl at the ticket office told me there was too much ice floating in the Baltic and too much wind for them to make the crossing in the next few days. The only ones that could handle the conditions were the old-fashioned ferries, and they usually took over four hours. And because of the heavy seas, they would now take even longer. Story of my life. I took a sip of coffee as I sat looking at the long words in a finished newspaper and scanning the escalator. I was going to use the Davidson passport to go into Estonia, but had booked the ferry ticket in the name of Davis. Giving the name slightly corrupted always adds nicely to the confusion. If stop for it, I'd just say it was the mistake of the people who did the ticketing. After all, English was their second language, and my Cockney accent could be quite hard to understand when I tore the arse out of it. The method wasn't foolproof, but it might just muddy the waters a bit. I was sure the firm would still be looking for Davidson now that he was connected with Liv and Tom. I didn't care how much they might have worked out, as long as there wasn't a picture of me to go with it, and thankfully the one in Davidson's passport wasn't much of a likeness. The moustache and rectangular glasses, plus makeup to change the size of my nose and chin slightly, work quite well. If put on the spot, I'd say that I use contacts to read now and liked my new clean-shaven look. I'd learned makeup from the BBC. Plastic noses and eyebrow sets are not what it's all about. As I dunked a corner of the Danish into my coffee, I couldn't help a smile as I remembered spending four hours making myself up as a woman for the final session of the two-week course. I thought the shade of lip gloss I'd chosen particularly suited me. It had been a laugh spending the day shopping with my teacher girlfriend, Peter, who was dressed up in quite a fetching blue number especially when it came to going into women's toilets. I didn't like having to shave and wax my legs and hands, though. They itch for weeks afterwards. An insistent electronic burst of the William Tell overture came from somewhere behind my left shoulder, followed by a brief moment of silence, then a burst of finish from an elderly lady. Everybody in this country had a mobile phone. I'd even seen small kids wandering around, holding their parents' hands and talking into a dangling mic but no one settled for the standard ring. You couldn't go five minutes in Helsinki without hearing the flight of the bumblebee, snatches of Sibelius or the James Bond theme. I sat, dunked, and waited. I had the passports tucked uncomfortably under my foot inside my right boot, and I had $1,500 in hundreds, twenties, and tens in my left. As for Mr. Stone... He was well and truly stuffed away in the bag at the railway station. The P7 and extra barrel were still with me, and would only go into the railway bag at the very last minute. There was no way I could take the weapon with me to Estonia. I had no idea how heavy the security was on the ferry journeys. Liv's head appeared first as the escalator brought her up towards me. She was looking around casually, not specifically looking for me, the rest of her body came into view, wearing the black, belted, three-quarter-length leather coat over her normal jeans and Timberland-type boots. She had a large black leather bag over her shoulder and a magazine in her right hand. She spotted me and headed for the table, kissing me on both cheeks. Her hair was back on top form and she smelled of citrus. 
An English language copy of Vogue landed on the table between us, and we bluffed away with the "How are you?" smiles as she settled into her seat. I put her cup in front of her and removed the saucer. She lifted it to her lips. Either it was cold or tasted past its best, because it went straight back down on the table. The Meliskia are located near Narva. I returned her smile as if enjoying the story. Narva. It could have been on the moon for all I knew. You'll need a regio one in two hundred thousand map. Of which country? She smiled. Estonia, northeast. She put her hand on the Vogue. You'll also need what is inside here. I nodded. Her hand was still on the magazine. It's from this location that they have been running moonlight maze, and now that they have Tom and the ThinkPad. It's where they will also be attempting to access Echelon. They move location every few weeks to avoid detection, and after what's happened here, they will be moving again very soon. You'll need to act quickly. I nodded again, and her hands came together on the table as she leaned forward. Also inside is an address. You'll meet people there who should help you get explosives and whatever else you need. The best way to Narva is by train. Hiring a car is more trouble than it's worth. And Nick, she fixed her eyes on mine. These people in Narva, do not trust them. They're totally unreliable. The way they conduct their drug trade is disrupting business for all of us. But they're the closest Valentin can offer you to support on the ground. I gave her a smile that let her know she was telling Granny how to suck eggs. Also, remember, do not mention Valentin at all when dealing with them. There must be no connection between him and any of this. None whatsoever. If they make a connection, the deal will be off because they will simply kill you. End of side sixteen. Side seventeen. Her hands went back together. Also in there is a. She hesitated, trying to find the right word, but didn't come up with one that satisfied her. In the end, she shrugged. Letter from a friend, the same one that has the contacts in Narva. It will ensure you get what you need from these people, but only use it if you need to, Nick. It was obtained. At great personal expense to Valentin, and shouldn't be abused. I asked the obvious, "What's in it?" Well, it's a bit like an insurance policy. She smiled rather bleakly. A Chechen insurance policy. I told you before, he likes you. I didn't need to ask any more about it. I'd see it for myself soon. For now, there were more important matters. I needed the answer to the bayonet question again. How many people are there on site? She shook her head. We don't have that information, but it will be more than last time. This is their most important asset, which is why it's in Estonia. The geography is the best defense system there is. Something else needed answering. How will you know I've been successful? You're worried that Valentin will not pay without proof. Don't. He will know within hours. How is no concern of yours? You will get your money, Nick. I lean closer. How do you know, Tom? I don't. Valentin does. When Tom was caught at Menwith Hill, it was Valentin he was working for. You British never discovered that, however, because your threats to him could never compare with the one Valentin was capable of delivering, which was. Her expression invited me to use my imagination. In my mind's eye, I saw Tom curled up in the back of the car after he'd had the facts of life explained to him by the interrogation team. Was Tom trying to access Echelon for Valentin at Menwith Hill? She nodded. When he was caught, he told British intelligence only what they thought they needed to know. 
then told the courts what they told him to say. It was all very simple, really. Well, for everyone except Tom. And how did you know of my connection with Tom? Valentin has access to many secrets. After your encounter in Helsinki, he wanted to know a little more about you. It was easy enough to order that information from the Maliskia, thanks to Moonlight Maze. Even more incentive to get in there and destroy that capability, don't you think? Fucking right. I didn't like the sound of any of it. Liv patted the magazine with her hand. Read it. Then all we know, you will know. I must go now. There are so many other things to do. I bet one of them was to report back to Val's go-between and tell him that I was on my way to Narva. Liv and I smiled at each other like parting friends, kissed on the cheek, and did the farewell routine as she replaced her bag on her shoulder. I'll check the station every day, Nick, starting Sunday. I touched her sleeve. One last question. She turned to face me. You don't seem too concerned about Tom. I mean, I thought you two were, you know, close. She sat down again slowly. For a second or two, she toyed with her coffee cup, and then she looked up. Meaning I had sex with him? She smiled. Tom is not someone I'd seek a relationship with. I had sex with him because he was weakening and very unsure about what was expected of him. Sleeping with him was... was... Uh, she searched for a good expression, then shrugged. Insurance? I had to keep him committed to the task. He's the only one who could do this sort of thing. He is a genius with this technology. He had to go with you. That is also why you must carry out your new task as quickly as you can. His capabilities must not be available to the Maliskia. She stood and turned with a small wave of the hand, and I slouched down in my chair, wishing I'd had that information a few days ago. My eyes followed her as she headed for the escalator and slowly disappeared. I took a small white envelope from inside the magazine Liv had left behind. It looked as if it was made for a small greeting card. It certainly didn't look as if there was much inside. I stayed put for a while, not bothering to touch it, and drank her lukewarm coffee. After about ten minutes, I piled the cups, saucers, and plates onto the tray. Walking away from the escalators, I made my way through the warm clothing department and into the toilets. Safely in a cubicle, I opened the envelope. Inside were three scraps of paper of various sizes and quality. The first was a post-it, on which was an address in Narva. By the look of it, I was after a bloke called Constantin, plus a long and lat fix. The post-it was stuck to half a ripped sheet of cheap and very thin A4, with about ten lines of Cyrillic script written in biro. This had to be the Chechen insurance policy, because the third item was a sheet of greaseproof paper, on which was a pencil cross, and, towards the bottom left-hand corner of the sheet, a little circle. All I had to do was line up the longs and lats on the right map, and bingo, the circle would be around the location where Tom and the Meliskia were supposed to be. I listened to the shuffle of feet outside, water splashing into basins, hand dryers humming, and the odd grunt or fart, and started to laugh to myself as I folded up the bits and pieces of paper and tucked them into my socks out of the way. I felt like Harry Palmer in one of those Michael Caine films from the sixties, 